Uh, most of these sessions are going to have, uh, you know, be fireside chats and will feature uh, multiple people at once. Uh, so we do recommend you use the grid view. Similarly, towards the bottom, you'll if you hover over the screen, you'll see the three dots, more options uh, menu. So in there, there's two things. First of all, you can open up the Q&A, uh, which we recommend, and we allocate question and answer time to every session, and we try to get through them as much as possible. We welcome all of your great questions. So please open up that little widget, send through all of your questions for today's fantastic speakers, and we will try to get to them. Uh, also in that menu, uh, we do have the options for uh, dial-in or audio only. Uh, again, we recommend video, but we understand that uh, in certain select cases that may not be possible, so that you do have an audio only uh, option. Um, similarly, uh, if you, uh, or uh, you know, just to continue the housekeeping notes, uh, if you have any friends, colleagues, uh, coworkers, team members, anybody else in the business who you think might benefit from today's content, you can send them uh, the link uh, that you used uh, to register and log in today. You can send them to our website um, if that's easier, but you can still register and access to today's program. It's all streaming live on YouTube as well, and everything will be available in our brand shiny new on-demand section on our site. Uh, so feel free to check that out for archives of past sessions. And again, all the individual fireside chats will be spliced out and posted there uh, in the coming days after the conclusion of today's program. So if you can't make it all, or if you have a colleague who wanted to attend but couldn't make it, it will be available on demand. Um, if you're going to be posting and contributing and joining conversation on social, uh, then we welcome you to use the hashtag BI Livecast on Twitter, LinkedIn, and everywhere else that hashtags are an accepted uh, 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 form. So uh, again, BI Livecast. Um, I think that just about wraps up my housekeeping remarks. Again, thank you to Cisco WebEx for powering today's uh, virtual experience and being our partner. I am not emceeing today. We have Chris, uh, our fabulous partner from Influential, who's going to be joining as our guest MC, and will be hosting the entire program um, and all of the fantastic content that we have coming up. So Chris, welcome. I see you're here. We'll just wait a second for Chris to join. The, the good old mute button and camera button. There we go. I know, right? There you go. <laughs> welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. I, I thought I was going to have this power intro and instead I'm pressing the mute button. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Well, we're happy you're here. Uh, so I'll turn the virtual stage over to you to kind of tee up the day and bring on our first speakers. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Brand Innovators team. You guys have been amazing through this process. Um, this is actually our second full day effort. Uh, with brand innovators. Um, we love this so much that we are going to make this a monthly thing throughout the rest of the year. Uh, so we'll be coming uh, soon with more dates. So please keep an eye out uh, on LinkedIn primarily is where we announce these, uh, but look to probably late August uh, for our next session. Uh, again, I'm Chris Dieter. I'm the Chief Communications Officer at Influential. Uh, Influential is a social data and conversion company. Uh, that is our uh, you know, our boilerplate language. Uh, I like to usually just say that we are the world's biggest and best influencer marketing company. Um, so we have a great session to start today. Um, we're going to welcome our first speakers of the day. We're joined by Artis Stevens, who's the chief marketing officer of 4-H Club. Uh, Artis brings more than 20 years of strategic marketing experience. Uh, Artis serves as a senior vice president and chief marketing officer leading national 4-H marketing and communications efforts, driving the organization's positioning, brand strategy, marketing campaigns, communications, digital presence, uh, consumer insights, and field marketing efforts. This session will be moderated by Jordan Romano. Jordan serves as the director of West Coast Sales at Influential. Before joining Influential, Jordan was the director of brand integration at MGM Studios, where he managed various partnerships on Emmy award-winning shows, such as The Voice and Shark Tank. Welcome to the stage, Artis and Jordan. Hey, thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Love it. Artis, welcome. Hey, welcome to you as well. Thank you for uh, inviting me to join and, and share some experience. Absolutely. Well, we're thrilled to hear, have you guys on today. Um, without further ado, I'm going to make my way to stage left and you guys can go ahead and get it started. Have fun. Great, thanks so much. Artis, how you doing today? Good to see you. 
Thanks, George. It's a pleasure to be here. Really excited to, to join. I was just listening to Chris uh, read my bio, and I was like, wow, that's a mouthful. I'll have to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive bio, for sure. Um, so, yeah, we'll get started here with our uh, first question. So, yeah, we just wanted to know, you know what has been your biggest uh, change since March, uh, and how have you shifted gears as it relates to your marketing efforts? And this can be social, digital, uh, influencers, et cetera. Yeah, well, well, thank you again, Jordan, uh, for the invite and, and the question. You know, before I, before I jump into this, I do have to say one thing, though, is that uh, when you guys made me cool for, for a really short time span because my 12 and 10-year-old daughters saw that I was doing this, and they got really excited. And then they asked me, could I share their TikTok videos <laughs> while I was doing this? When I told them no, I suddenly became uncool again. So <laughs> I, I just want to give you guys props for giving me just a, a little moment under the sun and, and being cool to, to my kids. But, um, you know, just to your question, you know, obviously the world, communities, families have faced major disruptions since the, the onset, you know, COVID-19. And, and for each, it's been no different, right? We serve 6 million young people all across the country. We provide mentorship, skill building, social and emotional development that, that kids need. And in many communities, we're fabric of life. And in some, we're the only serving, only youth serving organization outside the school or religious institutions. So let me draw the connection to how that then affects our marketing efforts. You know, our programs are unique, that they're not building center. Uh, our staff and volunteers partner with young people and go where young people go. 25% uh, of our programs are delivered through schools. Um, another large percentage of it happens in after school. Uh, we're one of the leading providers in summer camps and summer programs uh, for young people, which is also a major revenue driver for us. I set all that up for you and for your viewers because you can imagine, you don't really have to imagine because you've all been experiencing it in different, different ways, what that meant when everything came to an abrupt halt in March, right? So, what we had to do was to step back like every organization, company, families, communities were doing to say, what does this mean for us? What, how do we proceed forward? And how do we think about pivoting in a way that our marketing, our branding, and our positioning is going to help us to continue to stay relevant in a time where there was so much flux and uncertainty and still is? So we really started with three questions. You know, one from a marketing perspective was, how do we help our local 4-H continue to extend in a new and virtual environment? And particularly as we think about extending their services so that program delivery that can continue to impact young people. And for us, that meant we needed to listen, we needed to learn, uh, we needed to adapt. And that was going through a process of listening sessions with our stakeholders. We are delivered by uh, land-grant universities, so public universities all across the country, so a lot of educators and who do a great job of implementing and putting programs but they, they're not, they don't have background in marketing. So it made our job just that much more uh, challenging to ensure that we were helping them to continue to position and tell their story. But it first meant that we had to listen so that we understood where their struggles were, where the opportunities, and very importantly, where the best practices were that we were able to then think about how we scale those things. So we went through a process of then thinking and say, well, how do we aggregate what we're doing well? We know there are struggles, we know there are some maybe uh, spots or gaps, but how do we focus on what we, we're doing well in this time? So we started to shift the conversation to how do we build together to be this unified system that can respond and react, at least in a unified story, and as much as we can a unified delivery, understanding that face-to-face -face programming wasn't happening uh, any longer. So we began to really think about a format to do that, and we created this, this, this uh, online resource called 4 at Home. And it was uh, our opportunity to then take what we were doing in, in real time and face-to-face -face with young people, communities, families all across the country, and the programs that we do well. We are leadership development, we are character uh, development, but we extend our programs through STEM, uh, healthy living, uh, civic engagement, agriculture and food. And having that type of curriculum, having that type of content and program that wasn't building center, but that could go anywhere, it gave us an opportunity to then reimagine to how our delivery system could then extend beyond the walls and go into homes and have interactivity where people could go online and experience 4-H in really creative ways, whether that was through video, activity guides, 
real-time surveys, online destinations, and learning destinations. And then we were able to position our experts. So I mentioned to you before that we are driven by land-grant universities or public universities. The other thing that it really helped us to think about was that we have a ton of expertise of all of these educators, and we call them education first responders. All of these educators that were in communities on the ground, well, we needed to create a platform that could position them. So being able to create this uh, uh, online platform allowed them to have a stage to work directly, not just with the communities that they serve, but also across the country. So we're now able to share best practices from Georgia to California. We're able to then take that content and package it in ways to distribute it more effectively across our entire marketplace. And then that leads me sort of to the second point, that we were able to sort of move and think about what's the, the connecting point from mission to market, right? So what do our consumers need? And we've always been a, an organization that believes in research, that believes in insights. And we didn't have a lot of time, so partly what we had to do was to take the insights, the research that we did have, and then be able to apply that to how do we ensure that we're meeting what the community needs, what our marketplace needs, so it's not just a question of uh, service delivery, but it was a question of also of fundraising and providing the revenue. Like many companies, many organizations think about their sales and marketing efforts, we have to think about it in the same way for our fundraising and marketing efforts. Uh, thankfully, we had a really incredible team. We still have a really talented, uh, incredible team that thought very, uh, with a lot of agility to think about how do we address uh, some of those gaps. Uh, and creating this, this 4 at Home uh, project allowed us to increase our web visits by four times. We had uh, more than three times of unique visitors uh, who went to our site. But very importantly, we saw our downloads increase uh, by uh, three times uh, as well because we had content that people needed at the time. And then the connection that they had with 4-H also helped them to amplify it to other people who were looking for those types of resources. And then the last couple of things that, that I'll add uh, is just that as we think about the focus on driving towards elevating that work and really thinking about positioning uh, 4-H and, and, and youth development in a time where most of the attention, particularly when COVID initially hit, was around health and hunger. So for us, it was those are where people, that's where people's minds are, and that's where the marketplace were. And we're not a health and hunger organization, and, and it's not – uh, seen as an essential need. So for us, it, it meant thinking about how do we frame um, our organization in a way um, as the, the essential need that it is, right? Because we know that youth development and what we're, what's been happening with young people not having the engagement in school is just as essential as some of the basic needs they have just in a very different way. So it wasn't that we didn't think about innovative ways that we could support and partner with organizations around health and hunger and some of the, the, the more safety type of things that were happening initially with COVID. But it was also about what, what is the next phase? What are the next things that we need to be looking ahead? And, that, and this is where I encourage uh, a lot of marketers, a lot of positioning is seeing the moment, but also seeing the moments ahead. And that's really where we've spent a lot of time having a, a parallel conversation about what were the moments ahead that we needed to think about? And one of the big moments ahead for us was simultaneously thinking about what was going to take place after this initial wave, the first wave of COVID. What was going to take place about supporting schools and having enrichment activities and community development that young people needed in services. So we created this fund called the Ford Fund that was really focused on how we uh, engage young people and communities to move forward and provided essential resources, educational resources, enrichment resources, uh, social emotional development, and the support from mentors to be able to work on the ground as effectively as they could to be able to support communities and support young people. We're now uh, totally $1 million uh, raised in that fund, uh, 60 projects uh, that we're driving uh, deep into community, and we're continuing to build in that strategy uh, to ensure that we continue the work that we're doing. So a lot of pivoting, a lot of changing, a lot of modifying to help to get us there. That's a great answer. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so in addition to that, uh, what are some strategic partnerships or collaborations, uh, organizations that have included you in their marketing campaign uh, to show you know, how they've given back recently in response to COVID or social injustice this year? Yeah, it, it is one of the the most in empowering things 
uh, around what's been happening in our society. And again, it started with COVID, but it also extends to social injustices and, and what's happening across uh, society and across the country and across the world for that matter. It's been the responsibility and the opportunity for corporate partners in corporate America. Uh, you know, I've written about this. I've worked in my career in building uh, some really incredible purpose uh, relationships and purpose partnerships over a 20 year with corporate uh, relationships. And I know the power that uh, the corporate sector can have in making impact and driving impact. Uh, and we've been fortunate to have those types of relationships with us. Uh, and I'll give you an example of a couple. Uh, one has been the incredible work that we've been doing with Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft is an incredible partner for us. They came to the table uh, with us a couple of years ago, really focusing on uh, uh, digital access and digital engagement and really thinking about how we could uh, deepen education of technology in rural communities uh, and supporting rural, rural, uh, rural communities and digital skills. But the, the real trick of the relationship was not just having a program that we were just talking to young people, but it was really about young people being empowered to teach their communities how to use technology. So the way 4 H was founded was that adults didn't want to use the latest agricultural community, I mean, uh, skills and, and education and technology at the time, but young people raised their hand and said that they did, that they wanted to, and then that's really how the boom of the, the agriculture uh, technology really took off because young people uh, led the charge in that. You fast forward 100 years, we believe in that same model, that the power and the voice of young people have the, 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 the opportunity to really change uh, seismic things in our society and come up with solutions. The Microsoft Tech Change Makers Program has been a perfect example of that because it's also helped young people to think about how do we address things that's happening in COVID. Uh, and that was one of the immediate things. You saw young people using 3D printers to create uh, mm -hmm. a mask. Uh, young people thinking about uh, technology ways that keep connected to map things in their community, to, to help and support uh, seniors in their community as well uh, who are going through issues. We've been able to elevate the, the awareness of the uh, uh, initiatives and, and engagement around 4-H at home that I mentioned earlier through our relationships with Microsoft leadership and our leadership. We had an interview with Trevor Noah, uh, for example, that talked about uh, digital literary, literary, uh, literacy skills. Uh, the, and the importance of it and the power of it to make a difference. You know, we've also saw that this is the ability to also to help to raise awareness, but also to raise funds and raise support. So another big area that we focus on has been around how do we break through in a media environment that is extremely cluttered right now. And for organizations and nonprofits particularly, it's hard to get your voice out there. So. A relationship that we've been able to build over the last year, year has been uh, Meredith, one with Meredith Publishing. Uh, and Meredith has really come on board with uh, the suite of their brand uh, to talk about issues that are important to young people and, and important to their readers. Mental health has been a critical element of that. And we know from surveys that we've done uh, throughout this year that seven out of 10 young people feel incredibly stressed and traumatized about what they're experiencing and what they're seeing in the country. What we're doing with Meredith is trying to bring and elevate that issue even more as, as we think about the programs, as we think about solutions, as we think about strategies to not only engage young people in part of the solution, but to make adults partners with young people so that they're listening, that they're open and access to opportunity. And then the, the third partnership I'll, I'll share with you is, is a little different than corporate, uh, but it's also just that relevant and just that important is influencer partnerships. Uh, one of the key influencer partnerships that we've had is with Carla Hall, uh, you know, famous celebrity chef who has done some incredible work. Carla just happens to be a 4-H alum from Tennessee, so shout out to uh, our 4-H alums who may be watching uh, as well. Uh, but Carla has been in a relationship with us for, for a long time, but particularly active over the last year, a year and a half, in terms of food, nutrition, cooking, uh, activities and engagements that families can do together. We're all struggling, right, being at home. And it's, it's challenging being isolated. And what we wanted to do was a couple of things. One, something that could help to elevate the idea of nutrition and food and the importance of it in eating healthy uh, during this time frame, but also things you could do with your family and that you could connect. 
you know, Carl has really been an advocate of that and, and particularly an advocate when it comes culturally as well to thinking about the, the gap when it, uh, when it relates to food disparities in communities, particularly communities of color. So Carl is working with us more to focus in on areas and communities that we're working with. Uh, we also have the privilege of partnering with, as part of our 40 system, uh, a number of historically black colleges and universities. So that's been part of our partnership range as well in working with Carla. But it, it's because of those types of relationships that allow us the, the opportunity to elevate our platform and tell an effective story. So, you know, I'll sum this up is, is it's the ability to think innovatively, right? To say that you may not have a lot of resources, you may not have a lot of budget, but what do you have as your assets that maybe you can rethink your assets, reposition your assets? We don't have $50 million budget. I wish I had that. I wish I had a tenth of it or 1% or of it. Uh, but we do have an incredibly talented team, an incredibly talented partner. And when we create those innovations together, we can come up with things that can change the world. And we know that's possible. Yeah, I love that. Um, and you touched on this briefly. I know you guys are preparing to launch a new campaign uh, called Opportunity for All uh, to create an America where young, all young people have an opportunity to succeed. So I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit more about that and then how a brand can specifically get involved um, in that campaign. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. So, you know, what Opportunity for All is about, the, the, the name is uh, pretty straightforward and, and uh, we're really excited about this approach uh, and the effort and, and part of the reason why we're excited about it, and, I'll, and I'll share with you just very briefly a story. I, I grew up in the South. I grew up uh, in a, a family that didn't have a lot of means, uh, a very large family, so I'm the youngest <laughs> of, of eight. And um, yeah, a lot of kids, Jordan. <laughs> yeah. We all, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> we all got along, right? We all figured it out. Most of the time, um, and, I'm sure, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, but, you know, what was interesting about growing up was that we didn't have a lot of, 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 of richness, richness in terms of financial, but we had a lot of richness in terms of research, resources and relationships because we had the network around us. We were able to, to get, get opportunities because, you know, my mom and my dad believed in it. I had an, what you call an empty network where people in your community, they saw you doing something wrong, they were quick to grab you and say, hey, you need to go in this direction, right? And then we had access to certain things in terms of, you know, the, the, my mom and my dad made sure that we were, uh, even sometimes we moved to get into a better school. It, it, it's those types of things that I had access to, even though I didn't have a lot of means. But I'm, I'm sharing an example for you because I had, and I won't mention his name, but I had a friend who I grew up with who, he grew up in another community. He didn't have those things. He didn't have that kind of support. He didn't have those types of resources. But I will tell you, he had the exact same ability or even more than I had. Smarter, talented, incredibly gifted. But he went in a very different direction than I went. Uh, and it wasn't due to his ability. It wasn't about his smarts. It wasn't about his ability to achieve. It was a lot about his environment and the resources that he had available and accessible to him, right? That's what we're talking about with the opportunity gap, that when you really look in a, a large perspective across our country, there are millions of young people who are facing a gap in the challenge, not because of who they are, not because of their talents and their gifts, but more so because of the lack of resources, the lack of opportunity, the lack of connections that they have to build and develop and grow into the people that we know that they can become because of their potential. And a lot of it has to do with race, a lot of it has to do with income, and a lot of it has to do with where you grow up and where you live that too often determine uh, a young person's trajectory. We have to change that, and we have to eliminate that opportunity gap. And that's what 4-H is about. We know we can't do it alone. We know that it takes partners to do it, and we know that it takes a lot of people coming together to say, this thing has to stop, and we can be committed to stopping it and driving it. So we're doing a few things to call people to action uh, here to start over the next few months. We've been doing and uh, working on uh, issues in, of inequities uh, for years. So this is not new for us. What is, is the commitment of trying to frame it and brand it in this way and communicate it in this way with a number of folks who we're bringing around as experts, thought leaders. So uh, we are releasing a, a white paper that's gonna go deeper uh, into this issue called Beyond the Gap. 
Um, I'm excited for that to release uh, on August 5th uh, coming up. We're also hosting an opportunity for all forum, and that forum is going to be a deep dive into the discussions and the engagement of this issue. And what I love about everything that I'm telling you is none of it's about 4-H. None of it's about adults. Every single thing that I'm talking about, young people are leading the way. It's youth voice. It's youth action. So you're going to see young people who are driving the discussion uh, in this forum. You're going to see adults partnering. We're going to bring experts. You're going to see celebrities engaged in it. But it's going to be about adults really engaging and partnering uh, in this, this effort. And then we're launching a campaign that, of course, is going to have some of your traditional campaign elements, PSAs, uh, advertising, uh, digital, uh, and social. Uh, but more than that, it's going to be about the substantive work that we can all do together, programs, content, volunteering, engagement, investing and donating and giving to support the mission of youth development organizations and the impact of positive youth development and positive experiences. And we're asking people to go to 4 you know, right now and, and sign up and join us. As a matter of fact, as you go and you go to 4 we're going to ask you to sign up to uh, register for this, this event that we have coming up as well uh, called the Opportunity for All Forum. So we're excited about where that's going to go, and we're excited about having partners to join with us. And if you're a partner that's looking uh, to and interested uh, to join one, you can, uh, you can certainly reach out to me and shoot me a note. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about how you can address the gap and the disparities and inequity, or if you want to learn more and dive a little deeper, go to our website at 4 uh, and you can learn more about how you can address it and how you can work with an organization that's looking to do the same. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, and then, you know, as we make our way out of the pandemic and transition into the new normal, uh, what content considerations is 4-H making to creative and messaging uh, implicitly impacted by distancing and social issues. Yeah, so the, you know, I, I do want to talk a little bit around the social issues, right? Because that's very near and dear uh, to my heart. I, I shared a little bit about how we were thinking about content and creation, and particularly with 4-H at home, other ways that we're delivering content. We are also we also have um, uh, so that what we're calling unbox opportunities, which is a way for us to take curriculum and content and and provide that directly to the doorsteps of young people and communities. And this is particularly important for communities that don't have rural broadband, or rural broadband excuse me. Uh, you know, there are 12 million young people uh, that are lacking uh, that kind of access all across the country, uh, particularly in our rural areas. And, you know, there's more that we can do about that. So we're thinking about how we create content and also how we create content for families in subscription kind of models where a family can buy uh, a, a STEM kit or a camp camping kit uh, for them or health uh, nutrition kit, but they can also donate one as well. So we want to look at those types of innovative mo models to be able to uh, provide for the families who can, but also support the families who can't. The other thing that I just want to mention is the reflection of, of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, across our country. Uh, it's very important to me. I've faced it personally. I've seen it in my family where um, we come up to come up against issues of social injustice, uh, and, and, and I've written about it. I've written about even the idea of growing up as a, as, a, as a young black boy and having a conversation with my father at the age of nine called the talk, right? And that's, you commonly find that in the, in the black community, particularly for a lot for uh, young boys and girls where they're growing up and they're told, hey, here's how you, you need to go out of the house and essentially survive. Um, and these conversations are important, and they're not just for uh, the black community, they're for people of color of all, uh, all races. And it's not just for the black community to, to solve, but it's for all of us to solve because this issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion is something important for every single person. And that's what I'm so excited about because when we see the conversation that's happening out of our country, the conversation, two things I can say about it, there's a rainbow of people from all backgrounds, from all experiences. Uh, that are getting out there to help to address and to solve the issues that we've been dealing with uh, for, our, for centuries in our country and that are really coming to head. But the other thing that I'll say that sort of brings us full circle is that I'm most proud that who's leading this conversation, who's leading what you see on TV, who's leading the engagement of, of discussion is young people. And that's what 4-H believes in. That's what we've always believed in, that the way we're going to solve the big, biggest issues that involve us is going to be from young people. And we've been 
just fortunate to have young people all across 4-H who step up and who step out. Uh, we have a group of young leaders who are part of our board. We have a, a young leaders who are leading programs uh, in every state uh, across this country, every community uh, across this country. And the mobilization of young people and giving them the platform, that is the way and that's the solution that we see in being able to solve some of these challenges. That's where the conversation starts. And then that's where the action will ultimately be able to deliver on ensuring that we are bringing ourselves together around solving these issues as a country. And our goal is going to be to, to create a platform, and that's really what Opportunity for All is about, is create a platform not just for all of young people in terms of helping them, but providing a platform for, uh, for all of young people to be empowered to solve the things that they see in their communities, to solve the inequities that we see across our society. And we know when we do that in a program that focuses 4-H and other youth development and other initiatives that are out there, we have the ability to do it. That's a great answer. Um, we actually have some questions coming in from the audience now, so I can read a few of those. Uh, Isabel wants to know, how has your leadership style changed over the uh, past few months? Um, and have you been able to develop more personal relationships with your colleagues? Yeah. Well, Isabel, thanks for that question. Uh, you know, I would say that my leadership, my leadership style, uh, his, his, I think it stayed, I, I'll probably address this in two ways. I would say that when you go through, I've had to work with crisis communication a lot in my career. And one of the things that I would say about leadership uh, during crisis and doing trauma and doing challenge is the importance for it to stay consistent, right? So. Uh, I'll probably answer it probably in a different way. My leadership style has stayed consistent. My leadership style has been about the relationship and the people. I, I, my perspective is always about people first. Uh, and, and I understand that marketing is not an advertising. My, marketing is not a, a press release. Marketing is not a piece of communication. Marketing is relationships, right? So I live my life by the idea of relationships and building relationships, not for how it benefits me, but how it creates value for the people that I work with. And, and ultimately, when you look and your perspective is that way, it allows you to apply that in the way that you lead and the way that you manage. So a lot of what, what you know, I've done is, is really work with my team on how we're thinking about not just the next execution or the next um, work, but how do we think about their families and their balance? Uh, how do we think about creative ways that we give them mental health moments so that when they're empowered, when they, are, they feel fully in seen, their best work comes forward? How do we ensure that their voice is being heard at every level of the organization? So from our board to our executive leadership team to every single aspect of our organization that everyone should have access and there shouldn't be any cutoff uh, to how we think about that. You know, I'll, I'll also say though, as my, my, some of the changes I will sort of reflect is that you know, I've had to think about just the level of patience in being able to try to drive things from afar. Right, it, it's easy sometimes when you're in the office and you can walk over to someone and have that conversation. But you have to have a level of patience and a, and a level of mindfulness in working with people because there are a lot of moms and dads who are working at home and they're holding their kids in one hand and they're and they're holding their their phone in another. Right? Yeah, so definitely. You have yeah. to keep you have to keep those things in mind because that's the perspective of how we ensure that there's balance for people and that we're allowing to, them to feel empowered throughout their life so they can be empowered at the workplace as well. And then also this uh, next question comes from Chris. What motivated you to want to join the 4-H team? Yeah, well, I will tell you my, uh, my CEO, my CEO uh, her name is Jennifer Sarangelo, is a pretty incredible uh, salesperson and fundraiser, uh, she, but she's a, just an incredible visionary leader, uh, most importantly. And uh, it, I worked in youth development, I've been working in youth development for most of my career. Uh, and when I had a chance to see the vision that Jennifer and the team had for this organization and growing this organization, and the, 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 what I would call the treasure chest of this organization that many people didn't know about. Uh, Jordan, I'm sure when you probably first heard about 4-H, I don't know if you had experience when you were a kid, but when you first heard about 4-H, most people think about agriculture. They think about uh, farms. Right. They think about the county fair. And by the way, all that's true. It is that, but it's so much more. And 
Jennifer had seen that and she saw that and, and that was the part of really bringing me on board to say, here's this visionary leader who, who wants to really take this organization to what it can be and the potential that it has to empower young people, six million of them now, hopefully 10 million uh, uh, here soon, uh, to really change this country and change it in a positive way. But I'll say one last thing to that. That's what got me in, but it's not what's kept me here. I've been here for over six years. And what's kept me here are the people, the relationships that I've built, and the relationships that I've built with my team, uh, the way that they manage up and, and, and coach me, and I learn from them, the relationships that I've built uh, across the organization with my executive team, uh, and the positive connections that we have as people, not just as professionals, but as people. Uh, the relationship that uh, if, if many of you work in sales and marketing, you know sometimes there can be this disconnect between sales and marketing. Uh, and that's the same way for nonprofits. There can be a disconnect between fundraising and marketing. Well, I've been uh, uh, honored and, and, and really fortunate uh, to have a, a partner, in, and her name is Jill Bramble, who's our, our Senior Vice President of, of Resource Development, uh, who's been incredible in building this type of structure where our two teams work in sync. They work in alignment. In that way, we can build a fundraising and marketing strategy and approach that works seamlessly and that drives our consumers, that drives our donors, that helps to create the greatest value for our partners, but it's all about relationship driven and all about ensuring that our team is continuously growing, developing and have voice and can see outcomes that lead us to success. Awesome, awesome. And then one last question. Um, have you changed your personal media consumption since the pandemic started? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it Yes, I have, and, and, I, and I laugh because I, I have to answer that question both from yes, from a professional standpoint, but also from a from a dad standpoint. Because <laughs> are you on TikTok media... yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 a lot of my media consumption has been um, TikTok. Uh, let's see, Harry Potter. So I'm I'm big into Harry Potter, not because I want to be, because my two <laughs> kids are humongous Harry Potter fans. So they're basically teaching me about Harry Potter, and I can't even watch the first movie. I, I, I haven't watched the, a Harry Potter movie yet, but I can't even watch the first movie until I, I finish three more classes. So then they take me online. You have to go out and do these tests. So now I know that I'm in the Raven, Raven's Claw um, uh, house, if you will, now so I know where my personality <laughs> lines me up. <laughs> so right. It's, it's, it's a lot of that, Jordan. And But it, it's also been beneficial to – uh, yeah, read more um, because I'm in front of the phone. I have my phone with me. I, I, I'm in front of uh, the laptop. And then you're just trying to stay plugged, in, I mean, plugged in and connected as well. Uh, and the thing I would recommend to, to those who are watching and those who are viewing, because I know time gets hard, but even if it's that quick blog, even if it's that quick thing that you read that just gives you motivation in the morning to get up and to feel inspired, uh, even if it's the thing that you, you say, I'm going to read through, uh, four pages of this book, and it, maybe it takes me a year to do it, but I'm going to read four pages, you know, every day or every couple of days. Find the things that give you your space. Find the things that give you your balance, because that's how you continue to be a well-rounded leader, but most importantly, a well-rounded person. Uh, and it's certainly been helpful for me, uh, stressful, but it's certainly helpful to try to balance things out. Got it. Yeah, it looks like we have a little bit more time, actually, for a few more questions from the audience that keep coming in. So I'll ask you just a few more. Um, someone says, I remember the 4-H commercials from the old days. Have you ever thought of bringing back the vintage ads? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whoever asked that question, thank you. I love that you asked that question. Um, you know, interesting enough, we have, we, we just, we recently did some, some uh, vintage uh, stuff. We typically do a lot of our vintage stuff through our, uh, e our products. So we have vintage t-shirts. So again, if you want to check any of this stuff out, you can go to 4 Um, But we do a lot of vintage stuff through our products and our e-commerce. Uh, interesting enough, though, the new PSA that we're about to launch uh, in a few weeks is the first time we're ever doing an animated PSA. So we, we said we needed to ensure that we're thinking about, one, the world, uh, the freshness of our brand, the relevancy of our brand. So we're going to tell a story about the opportunity gap by talking about this line. And we're going to show a visual animation of this line and how that line really starts to create 
and comes to fruition and, and create things um, on the storyboard that people will be able to follow in the narrative of this new PSA. Got it. Um, another question, how do you envision technology changing uh, to support a new generation of workers um, who work from home? Yeah, so I think if you, if you look at what you've been doing uh, personally, right? I mean, think about some of the things that you've been doing uh, personally, and, that, and I think those are the things that we're thinking about as well. I think we're thinking about how people, you, are, people are using their leisure time. Of course, things like social media and following stuff, but even the increase of gamification, right? So when we think about young people, we can't be the 4-H of old or, or looking at 4-H in a way that maybe we have standard delivery when you have kids who are now using Minecraft and other types of uh, gamification, not just kids either, but adults and how we sort of tap into the, uh, things like that. We have to also look at the, the, the increase in technology, um, particularly when you think about things such as uh, uh, content development and the new ways of publishing, you know, e-readers and, and how you use e-readers and interactivity. We've been talking to, in a partnership with Microsoft, a lot around the idea of AI, right, and, and how we think about AI. AI is already big in the agricultural field and a lot of uh, technology. But it's important because we think about skill development for young people and their careers. What's the next wave of the things that they have to understand so that their career development and career growth and their employability stays relevant to where the world is going? So the way that we're looking at this more 360 is what do we need to be on the trend line with when it comes to corporations, when it comes to how they're thinking about their workforce pipeline, and then think about what does that mean for young people? What does that mean for universities? What does it mean for schools? And then how does an organization like 4-H, that's an intersecting point between all of those, then provide a solution aspect with the voice of young people to prepare them for the skills of both today as well as tomorrow? Uh, yeah, this next question comes from Bianca. How has your interactions with influencers uh, changed since COVID? So this is very personal to us at Influential as well. So I uh, would like to know that if you can explain a little bit. Oh, with, the, with, the, with, with your uh, organization, with your agency? No, with influencers in general, um, just how has your interactions oh, with influencers. influencers changed? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying influential. I was like, I love you, <laughs> I love, I love you guys. Love that. Love to hear uh, that. <laughs> so, so, yes, with, with, with influencers, it's always a balancing act. And, and, and what I would say about that is you've seen a lot on social media of influencers and particularly celebrity influencers who get it right. And we've seen a lot of on social media of the celebrity influencers who get it wrong, right? And anytime you align yourself with any kind of brand, whether that's a, a corporate brand, institutional brand, or a more personal brand, the question I would always would, would always ask, and, and I'm sharing this with you because this is the question that we ask all, all the time, and this is how it influences me, is that is it authentic to who we are, right? We turn down relationships because even though they may have big names, even though they may be significant, they're not who we are. They're not relevant to who we are. And it's made us have to think more about what's our filter. What are the things that we're going to say yes to and why? And what are the things we're going to say no to? And we have to have a filter that allows us to make that decision adequately so that we, one, protect our brand, but also we're doing things that when it goes out to our audiences, to our alumni, to our consumers, they see it from a perspective of see it feeling like it's real and true to 4-H and who we are. And then just personally, I've just been inspired by meeting um, a lot of the, the leaders that, that I've, I've met. You'll see some of these folks if you tune in to, to our forum, uh, about some of the leaders in the marketplace who are just thinking about these issues around young people, particularly with school uh, coming back and the uncertainty. There are some amazing thought leaders that are out, that are out there, folks like Karen Pittman, um, who that name may not sound familiar, but if you haven't heard that name, uh, you should look it up, uh, but who are thinking about these types of issues and these types of areas of how do we address the issues that we're seeing facing young people all across our country. Uh, those people are the ones more than, I would even say more than celebrities uh, who inspire me, but then the celebrities who do are folks like Jennifer Nettles, who's our national spokesperson, and many of you know from Sugar Land and her own successful mm -hmm. uh, career, but Jennifer is having a deep conversation with young people right now around racial uh, and social justice, right? And how her role is being an ally uh, and being an ally, particularly for communities, uh, you know, BPOC, right? Black, indigenous, people of color and, and communities 
and thinking about how she can be an ally and how she can help encourage others to be an ally as we think about uh, issues that are affecting communities all across the country. Got it, got it. And uh, this next question comes from somebody in California. Uh, they live in California. They don't hear much about 4-H here. Is 4-H focused on certain parts of the country? <laughs> what? Wait, we we got to get out. Listen, California is one of our biggest 4-H states. We, we, whoever, you know, whoever sent that question, we got to send you some of the contacts. The state program leader, uh, our 4-H <laughs> program leader in, in 4-H in California. Yeah, so 4-H is everywhere, right? So let me just give you just a, a, a little bit to, to the question. So we serve every community, every county, every parish in America. Some, of course, much deeper than others, but we're able to do that because we have, as I mentioned earlier, these universities that are, which we call cooperative extension. I won't go into all the details of that, but we have public universities who have been staff who work on the ground. So they, they all work for the public university, but they serve the county. So you may not be, you may not see us, but a lot of the things that you probably don't know are actually 4-H driven, right? There's a lot of things that happen in your community where it happens, whether it's some of the things you know traditionally, you're, of course, things like county fairs, uh, those types of things where you'll see 4-H young people involved. But there are also a lot of activities and experiences when it comes on to STEM programming uh, in your community or when you're seeing things regarding health fairs that uh, 4-H uh, is connected to. But I will say that we need more. And the only way that we can grow and get to those communities and get deeper, I should say, in those communities is by people like you, people who are willing to volunteer, people who are willing to invest, uh, and people who are willing to, to join us to make sure that programs like 4-H can reach more communities, a deep, deep in its penetration of more communities, uh, and help more kids. So again, here's my shameless plug. You know, go to 4-H.org. You can learn more about where we are, what we're doing, uh, also in ways that you can help. Great. Uh, and this, this one's for me, actually. What's been a key motivator that gets you up each morning uh, during these unprecedented <laughs> times? I just want to know, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Yeah, <laughs> so that's a really good question, man. I, of course, the, the simple answer to that, I'll, I'll give you two. The simple answer to that is my kids, right? I think about them, and I think about uh, their future. I think about their today. Uh, I enjoy the conversation. That's been one of the blessings of even being at home. Probably not for them, but they're so like, ah, oh, would you leave us alone? But right. for me, uh, a lot of it is the experience with my kids and knowing that uh, every morning I'm getting up, that it's a morning with them, and it's a morning with them, and it's a morning with my wife, uh, and the ability to continue to, to engage uh, with them. And then I'll say the, the other thing, which is probably much more on a, a bigger, broader sense, and this is going to sound really odd, so I want to make sure I, I frame this correctly, that some something something happened with me that was just incredibly the best way i can say it was like it was a motivator when when the protests started taking place and it it it, it is i felt every emotion jordan sadness anger mm -hmm. frustration hurt but then i had a conversation with my dad and my dad grew up in the civil rights era, era. and you know he talked to me and he shared he said, I see a lot of similarities back then. And he said, there are challenges, of course. But he said, in every challenge, there's an opportunity. And that, that really changed my, my, my outlook. And why I share that with you and why I share that with everyone who may be listening or viewing here is that I'll say that, you know, there's no way, of, of course, that we can relate um, to you know, George Floyd's family and, and the many other names who have experienced what they've experienced. But what we can do is we can try our best and try our hardest to ensure that those types of things don't continue to happen, right? That's all of our opportunity. That's all of our uh, ability, and that's all of our potential. And for me, what's incredibly motivating is when I get up in the morning and I know I have the ability to try to make that change because I have a sphere of influence in working with 4-H. Not to be political, I'm, I'm not, because that, that's not what we do, not to be some, some uh, different advocacy, but in my own way, in positive youth development, helping young people, working with partners, working with influencers, working with stakeholders, telling a broader story that's going to enlighten more young people and more communities to say, we can make a difference too, whether that has to do with this particular issue or whether it has to do with the environment. 
or uh, changing something in terms of rights or voting or engaging uh, physically in their community or thinking about the next innovation for career development. That, that for me, is where my inspiration comes from. And I'm excited about what the future holds, and I'm excited about the people that I'm, I'm doing this journey with, both personally and professionally. Yeah, thank you so much for that very heartfelt and uh, honest answer. Really appreciate that. All right, it's Jordan. Thank you so much, guys. This was a great session. Artists, um, I, I actually I have to admit, I was the guy that uh, asked the question about the vintage commercials. Um, <laughs> this was like a total trip down memory lane for me. So uh, I come from Florida. So down there, the, the culture was very strong and um, really excited to see uh, you guys are still out there fighting the good fight, doing, doing the good things for the kids. So thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, you had a great message. Uh, we look forward to working with you a lot more in the future. Chris, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And appreciate all the work that Influential is doing and, and proud to be part of the brand innovator. So thank you again for the invite. Thanks so much, Artis. Thanks again, Jordan. All right, so we're moving on. Uh, that, that was a heck of a, uh, a first session for the day. Um, we're gonna just keep it moving from here. Uh, next, we're gonna be joined by uh, Jake Crumbine, the head of global influence at Impossible Foods, uh, Tony Colvin, the content and media manager at Del Monte Foods, and David Bornoff, who is the senior director and head of consumer marketing at DoorDash. Obviously, this is a very food-oriented session, and, and for that, there is literally no better man I can think of to moderate the session uh, then my coworker and good friend, Joe Piascovi. Uh, Joe is the VP of Brand Strategy and Partnerships at Influential. And before that, uh, we actually had the good fortune of working with him uh, as he ran uh, US social media at McDonald's. And we were fortunate enough to bring him over to our company. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Joe and let you take it away. Thank you, sir. Do we have everybody on here? I'm only seeing the, um, not seeing faces. Yep, you have Tony. Okay. Good morning. There we go. It's probably my view here. That's great. Good morning. Thank you guys for joining. And this is uh, a great panel. I'm really excited to get an opportunity to talk to you guys and, and share your knowledge with the brand innovators. Uh, audience out there, uh, obviously very diverse panel right here uh, and, and a ton of experience. So excited about the conversation. Um, before we kick it off, um, I was hoping maybe you guys could just share a little bit about what you do at your respective companies and maybe what brought you there. And then we can kind of get into uh, you know a broader conversation. Um, David, if, if you want to start us off, that'd be great. Sure. Hey, everybody out there. I'm David Bornoff. I lead our consumer marketing team at DoorDash. I've been at the company just shy of two years. Prior to DoorDash, I was at Pandora. So I spent a lot of time sort of in an adjacent space. I think of food the same way I think about music, really. It's like different passion points and ways into people's hearts. Um, and, and, and cultural connectors, these are the things that like really define you know, our identity. And I think like food is one of those great vehicles for connecting people, um, sparking conversation, um, I think influencing change in culture. Um, and, and so like the opportunity to come over from a place where I was getting to do a bit of that with music, to do that with something that looked a little bit different, but also familiar was just a super exciting opportunity. Um, the company is really a place that is driven by by our mission, our vision, and our values. So that was something that was very important to me and really aligned with what I was looking for um, as my next opportunity. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Uh, you know, at McDonald's, we did uh, a lot of work with Pandora as well and sort of various other music properties and companies. And, you know, I agree that very few things go together as well as sort of music and, and food and the experience that the two kind of bring together. So it's really cool to kind of hear your transition, um, you know, from Pandora over to uh, DoorDash. Uh, Tony, what about you? Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, Tony Colvin here, content and media manager at Del Monte. Uh, so really, my role, uh, I like to say it's a jack of all trades, uh, but at a very high level, it's about 
really creating that content, um, telling that story, engaging consumers um, through our products. Um, we have such a plethora of products. We're a legacy brand. I mean, we've been in homes, you know, for over 130 years. Um, and, you know, really our role is how do we tell that story? How do we continue to engage consumers in an authentic, in an authentic way uh, and, and really just help them, you know, kind of live their best lives? My, you know, I got my start in advertising um, in agency world. So, you know, coming from different creative shops, um, Joe, I actually saw that we had a very similar connection. So that was awesome yeah, to see. That up, man. We were both at Vayner <laughs> for a little bit. Yeah. So that was awesome. Um, and then, you know, what attracted me to Del Monte is, you know, was the passion around really just helping, helping people, you know, be making sure that we're providing nutritious food, um, for families, um, and, and really just the heart behind it. And, you know, everyone that I work with has such heart and, you know, that's, you know, that's what gets us up in the morning. That's what, you know, allows us to innovate new products. You know, yeah. how do we continue to bring, you know, nutritious foods to everyone? Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah. It's a pretty incredible brand. I mean, you certainly have been in my pantry since I was a child, you know, and, and still there. So it's, uh, you know, certainly iconic. And I had no idea it was 130 years old though as well. I mean, yeah. that, that's a pretty uh, incredible history. Um, Jake, how about you? Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Jake, I work at Impossible Foods. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Impossible Foods, uh, who we are, we make um, meat, dairy, and fish products directly from plants. Uh, and the mission of the company is to replace the need for animals um, in, in, the, in the food system, in the global food system. So our first product was the Impossible Burger. Uh, I joined the company about four years ago, right before uh, we launched the, the first product. Um, we also have a second product, which is plant-based sausage. Um, but we really see uh, kind of our, our RNA and our technology almost like a tech platform. So we have different plant proteins and we know how they interact with each other. So we have prototypes for chicken, fish, steak, et cetera. Um, but really a, our company exists um, that is a mission-based company. And so the better we do on the business side means we're fulfilling the mission. And that's what kind of excites me. Um, it's rare to find those two things aligned. Um, they have a kind of environmental mission directly tied uh, to the success on, on the business side. Yeah, to continue my fangirling, you know, I um, had been a big fan of everything you guys have been doing. It's been an incredible journey to watch as well. Um, and to your point, you know, it's it's really impressive to see a mission-based company sort of quickly reach the scale you guys have been able to reach um, and sort of con the, the consumer awareness that exists around the product. Um, you know, I think it's it's a bright future and certainly essential to um, continuing to you know, respect our environment. Um, so keep up the good work there. Um, you know, before we get too into kind of like us talking broadly about marketing trends, you know, something that I'm sort of really obsessed with right now is just kind of ways of working and how the last few months have really shifted that dynamic. And I'm just curious if you guys could all touch on um, sort of kind of where you're based, are you, how your team dynamics have shifted? Are you working from home? Um, and sort of maybe any challenges and, and benefits you guys are seeing there. Um, Tony, I don't know if you want to kick us off on this one. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I think for us, uh, we're based out of Walnut Creek, California. Um, we're, we're pretty much all working from home now. Um, and I think for us, uh, you know, actually, our uh, new senior digital manager, she actually onboarded while we were all at home. So, you know, having, you know, an extra person on the digital team joining remotely uh, was such a challenge, uh, but in a positive way, because it really forced us all to, I think at the very top level, it forced us all to really rely on that trust. So, you know, when you're in a day-to-day -day office, you can always say, yes, sure, I trust my colleagues. I, I know that we're doing what's right for the company. But when you're literally virtual and everyone's at home, that trust gets ratcheted up to another notch. Um, yeah. And so for us, it's really been like that communication, um, kind of setting boundaries and that trust, you know, and even going into, you know, just the, the, the vertical that I handle, the content creation part of it is, you know, being able to work remotely with production teams. Um, you know, we were already, you know, working with teams in Argentina, working with teams in New York. So for us, you know, this, uh, you know, 
the pandemic forcing us to be home actually allowed us to really showcase to the larger organization like we can still you know crank out you know top notch content we can still you know keep our activations running we can still you know you know continue to do the things that we were doing to bring you know best in class content to the organization um without you know a drop in speed or a drop in you know uh quality or production value so i think that has been the big key for us um, throughout the past couple months is a trust b communication and then c being able to find those avenues that allow us to you know still remain efficient providing quality content um and then just you know tapping different networks um and i think that's so important you have to constantly iterate and figure out what is going to be the best method for getting the results that we need absolutely in terms of your like the the content creation piece that you touched on there i mean I know you were saying you were working with teams all across the world. I mean, how have you guys centralized it more within the states now, or have you been working, say, with influencers to get some of that content created? I mean, how have you guys sort of pivoted to um, getting still being able to create content at scale, even though you're sort of working from home now? Sure. Uh, so I like to think of it as our content stack. Um, you know, we we have a great mix of you know agency influencer, third party. Um, third party content creators, third party photographers. So for us, it's it's all about the mix mm -hmm. um, and and knowing, you know, which team to tap for which project um, and, and kind of that cadence. Um, yeah. And it, you know, it's worked out well, like I've been there for two and a half years now. And in that time, we've just fine tuned that cadence. So, you know, as soon as the brand managers come to us and say, well, hey, we got a project, you know, immediately we know which team to tap um, and we're able to start you know, immediately building out this timeline. So I think it's about having a stack um, yeah. and, and really knowing when to tap which team for what project. Cool. And David, what about a DoorDash? Yeah, I mean, I'd echo a lot of what Tony said. I think the team has been relatively distributed throughout. Um, yeah. you know, we, we've built this up as an organization that's across the country. Marketing doesn't just sit in HQ. Uh, so the idea of having to understand how to work remotely was kind of a thing that we had somewhat figured out before. Um, I don't think it was ever perfect. It's still not perfect. There's a lot of learning that, you know, is still to be done. We're still trying to figure out like what's the most efficient way to have a brainstorm when you've got 12 people on a Zoom meeting. Um, there are these little things that are just like, you know, obvious when you think about them and then you put them into practice and you go, oh shit, like this is not right. <laughs> um, getting to, to uh, alignment on something while you're talking about, you know, having 25 people potentially on a remote meeting, challenging. Yeah. So what it's done is really look to like, how do we empower individuals? How do we put them in the DRI seat and really let them own the outcome? And that's been pretty effective. So we're saying now, like, listen, you own this thing ultimately you're going to be the decision maker and whatever the tools are, whatever the resources you need, you're going to have them. But at the end of the day, like this is going to live with you um, because we just simply can't like get to the thing that you could do when you're sitting in a room with a person right? or a team of people. Um, right. As far as like the partners and our vendors and who we use and how we create content, like those things are really almost entirely what tony said so so a lot of that would just be me repeating things um i think the maybe the add-on to that is we have three audiences right we have our merchants we have our dashers and then there's the consumers so we're creating content across all three of those audiences and really leaning into those different groups of people to help us create as well so it's a lot of like udc and a lot of leaning into like here's this great resource of you know hundreds of thousands of restaurant partners that we can talk to lots and lots and lots of dashers that we can talk to and consumers to help us tell the stories how do you um target the dashers versus the other two segments you were talking about there is that like is there sort of an internal type of content source for them or um you know, maybe you could speak to that a little bit more yeah, so both. I mean, I think about them the same way that I think about our consumer audience. We we are are constantly communicating with dashers about things they need to know, and we're also acquiring 
new dashers, right? So we need to keep the roads supplied. There's a growth team that focuses on Dasher acquisition, and there's an audience team, which is just focused on like Dasher messaging. How do we tell the story to Dashers to make it the most appealing place to work? Absolutely. And um, before I move on to Jake, I agree that the um, brainstorming piece is certainly a challenge in this new environment. Have you guys found tools that you think work well in that environment to sort of foster more collaboration and sort of interactivity? Yeah, I wish I had a good answer here. I found a lot of like memes that I just share that that right. <laughs> people that the thing is totally screwed. Uh, no, like, I, I think a lot of it has just become like this idea of, of the trust, right? Of putting trust in in a certain like handful of people and removing as many blockers as possible. So taking brainstorms that could have been, you know, 12, 13 people and yeah. reducing the size of that group to something more manageable. Um, getting very, very, very sharp on briefs. So where we might've been a little bit looser in a creative brief because marketing could have sat with creatives to sort of work it out together. On the marketing side, I'm making sure that the team is delivering the sharpest brief possible. That's just like consolidated, clear, so that you can put it in front of a creative and get back something that's like, going to be a lot closer than we probably would have done had we all been able to sit in a room together. Right. Absolutely. Jake, how have things uh, changed there for uh, Impossible? Yeah, I, I think um, I agreed with, with uh, what Tony and Dave said about kind of team. Uh, I'll just, I'll talk about things kind of, um, this is caveated in the, the sadness that is COVID. So I'll right. acknowledge that what we have done coming out of COVID and because of COVID are some pretty interesting business uh, changes. We launched a, a DT, a direct to consumer channel, um, which was, was exciting for us actually working with, uh, with folks over at DoorDash, David on um, a, um, a, a kind of a, an impossible um, shop uh, on, on DoorDash um, and that we've launched a pilot in, in Los Angeles. Um, and those are things that, Historically, the company has not been interested in doing. We were not interested in kind of running our own restaurant, certainly, or our virtual brand. We were we were not focusing on the direct consumer channel. And because of because of COVID, um, we quickly, uh, first of all, we quickly ramped up our retail um, expansion and also launched a direct consumer channel, which we probably would not have done um, otherwise. So, um, those are just I guess kind of uh, yeah. business things that were interesting that came out of out of the the reality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to your point of, it's obviously a very difficult situation, you know, and a lot of pain and suffering has come from from COVID across the board, but it has allowed us to, you know, think about new ways of doing business and working, which I think certainly is a benefit. You know, I um, have worked at agencies and then obviously McDonald's, one of the biggest corporations as well. And now kind of back to the agency model. And it, it felt, especially at corporations, like we had sort of entered this sort of unconscious mode of work where you just sort of defaulted to this eight hours a day and so many meetings and obviously like eight plus hours a day and the five day work week. And I've always just been like, why, why can't we innovate beyond that? You know, so I'm really interested now to see what kind of innovations actually stick here, especially as we start hopefully going back to the offices and being able to move around. Um, a little bit more. So thank you guys for sharing that. I think there's some really uh, interesting perspectives there. You know, Jake, you kind of touched on where I wanted to shift it now, um, which is really how your strategies have changed since March. Um, what, like, have you guys been exploring new channels? Um, has social or maybe influencers become more of a priority, less of a priority? I mean, really, how has your strategic approach shifted since March? Um, David, if you want to kick us off here, that'd be great. Sure. So marketing at DoorDash is two and a half years old, like just as an idea we're and, and as an organization, it's about two and a half years old. So everything we're doing is relatively new. Um, we're, we're still figuring out things, COVID or not, that we hadn't done before. I think what really happened over the last couple of months was an acceleration of a lot of the things that we may have had on the roadmap but were things that we were going to get to over the next, like, call it 18 months. And now in four months, we've got there. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the, the things that shifted most for us were really more around messaging and driving forward uh, the, the values and vision and mission of the company versus speaking to 
it in marketing terms as you know very functional thing right like up until today most brands were in our space at least like touting the functional benefits of food delivery because in a relatively new category like we had to do a lot of just education with covid with everybody staying home we were able to sort of differentiate on the thing that ultimately mattered most to us which was who are we as a business what do we stand for and how can we put that in front of a consumer audience and we've been able to do that um, and, and using some of the things that we may have not prioritized previously like influencers so where we were doing a lot of mass reach messaging to every single person with you know a mouth and a stomach because essentially that's the audience we're now thinking a little bit more about like when we start to break down our audience into cohorts and 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 bucket them who are the right people to communicate the messages that matter to those audiences and that's where we've started leaning into influencers a little bit more uh, we've also found that like you know everybody has been very generous with their time over the last couple of months so we've had an opportunity to work with some really incredible talent to help us do the thing that we're really focused on right now which is just keeping restaurants open yeah so our whole thing over the last couple of months has been really like less about doordash and more about like let's just get people ordering food mm -hmm. it wasn't very clear at the beginning of this like how people would respond to getting things delivered to their house especially foods, especially things that you're going to put in your body right like it's one thing to get a package it's another thing to in an uncertain time where there's like this general like confusion around like what is this virus and yeah. then have something delivered to your door that you're going to like consume um and that was wreaking havoc on the restaurant industry it still is right like everybody on this this call here this video chat understands um and, and so our job was like how do we just like help support the restaurants and because of that you know a lot of people from i would say like the top tier influencers and celebrities down to like the sort of more niche folks were all willing to just pitch in and really help and that's like something that you know we've definitely like leveraged and are still with and trying to understand how to now take that and like make it a little bit more focused on like what's next for us Absolutely. Tony, how about you? Yeah, I would have to agree with a, a lot of what David said for us that, you know, it was that 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 messaging, right? You know, that that move away from the functional to, you know, just inspiring people to make recipes. You know, people were already at home. They are you know, they're getting fatigued. They, you know, they need recipe inspiration. They, you know, their days are kind of bookmarked now or or you know just kind of separated by mealtime and so for us we really saw this as a point to um, provide consumers with just ways that they can use our product um, you know we recognize that you know because of covid you know a lot of people were um you know maybe they hadn't looked at that can of you know corn in their pantry or they had a can of peaches that you know they they've had in the, the pantry for a month or two and they're like what do i do with this um and so we were we really put our heads together and we're like you know what are the fun recipes that people would love to do like mango slushies or you know like mocktails things that you know just provide that natural excitement um, and really just give people a way to like break up their day with fun, um, fun recipes. Another idea was, you know, people are home with their kids. How do we provide like um, kind of STEM activities? How do we provide those like fun activities or breaks that you can take with your kids? Um, because we realize that, you know, the, our consumers are multifaceted people. They have so much going on. And so, you know, our heart was how do we continue to just provide that inspiration, provide that encouragement, show that we actually care. Um, and then in terms of just kind of things that popped up out of nowhere, you know, we, we did kind of an organic uh, TikTok test because we saw that, you know, people were, you know, talking about one of our products, just, you know, everyone's at home and they discovered they'd love this one product and we're like, you know what, why don't we just kind of, you know, talk to people on TikTok, you know, and it was one of those things where, you know, we just got to see the the organic nature 
of a platform. And, you know, I've, I've been in social for so long. I remember it reminded me so much of Vine when Vine came on it. Everybody was just on it. Um, marketer, you get really excited by that because now yeah. it's less of us talking to a consumer and we're having that two-way dialogue. Like they're already enjoying something that we have provided for them and we can just talk and have this dialogue. So it was like really, really cool um, to just see just the organic nature of just being able to pre provide people, you know, inspiration and to have that yeah. kind of reciprocated. So that's what we've kind of been focused on the past few months. Did that lead you guys to launching your own TikTok channel or are you guys mostly so just sort of interacting there and um, kind of monitoring how people are talking about the brand? Yeah, so it actually led to us uh, launching a TikTok channel for that specific product because okay. it's, it's so uh, geared towards teens. What uh, product that is we were, it's called bubble fruit so if you guys haven't okay. tried it you have to try it uh okay. it's, it's popping boba and it's so fun and exciting and kids kids just flock to it um adults too and so we just realized that on TikTok, people were doing all these videos you know just super excited about it and we're like let's talk to them you know there's this you know so you know we uh you know we had this one cool video with like a really really fun guitar riff you know, we were like, hey, this is kind of TikTok-ish. Like, let's do this and see what happens. And just the response we've gotten. And so I think this period of time has allowed brands, including us, to, to just play and to just really see what is working well with consumers and, and in an organic and, and just really authentic way because everyone's at home. Um, yeah. And, you know, just kind of seeing what content just kind of sticks has been awesome. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Jake, in terms of how you approach your sort of role as the global head of influence for the brand, I mean, how has that changed for you? Are you approaching influencers and partnerships differently? Have you guys sort of uncovered new avenues as a result of the last couple months, few months? Yeah, so we, we haven't. Um, I mean, we're, we're approaching it differently just because we're scaling as a, as a company and we're getting bigger. We're, we have an international launch uh, coming up. Um, another one, which is pretty exciting, but it, I don't, I would not say that COVID has changed the way we, we work with influencers. We've always taken an approach of they, they know best. We get, we empower them to tell our story. We're only working with folks who are genuinely excited about our mission, um, and let them kind of tell the, why, why they are excited about impossible as opposed to us telling them. Uh, why, why I'm excited about Impossible. Um, so I don't think that has really changed. I'm trying to think of any other, um, I mean, I guess, I guess a little bit of content production are, you know, we're, we're, the team is, is producing less uh, just because, because of COVID. So we're relying on, on other, you know, folks at, at their home to, to do a little bit more, but not, not in a meaningful way, no real change. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, in sort of reading your bio and looking at what you guys do there, you know, where you sort of, it looks like you oversee larger partnerships, celebrity interactions, as well as your, uh, maybe your sort of influencer campaigns at scale. Just generally speaking, then I'm just curious, how do you as a brand approach influencers beyond just what you had touched on about, you know, making sure you're working with people who believe in the mission or on authentic fans? How does it sort of fit into your overall marketing funnel and or plan? Yeah, so there, there's kind of three buckets that um, that get the most of my attention. One is, you know, we've we've raised a series of financing rounds, and part of that strategic approach is bringing in strategic investors who are coming in for far less than some of our institutional investors. Um, and unlike other brands, we are not, um, you know, giving equity in exchange for publicity. All of the folks who are coming in and investing in us are coming in on the same terms as everyone else. Um, so the Jay Z's, the Katy Perry's of the world are are giving us money. Um, we are not nice. giving free shares away, um, and that's something that we've had a hard line in the sand, and it has been really, um, really beneficial for us. It, it kind of takes a it, it self selects for folks who are, like I said, really excited about uh, what we're doing and, and want to help us. It's almost a little the analogy is almost like a political campaign, um, and so that's kind of one bucket. Uh, the other bucket is, uh, um, you know, micro macro influencer engagement as you, as you'd expect. And then also a, um, a consumer facing loyalty program. And we kind of see the loyalty program. I, I kind of jokingly say, uh, we have a program for the Jay-Z's of the world. We have the program for macro micro influencers. And then my mom 
uh, in Vermont who might not be on social media, but she's going to the grocery store, she's talking to friends at church, uh, she's influential in her community, and we kind of have a program um, uh, for the yeah, yeah, for, for your uh, what I'll call average consumer, um, but really seeing everyone as an influencer. Every, most people have some sort of social media, some sort of circle of influence, um, and just how we have a, a, a way to you know, empower Jay-Z, we have a way to uh, empower my, my lovely mother, Nancy and Vermont. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, David and Tony, I'd be curious if, how you guys think about influencer marketing as part of your kind of overall strategy as well. It can be in relation to the last few months or just um, how you approach it. Uh, Tony, if you want to start. Sure, I can jump in. So, yeah, I, I think the way, you know, I influencers for us is, you know, an integral part of, you know, just our, our marketing stack, you know, just being able to, you know, leverage a group of people to uh, continue to share that engagement about our products, um, about who we are as a company. Um, about two years ago, we really took a hard look at um, how influencers can help help us on a larger scale. And so for for that immediate piece, it was leveraging influencers as content creators because we recognized, you know, we can make green bean casserole every year, three times a year, post it on our social. But if we have an influencer who has a, you know, a fantastic audience, they are all foodies and they do a slight variation using our canned, you know, French green beans, like the exponential reach of that is phenomenal. So, you know, why don't we work with them? And, and in a way they become brand advocates, you know, and being able to use uh, their content um, across our channels and, you know, even creating a portal on our website, you know, called you know, Friends and Friends of Del Monte, where it's, you know, actually showcasing influencer recipes alongside our branded recipes. Um, it really just prolongs the life. So we, you know, we really think of influencers as going through that entire consumer journey um, and, and really just to work hard for us. So, I mean, that's how we have looked at influencers. I'm so excited for this next upcoming year for us and influencers, because again, it's about building up that relationship, having that common thread. So if you see, you know, using similar influencers throughout the entire year and cross campaigns, we also saw great success with that. So if we have, you know, a mom of two kids who's a photographer, but also an influencer, and she loves, you know, our adult fruit cup snacks. She can talk about adult fruit cup snacks. She can talk about giving her kids like the diced peaches. But then if she's trying to make dinner, she can talk about our content the tomato. So, I mean, there's there's ways to just build those relationships and, and really have that that long lasting relationship with influencers. And we've saw we've seen that work really well for us. Absolutely. Um, I apparently was enjoying the conversation too much and was ignoring the fact that we were supposed to start Q&A. So I'm going to do that and I'll just kick, I'll kick it off with you, David. Um, the, our first question is, how can marketing and technology leaders structure their teams and recruit highly coveted talent for a new era that demands an increasing array of skill sets? Look for diversity. I think like the most important thing we can do as folks in positions to hire is really look for diverse talent and champion it. Um, I think like if you prioritize that, you're going to set yourself up for success, um, like hard stop. Yeah, it's good. I like it. Um, Jake, do you have uh, any additional thoughts on that and how you might approach it? I would just totally agree, and I think uh, one definition of diversity should be diverse. Uh, so I think this, like, you know, uh, there's the obvious ones that come to mind, but then there's also um, just diverse backgrounds, right? I, I don't have a food background. I worked in entertainment before this, um, and I actually started my career at Impossible on the sales team. I had never really sold any sort of food before. Um, and so just, I think, uh, yeah, totally agree with David, and, and just to double click and say that you know there's there's um uh, yeah there's obvious diversity and there's also diverse backgrounds and, and um, skill sets. absolutely um here is something i definitely want to get from all three of you it's it's a question around trends so you know what kind of trends are you guys seeing in technology and social um that you're really paying attention to that you think are going to be essential um for the um you know foreseeable future for the brand whether it's the rest of 2020 or into 2021 Tony, if you want to kick us off. 
Uh, sure. So I think for us, what we're seeing is just uh, uh, shoppability of social content. Um, so for us, it's going to be that that kind of add to cart feature. Um, how do you get consumers from uh, looking at an Instagram post, looking at a Facebook post, going in, building a cart and ultimately buying the product? So, you know, we're constantly looking at ways to make our content shoppable um, and making sure that shoppable experience is as seamless as possible. Um, you know, I think Instagram, um, I, I used to be an avid Instagram shopper because it was so easy you know it's yeah. like oh i like this post oh i'm gonna shop now and in two seconds i have a product um and i think a lot of brands especially in cpg are kind of taking note um and continuing to look at ways to iterate in that that shopability space how do you make your product shoppable um you continue to get the consumer to get lowered you know further down the funnel um so i mm -hmm. think that's the trend that i'm currently watching um, especially in the social space is, you know, that that e-commerce, how do you get people from the post? To Absolutely. David, how about your team? Are you and your team? Yeah, I was just taking notes from what uh, Tony was saying. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, look, we're, we're experimenting with a couple things here. And one is just that it's how are we leveraging editorial content to convert folks? So thinking about yeah. like, how do we tell better stories that are also shoppable stories? Get somebody excited about the origins of pho, and turns out you can also be delivered a carousel of pho that's available in a five mile radius of your house. Yeah. Um, that's something that we see folks being pretty interested in. Um, I think there's like, you know, two parts to that question. One is like the behavioral thing. And then as far as like trends that I see on um, impacting brands, I think like, you know, this is just such a, a an overused word, but I think it still is relevant, which is like people are looking for authenticity and continue to look for authenticity. And now I think probably not more than ever, but it's very prescient is that people are looking for brands who stand for something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jake, Wait, we have Chris coming on. Maybe Jake, if you could highlight a couple quick trends before uh, we get booted. I am very curious as to you know what you're seeing and, and what you're interested in. Yeah, it, again, I don't know if I can foresee the future, but um, I mean, I know I can't. But I, I think the, something that the majority, when we started this year, the vast majority of our customers, when I say customers, not consumers, are people who are buying our product were restaurants. We had very little retail presence, and obviously, restaurants were just as everyone knows, it really hit hard. So we spent the last three months really trying to help in any way we can um, the, the restaurant partners that we currently have. And, and I think eating behavior, eating habits, whether it's through delivery, ghost kitchens, takeout, um, I, think, I think in restaurant dining is going to continue to, to shift and change. And that's something we're watching. I, I, don't, I can't predict what it's going to be. Um, but that's certainly a trend we're watching. And, and, then, we, and then as a result, we really um like i said we launched direct to consumer we also really uh pushed up pulled up our um our retail expansion um because folks are, are obviously um, awesome yeah cool well um thank you guys so much for the conversation i certainly learned a lot and really appreciate you guys um just you know being open and transparent and sharing your knowledge um and have a good rest of your week and hope i get a chance to talk to you again sometime soon Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Cool. Take care, guys. Thank, right. thank you all so much, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Um, well, we just had an all men's panel. I think the only fitting thing to do is have an all women's panel. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, transition us over to um, a session that is going to be led by uh, Tiffany Pettit, who is our director of strategic partnerships at Influential. Um, we are going to be joined by Giovanni or Giovanna Alf, uh, Alfieri, uh, the head of marketing and e-commerce at The Honey Pot. We'll also hear from Madeline Benifla, the, uh, the media director at Ascento. Um, the session, as I said, will be uh, moderated by Tiffany, and I will let her take it over from here. Thank you, Chris. I thought the same thing. I was like, where are my women at? So excited to get started on this. <laughs> Um, super excited to be here again. Um, we are, I'm thrilled to, to chat with you both 
Giovanna and Madeline. Um, quick background in case you're just tuning in. Um, thank you, Brand Innovators, for having us. Background in Influential, we are a social data and conversion company specializing in showcasing the effectiveness of influencer campaigns by tracking attribution. So today, we have the opportunity to talk with two brands um, and companies that I love um, and have had the pleasure of, of talking with over the past couple of weeks. Um, I want to kick it off by giving a quick intro for Giovanna and Madeline about your role and, and what your company is, and then we can dive into some questions. Giovanna, would you like to start? Uh-oh, I think unmute. One second. The lovely mute button. <laughs> Wait, one more time. There we go. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. It's great to see your face, Tiffany. Um, and hi, Madeline. Um, Hello. Um, so yeah, I am the head of e-commerce and marketing at The Honey Pot. The Honey Pot is the first plant-based feminine um, hygiene system on the market. So we do the whole ga gamut of vaginal washes, wipes, um, you know, tampons, pads, you name it, um, and so really hitting a diversity of products um, and use cases. Um, and of course, we're sold in about 36,000 uh, points of distribution, but naturally also have our own di direct-to-consumer website, which um, I am the owner of. So I'm really excited to explore this conversation. And yeah, thanks for having me again. No problem. Awesome. Well, I'm Madeline, I'm Madeline Benafla. I know that's doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, <laughs> I am uh, the media director uh, focusing on, on all things digital at Ascento Advertising. Um, what was a, a legacy uh, Hispanic agency has now morphed uh, to be a, a total market cross, uh, you know, cross uh, uh, target shop, really. I mean, we're really at, at, the, at the intersection of what is happening uh, with um, diversity and uh, ethnic marketing? Uh, we're living in, in a multicultural America, and we're we're servicing our clients to to really um, understand and address um, all of those targets. Awesome, yeah, and I'm excited to talk more about that. I know um, there's just so much to say, and this conversation is like only you know a couple of thirty minutes or so. So. Um, want to make it super snackable and what we have to say, but want to talk about the elephant in the room. So typically, this would be a conversation we have in person in front of a live audience. Um, so uh, just on one end of it, thank you for inviting us into your homes. Um, I know that you know you you might be at your desk right now, um, or you know waking up and kind of like always you know on in any capacity. But I want to talk about some of these changes that you've had to deal with since the pandemic announcement back in March. So this could be from a marketing perspective, thinking about your clients, um, or specifically, I know Giovanna, um, you you know, had to make several changes as a brand. Want to talk through that to, to start us off. Um, Giovanna, would you like to, to go? Yeah, totally. So we were thrust yeah. into a unique, uh, you know, experience naturally as like a human um, collective, but also really as a brand. And so what we were up against were ongoing supply chain challenges. And a lot of those supply chain challenges were by proxy of the fact that many of our manufacturers were asked to produce uh, PPE products. So everything from antiseptic wipes to hand sanitizer, which put us in an ongoing predicament because simultaneously our demand was increasing. Naturally, our customers, you know, with menstrual care and, and vaginal health, those are deemed essentials in a, t in a ton of capacity. So people were purchasing at scale. Additionally, we went viral um, due to some really, you know, kind of nasty um, racist com uh, comments in relation to a Target commercial. And so we had this beautiful organic growth from a community perspective wherein people were really coming to speak and protect us and uphold the value of the brand um, and push back really from our from our manufacturers so an example being something that would normally take us say 30 days to produce is now at 180 to 220 day um timeline so we really don't know how to understand demand in relation to to our customers so really what the pivot has been and it has always been sort of the heartbeat of the honeypot is trying to find that like those peripheral activations naturally we can't do that in the flesh where we can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations where we can get deeply educational and personal and so we've tried to find those levers if you will within the the social ecosystem to start communicating with our customer 
Firstly, of course, nothing out of the ordinary, leading with transparency and saying, this is what we're up against. We're so terribly sorry. The things keep breaking. We can't give you what you want, but here, take these other things that are nuggets of truth about our brand that we hope kind of keep you somewhat sati satiated during this period. And when we come back, we will come back in full force. Um, and it's, it's a challenge it. because you don't want to be jeopardizing or um, you know somehow minimizing loyalty and the fact that that is at the center of a consumer experience. So it's been an interesting pivot. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine everything from, because you're, you're thinking on both ends of it, like as a company, how you you know commit to continue to give your customers what you want, but at the same time, you have to listen to what's going on in the market and, and really try to make those on the fly decisions. So um, definitely want to dive into that in just a second. Um, Madeline, have, is there one specific change that's happened um, since we've been having to work from home? We're in a pandemic. Um, marketing efforts, I'm sure, have changed across your clients. Is there is there one that stands out particularly? Well, I feel like we're all working. <laughs> you know, it, we're constantly connected, um, but we we've had to really step up and and um, and work. You know, very in a, in a very agile environment because of you know the the current situation. We work with uh, healthcare and um, public health clients, uh, utility clients that are, you know, putting out messages that are really important uh, right now for our communities. And so it's, you know, it's been amazing and really rewarding to see how quickly we've been able to adapt to working in a very virtual, but very collaborative manner to, you know, put together plans and strategies and, you know, very quickly go to market to address, you know, what we feel are really important communications to put out um, across all channels, but certainly very quickly on, on social. So that, it, that's been, um, I think, something that we're probably going to take and, and, and continue to apply to our day to day and how quickly we can come together as, as teams. Yeah, and I feel like we're all sharing that same sentiment. Um, you mentioned one thing, social, and I'm thinking about the role that social might have or just listening to or, or seeing all these social trends that are happening, um, you know, across platforms. How have some of those trends been instrumental for, for you at Ascento in, in trying to reach these niche or multicultural markets specifically? Um, and then we can take it to Giovanna and thinking about how that plays a role as well. Yeah. You know, social is is critical period, right? But for multicultural uh, targets who are super users of social across all platforms, you know, it's even more critical for us and, and for our campaigns. Um, you know, these targets are generally younger. They have larger social circles. And, you know, we have to remember that these platforms um, serve as a bridge to family and friends, not only in the U.S., but like from many of us, but also to, you know, outside the U.S. Um, and it also has served as an important, um, you know, it's given them a voice uh, to, uh, you know, a lot of these um, communities um, to, you know, yes, of course, you know, it's it's given them access to information and entertainment and, and but also to groups and communities. And, I mean, we're seeing what has mushroomed out of, you know, a lot of these voices. Um, activism and propelled important conversations and, and started social movements. We're, we're trying to understand these trends and apply the insights to help us craft those social strategies that, you know, defeat consumer fatigue and indifference. We're, we're really trying to pivot on that, on defeating indifference. Um, and I think it, it helps our partner brands matter in culture much more. Um, you know, yes, it increases engagement and, and ultimately it changes behavior. And that's, you know, we're in that business. We talked about the fact that we, you know, during COVID, especially, you know, we're helping all of our clients, but especially those in healthcare and public health se sectors, they're trying to change behavior. So, yeah. you know, making sure that we're very tuned into, you know, those conversation, what is happening, how our, our, our targets are 
behaving in, in, in those conversations that are happening on social are really critical to us to, to pivot and to create content um, that you know, really connects uh, in, in a more meaningful way. Yeah, I'm sure connection is key. I mean, just thinking about um, that specific market and that, you know, vertical of a client, um, it just has to be instrumental. And I feel like it's only going to be um, like a process of getting more awareness out there for yeah. customers and like what we need to do for these audiences nationwide or globally, really, for that matter. Um, Giovanna, how have social trends kind of informed you guys or thinking about maybe even product ideation, all of that? Yeah, most certainly. So I think it actually is a quite a healthy segue because interestingly enough, um, which is almost like the antithesis to marketing in this really weird period is that our customers want to see the transactional posts. They really are interested in seeing the product. Where can I find the product? How quickly can I get my hands on it? Which has been counterintuitive to A, naturally our inventory levels, but B, what you're seeing in a more, a more global sense, right? Globally, we're seeing people, of course, we're still continuing to market our product and have those conversations, but what you're trying to activate is that emotional angle. And it's such a unique position to be in as a marketer where I'm like, oh my gosh, for once they want me to be able to reference my archive of assets that I have on hand, However, I can't actually use those and because I need to be generating content that is essentially acting as a filler, if you will. And so it's it's a very interesting place to be in. And that's not to say that our customer isn't hungry for connection and they aren't hungry for those deeper conversations or how the honeypot can integrate um, from a lifestyle perspective. They just want the product. Um, and so it's been a, it's been a unique challenge. I think, um, you know, the additional layer that you alluded to is product ideation. Well, also given this kind of ongoing hole or lack of product, what we've been able to actually unlock are those crowdsourced conversations in a really meaningful way. How are we underscoring that feedback loop? Like where, what does the customer want from us where we're in this place where we actually are at somewhat of a pause that we can take 10 paces backwards and redefine our product roadmap and our strategy for 2021, which has been very enlightening and empowering in so many ways. So it has allowed for us to start um, truly connect those dots and building a blueprint that is hopefully going to elevate the brand and elevate the um, assortment as well. Yeah, that's interesting that you point that out. Um, a natural segue when I think of social media is I think of the power of influencers, especially in reaching specific markets, whether it's niche markets, niche audiences, or really just looking for someone to kind of speak on behalf of the brand, but from a very organic and authentic perspective. Um, so I kind of want to throw it to uh, Madeline and, and kind of and walk us through how influencers have maybe supported you guys and your efforts and for your clients in reaching these specific multicultural audiences during this time um, and then, you know, moving forward as well. Well, so maybe the question should be, why aren't more diverse creators and influencers uh, being used today in today's multicultural America? Um, so many of the markets that uh, that our clients operate in are already majority minority. Um, this will soon be the case nationally. So, you know, it's interesting. People are not just following influencers um, because of their race or, you know, or, or their cultural you know, profile. Um, I saw a recent study that showed that roughly half of influencers in the age group of 13 to 34 are from another culture. So, you know, it really reflects the fact that this generation's more open culturally. Um, God, I hope. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's it's been really awesome to see the explosion of talent with super diverse um, voices and perspectives and, you know, cultural backgrounds. Um, but we have to choose them. <laughs> we have to support them. So, for us, we make it a priority, and Tiffany knows this well, um, to reflect, you know, the diversity of, of markets we serve in all of our communications. Um, that includes influencer campaigns. At the end of the day, we're, you know, we're really looking for, you know, those connections and, and to use talent that can extend our, our campaign messages in a way that's really authentic. You talked about that and real uh, in that you know, that diversity is, is part of, of the success equation for us because it really reflects our, our target markets. 
Um, and I think it it just it makes that authenticity and in, in that connection even more. Um, you know, it just it, it makes it more real and 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 um, and just I think it's just how we're going to operate moving forward, or at least how it should be more reflective of of our target in our market. Totally, Giovanna. Yeah, so I think our approach to influencer marketing is is pretty dynamic, and there's a few there's a few components of it. I mean, first and foremost, we have this hyper engaged community of consumers that we actually we don't have to do anything and at, and and it, it speaks to Madeline's point about the multicultural dynamic the honeypot is a black owned female owned company and because of that we have this community that is so powerful and so willing to not only stand behind us when things are going awry but also be the the advocates for the brand and so we have we've had this unique fortune of being almost wholly organic which is 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 crazy um, and looking to them as those um, as those pillars for understanding if we were to build out a really comprehensive influencer package, what would it look like in relation? How would how would that community respond to each of those people? So they become the proxies and the identifiers for that. So I think that's one element of it is that we actually don't really, I would say we work on a very micro level and don't necessarily have intentions of scaling it much larger than that. The reason I say that is because we're talking about vaginas and feminine health. This is not a photo with a product. This is not this is not that kind of marketing moment. This is about I have bacterial vaginosis. I went through 7000 experiences with doctors and conversations and this is where I landed or you know I have PCOS or I have fibroids. These are conversations that take not only an influencer who has level has has essentially initiated those conversations in the past, but someone who's able to remove themselves from pushing a product, which has become their business and truly is the bread and butter of what they do, and really is able to create a platform. And so I think we're talking about the evolution of an influencer in a really interesting way now, because now we've got activists, we have these different these different individuals who are rising um, and, and are starting to understand that they're that they don't have to lead with money. They don't have to lead with product to make money. They can lead with their narrative to actually start converting. So I think there's something special about that. Secondly, you know, this is not out of the ordinary for the the you know the building of a brand, but we want the honeypot to be the influencer. And the reason I say that is because we want to be the educators. We want to be owning the conversations so that we can have that touch point with the community that we've worked so diligently on building. And so we want to be the ones who are setting that tone. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting place for a brand to start exploring and start getting a little uncomfortable. Yeah, that's actually, I mean I'm just, I was just going to go, say, go Giovanna, it, that's, that's actually a really <clears throat> great point because it's not always about the, the big numbers, but it's, it's, you know, it's also about vetting the, um, you know, the conversations that are being had with, with that talent and how authentic those are and what they bring to the table. Um, you know, again, with some of our clients, you know, this, you know this um, the strategy, the influencer uh, marketing strategy can be very touchy and very sensitive because, you know, we're looking for authentic voices, but also that that, you know, that have, um, you know, are are leading conversations in many cases. Some of them may be, you know, more uh, sort of media news. Um, uh, you know, sort of thought leaders that that bring a level of of realness and and um and you know a, a voice that's that's not about sales. That's that's more about education and information and and really you know have heart for the communities that that we're talking to. Um, and so they bring a, a different level of authenticity to the table, and and that's okay. It, we're not talking about a million fo followers. We're talking about bringing something different to the table that is, um, you know, just as important for, especially for perception change, for education campaigns. Um, so, 
uh, I, I think there is, you know, there's room for, for those, for that talent as well. Yeah. Both of you bring up really great points in that. Um, certainly, I think when it comes to, especially, I mean, as a company, when we look to influencers, historically, we've really tried to prove out the model or, or you know, sought to and had been successful in proving out the model in order to drive sales. But now we're really in a position to use them um, as an anchor to inform and change those behaviors that you're looking that you that you mentioned before. And so, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a little bit about how um, some of the, given everything that's going on, other than the pandemic, definitely including it, but thinking about the conversations and sensitivities around racial injustice and, and you know, social norms happening here, at least in America, um, how have some of those, how have you guys, I guess, responded as a brand or thinking about your clients or even as an agency, um, what are some things you guys have done in, in response to some of those um, experiences happening right now, or at least being shed light on right now? Well, so, you know, I talked about the importance of social um, and, you know, having said that, we recognize that, you know, ethnic minorities have been the most targeted and negatively impacted by back, bad actors in, on social media. So, you know, we fully support our clients that are participating in the current boycott. Um, they're very concerned. And, you know, we hear it, uh, this has significant impact, um, you know, especially we talked about those that are, that are trying to communicate really important messages right now to, to communities that are, are needing to, to hear information and, you know, where to go and what to do. Um, you know, but it's made us um, really think outside the box and, and try to adjust and, um, you know, we're still on the hook to drive impressions and engagement and actions and sales, right, Giovanna? Um, so, you know, we're we're just getting creative and there are other ways. So I'll say that there are other ways and other um, platforms and um, and we're trying to, you know, present those to, to the clients. I think that it's a challenging time. There's no question about it. Um, you know, but I think it's also brought forward a much needed conversation in an audit of our industry um, mm -hmm. regarding representation and diversity. And, you know, the question for us as an agency and working with brands about the commitment in, in investing uh, to reach the, the, you know, these segments, not token or short term. We're all very familiar with that. Um, Black History Month comes and goes, but a real and in you know committed relationship with with these consumers uh and with these communities and so those are the conversations that we're having and we're happy that we're having them um and if there's anyone any brand out there that needs help in and you know we're here um we're certainly here to help uh, so you know we're we're trying to stay very very close to you know to what's going on, but we're also very supportive of the brands that have taken a stand because we understand. And we hope that this brings, you know, some change that's, you know, that's positive. Um, so that's where, that's yeah. where we stand. I mean, it's great to hear. And I know I, I'm just an advocate of um, what the honeypot has been saying out there and being very vocal about it too. So I'd love to hear your perspective, Giovanna. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a very interesting position to be in as a white woman, um, also to have this um, platform where I get to be sensitive and educate myself whilst going through an experience of a community that loves our brand um, and remains um, extremely passionate about the work that we're doing. So, um, you know, for me, it's been it's been manifold. First and foremost, it's definitely casting a light on what we always do, which is we're humans with vaginas. them happen to be black vaginas and humans like beautiful you know <laughs> that's what we're always going to do that's always going to be who we are um and so you know so my so my mission is just i'm gonna uphold that that is what we are and that's what we'll always do 
Second to that, it's, you know, the education piece that I keep hearkening back to is just ensuring that that's integrated in everything that we do. And um, the next piece is also showing up for other female entrepreneurs who are black and being able to expound upon their, their work and their successes. And also some of the drama and some of the contentious things that have happened over the last um, you know, two months or historically for years upon years. So we want to talk about the fact that, you know, female funded businesses are, are of course, um, under underserved, but also let's talk about the fact that black female entrepreneurs are nearly non-existent when it comes to the VC table. So my job is to be able to have those conversations that are potentially seen as elevated or irrelevant to the brand, but ultimately at the end of the day are at the heart and center of, of of this movement and conversation. And so that's really what the honeypot stance is. Also simultaneously, because we are a wellness brand, we have to, we are always going to democratize access to wellness. That is important to us. Our price points, our partners, you know, yes, Target might be boycotting social or what have you, but I still want my customer to be able to walk into a Target and find the product that they need that can help them with their bacterial vaginosis, et cetera. So this is an interesting dance, Madeline, because for us, we understand the boycott, but we see it as virtue signaling versus the fact that our products should be accessible in a lot of ways to underserved communities, be it the Walmarts of the world or what have you, that again, relatively controversial. Um, so, but the the one angle I will say is that we are, and I, I mentioned this at the top of the conversation, we are bringing in yoga and meditation. We are bringing in these little subtle things that we think empower solidarity, but also help the black community in a time of grief and, and in the overwhelming nature of what's what we're up against. Yeah. Yeah. And, and listen, they are, this is, this is a, a a challenging time and we're trying to to balance it all and help our clients um you know figure out the best solutions for them um and so i i totally hear you i think that it's um you know it's a two-sided coin right and and we're you know we're we are there we're at the center i i um it's not an easy dance by any means um especially for you know certainly for the clients that we that we serve so um you know we'll stay tuned and 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 you know figure out the best solutions as as this moves forward but i i hear you Giovanna. Yeah. it's it's not easy yeah i i hear both of you um and definitely um feel you i guess for lack of a better way to say it i i certainly can you know speak to a lot of um what's going on as a company or even on a personal level but it does bring me to ask about um, kind of how mental health has been, you know, happening for you guys. Are you guys doing okay working from home? How is it working with teams, um, whether it's within your company or outside of it? And, you know, knowing that there's still so much going on outside of these walls, how are you guys establishing some successful ways to communicate and connect with the people you need to interact with on a regular basis? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that the quarantine fatigue situation is quite real. And I know that I think uh, Madeline referred to this at the top of the call as well. But um, th the days just seem so muddled and the availability and, you know, it, it's like the weekends literally in the past used to come and go. And that was like a cute thing to say. And now they they, they do. It's so hard to keep up with. So, um, but, you know, I think that the most effective thing for me um, has been really, has been actually creating those boundaries, much like you would in, you know, a, a former place of work and being able to like have these very um, distinguished times to talk about create like creative endeavors or to talk about, the strategy or be able to have those projections or budget calls or what have you is really being able to like create a safe forum for that. So there's not a level of over exhaustion, but you don't feel like you're constantly running at 600 miles per hour. Um, and so I think that creating those forums and being really clear about like, hey, today I have back to back calls. There's no way I can sit in an ideation like that's probably not gonna um, be happening. So so being very clear about that. And then also, this is such a like banal and pot specific thing to say, but like we literally are telling each other we love each other on a daily basis and that like we're expressing gratitude for each other because 
that has somehow become this source of inspiration and unif like unifying experience because otherwise we're just, we're all sitting in a vacuum. And so somehow that reminder of there's another human on the other end who like loves you, respects you and is honoring you, your work and your time and um, has been a really like valuable experience and, and perhaps even a strange one, but super special. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the, the days are long. Um, they start, they definitely start to, um, it all starts to blur, but uh, yeah, I think as a company, you know, we've done a good job um, in terms of, you know, having regular happy hours and, um, you know, making sure that, I mean, we have regular team, you know, meetings and, you know, sometimes we, literally just start with how is everyone doing like just just that little you know what did you do over the weekend I, I mean it just we're such a social industry that it, and that's how we would typically operate in the office I mean we're you know we're constantly at each other's desks and collaborating and and, and you know brainstorming so to be so isolated is it's definitely different and challenging. So having those moments and those, um, you know, we might institute that. I love you, uh, Giovanna. Steal that. Um, <laughs> it's, I love that. <laughs> it, it, it's like, you know, especially like I live alone. So I'm like, well, it's great to hear someone else loves me. <laughs> uh, no, for sure. So yeah, no, the, those 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 little moments I think are have become really precious and, and important. Yeah. So um, I, yeah, carve that hour for lunch. We're, we're trying to, to be really yeah. good at taking the the summer Fridays and the you know lunch hours and all of those things and just put it on the calendar. You know? Yeah, yeah. I I agree with you guys. I mean, I think it's you open your eyes in bed and I'm like telling myself, do not look at my. And phone. what day Don't is it? it. <laughs> <laughs> What's, What's today? I'm saying happy Friday. I'm saying happy Friday in emails and everyone's like, is it Friday? Like, does that mean anything anymore? Um, so yeah, to your point, just like connectedness is, is huge. Um, and, and our audience actually sent through a question that I want to get to um, and asking about how your leadership style might have changed over the past few months and, and how have those relationships become more personal with their colleagues? Um, so thinking about leadership style, has it changed? How has it changed? Um, and how have you been able to get more personal with your colleagues? I, I love I, you, we know that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've always defined my leadership style as partnership um, because I don't, I like, I am very candid and understanding that I've had my own growth trajectory and own experiences and that I don't have all of the answers. So let's like figure this out together. And that to me is almost an ultimate, like almost the, like realist definition of partnership. And so I think that I've been able to still engage that in a really meaningful way and kind of hop on the call and just be like, what's going on? How are you? How can I help? Also, what am I doing? How can I better this, et cetera? So I think that that's been fluid. I will say, and I'm sure Madeline, and you can agree with this, Tiffany, is like the creative element that you get, it, the creative element of that just like energy in a room or even like, you know, the the kind of like gossiping about experiences past or what have you, just like the general nature of being yeah. in someone's presence has been so, so deteriorated and hard to really evoke in a virtual space for me. Um, I find myself like kind of uh, having to pull away and be really isolated in order to um, actually collect, like to, to create um, more of a creative point of view um, and then go back to the table and present it, which is very different from the past where you're just riffing and, and kind of feeling that energy. So I would say the collaborative piece has been really hard and I think has influenced my, perhaps even negatively my leadership style because I'm kind of, it's become more of like assignments versus um, a, an experience, I suppose. So it's more about delegation than, than experience and that's challenging for me. And so I think I'm personally trying to find out what those mechanisms are to ensure that that feels fluid and healthy and that, you know, we're all kind of getting the best ideas in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I talked about it. It's, it's certainly, you know, kind of goes against the grain for us because of just how, you know, what you talked about, just how we operate. And, and I, I also um, 
you know, I, I tend to be very collaborative and I want, I want to hear, you know, different perspectives. That's, that's my style. So, um, you know, we certainly can have those conversations over calls, uh, you know, with everyone, but I, I think the spontaneity and the, and just the fluidity of some of that, you know, those brainstorms have been lost a little bit for sure. Uh, so that's yeah. been challenging to, you know, to inspire and, and get, you know, folks, um, you know, that, that same level of energy on a call, it's just, it doesn't feel the same, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> and yeah. sometimes I'm... people don't even want to be seen because like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I hear you. Oh, it's different. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely a work in progress. I'm like, yeah. there has to be an app or a Chrome plugin soon. That's like, you know, reading emotions via Zoom or I don't know, Cisco WebEx. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how that works out. Um, there's another question from the audience about um, still thinking about your internal structures. It's really the question is how can marketing and technology leaders structure their teams to recruit highly coveted talent for a new era that demands an increasing array of skill sets. So I'm sure you're thinking of people who are really skilled technically, but then also, um, I mean, I'll let you kind of uh, lead with that um, or answer in, in the way that you're thinking. How have you guys thought about recruiting new talent? Uh, gosh, we just hired someone in the team and, um, you know, it definitely felt uh, different, you know, to go through this whole process virtually <laughs> and not having that chemical, you know, that, that chemistry, I mean, you can have that chemistry check, but certainly is, um, we just talked about why it's so different. Um, you know, but it, it just, it brings to light this new reality that you, you know, we have to focus on skill set. We have to focus on, you know, what they bring to the table. It just kind of like hyper focuses you on that and, you know, having a real discussion around experience. Uh, so I'm, I don't know how I feel about it. I, you know, I think there could be a good side to this um, because chemistry is important, especially, you know, face to face, but, um, you know, it is focusing the conversation on, on maybe stuff that matters too. Yeah. I think that we're looking at it from just like really being really being cognizant of like the the unicorns in the room and like we're we have a chance to since we're still growing and still building teams right now marketing is a two woman department um and so um you know i think we're we're willing to not take the specialists and really open up to the generalists who have diverse backgrounds and life experiences um because i think that you know, I, I'm certainly not cursing us, but I think this is, you know, this is the beginning of something that could happen in various capacities in our future. And we want people that are incredibly adaptable um, and incredibly real and understand life um, and are able to bring that to the honeypot and bring that to our growth. So I think we're just looking for, for humans with diverse experiences and um, who are, yeah, not specialists. I love that. Yeah. Same. Um, and I do want to, I'm, I think we're getting kicked off, but I want, I have one more question that I think could be um, just really helpful that for our audience to kind of hear from you. What's one thing either personally or, or professionally that you guys are looking forward to, to maybe end this on a more positive note? I know this was a heavy conversation and can only get heavier, but want to think about some of the positive things you might be looking forward to personally, maybe a vacation, <laughs> I say it, or yeah. even professionally, maybe there's some new projects you're working on. Um, let us know. Yeah, I think professionally, I'm just really excited to meet the Honeypot consumer. So I actually started with the Honeypot during COVID, um, which is crazy. Well, actually pre-COVID, but you know, what what, what have you, it's my personal transition. So like, I just wanna meet our customers. I wanna be able to throw events. I want that like exchange. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, like personally, I just wanna be able to be spontaneous again. Like I'm just so, I am so sick of having to be calculated about everything. And it's not even an anxiousness, it's just practical at this point, you know? And I'm like, dude, I just wanna like get in my car and not like just drive to a friend's house and knock on their door and be like, what's up? You wanna go for a, like, you know, like, do you wanna do things? <laughs> just go. So that's it. Yeah. I wanna go away, <laughs> yes. period. I, I would like to get away. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Great answer. <laughs> Great answer. I'll take it. Uh, I agree with both of you guys. Um, you know, I had to make reservations. Uh, we won't get into it. We'll talk offline off this. But thank you guys for joining <laughs> thank us you. today. Thank you. This was super helpful. I know that um, there's so much that we can say about both of you guys as just, you know, being great leaders at your company. So I appreciate you guys letting us in your house and then um, really taking the time to answer some of these questions. We super appreciate it. And obviously, thank you, Brand Innovators, for even having us. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for having me. Have a good one. Thank Bye. you guys thank so you. much. Thank you, Giovanna. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Tiffany. Really appreciate Bye, it. That was a great session. Bye, guys. Take care. All right. So we're going to bring in the next session. Uh, this is one I'm really excited about. Um, it's a intersection of entertainment, media, and sports. Um, and it is going to be moderated by uh, my coworker and good friend, Cody. Uh, Cody is Rari. Um, uh, let's see, he is the EVP of Strategic Partnerships for Influential, um, and we are going to be bringing on Jordan Brown, the Content Marketing Director of UFC, and Matthew, David, uh, Matthew Davis, actually we've been having this David problem all week, sorry Matthew, Matthew Davis, VP and Head of Creative for Warner Media. They tried to get me one more time, they're not going to get me this time though. How you, how you guys all doing? Good morning, CD. Good morning. Good afternoon. You, uh, How's it going? You all clean over there at the office? You staying away from yes. people? Exactly. And I like it. You, you did the sign just like me. Yeah, there we sharp. go. Uh, there very, you are. very sharp. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll turn it over to you guys. Uh, I'm looking forward yeah, to hearing you. This. Matthew, Jordan, it's good to connect with you again. Uh, Jordan, good morning in Nevada. And Matthew, good morning. Or good afternoon in New York. Um, it's good to be reconnected with you, and thank you to Brand Innovators uh, for welcoming all of us on today. Um, apologies in advance uh, for my Lin-Manuel Miranda X, Hamilton X2 haircut. It's been a few months, um, but excited to be speaking with you and uh, excited to have a reason to, to put a button shirt on again. Um, so let's kick it off uh, with something that I'm super excited about today. Um, I'm a, a huge Yankees fan. I've uh, been watching you know, way too much Bundesliga and, you know, way too much Premier League. But sports is back officially. Uh, Jordan, it never left with you. Uh, Matthew, you're welcoming it, uh, you know, to the Warner Media fold. And, and uh, you know, just want to congratulate you. Uh, I saw uh, the uh, CEO, John Stanky, said the HBO Max launch was flawless. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But sports is back. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, kind of start off there, uh, you know, if you want to, uh, Matthew, talk about, you know, welcoming back the NBA. Um, it's something unlike we've ever seen. Um, I know, obviously, uh, Turner's got uh, baseball coming up as well. And then, Jordan, uh, we're, we're, we're fighting in Abu Dhabi. We've got, uh, we're sending the Octagon overseas, um, you know, that you're seeing numbers that you've never seen before. So want to kick it off one of my, one of my passions and uh, turn it over to you guys. Great. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say with the, um, the NBA coming back online is really kind of a moment for, um, for everyone. Um, and I might find myself actually down there in Orlando for a little bit, um, provided I can, I can stay safe um, getting in and out of there. Um, but we, when I was at Nike, we had a period of time, there was this uh, kind of strategic conjecture that we called a world without sports. And it was this dystopic imagination of how thin everything would be if we didn't have sports and how few like all these relationships and communities and fans and the way that we talk about things and mark the time particularly for big sports fans and like um it was funny we only had to wait a little while for that reality particularly like um people online i remember the league broadcasting virtual horse it was just like that watching watching people shoot a horse was like good enough for a period of time people so desperately wanted to connect to the game um but it's it's exciting to see um certainly the nba come back and it was a big one for me uh and for our business um and it just connects to so many different things it's not just the game it's the conversation it's culture it's player fandom it's um it's a lot Yeah, I'll say with yeah. at least in our world, the combat sports never really stops for us. I mean, um, we understand that there was a starvation for live sports content. We were there to fill that void, honestly. I, and I, I can't say I can't take my hat off or commend the team enough on what we were able to accomplish. Uh, short staffed with the amount of travel and work that went into putting on live events, but 
we've essentially never stopped. I mean, we, we started things in Florida. Uh, we were able to find a facility there. Um, we went through extreme precautionary measures to ensure that both the athletes and the staff working the events were safe. Um, and luckily, being here in Vegas, we have the added benefit of right next to the headquarters, we have what's called the UFC Apex. And it's essentially a brand new state of the art facility where we have the opportunity, opportunity to put on all sorts of live events. So we recently had a pay-per-view event there. We've had multiple fight nights. We plan on holding more events there later in the year. Um, but I think in terms of all other professional sports being inactive, it was a massive opportunity for UFC to step in and fill that void. And working on UFC Fight Pass, UFC's OTT service, um, we had a lot of other added benefits content-wise, which I'll get into a bit later. But in terms of just an awareness marketing point, um, or just an overall microphone, we couldn't have asked for a better opportunity, a better partner in ESPN, um, or a better execution from the standpoint of viewership, from employees being involved, to athletes wanting to be involved, to just great fights. I mean, the world of combat sports has really taken a step in the, in the proper direction. Um, and we've we never really left, but we, we truly established ourselves, especially UFC Fight Pass, as a true authority in combat sports. Um, it's been a great opportunity to be a part of this ride. And quite honestly, we're just getting started. There's still so much more to go. Well, and, 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 and thank you. Thank you guys for that. Um, I would love to know about where that Matt and Matthew you spoke to a little bit, where that moment of pivot was, where is a, Hey guys, this is not happening as we saw it. Um, you know, 250, 251, Jordan, we're going to have to figure it out. Uh, Matthew, we're not even going to know Orlando's I know Orlando is going to be a possibility. What was that like internally um, as you guys kind of, you know, shifted gears entirely from what was Q2, Q3, um, you know, in your guys' plans and mindset? Yeah, early on, I'd say um, I feel like our different industries, whether it was television and film production and some of our distribution plans, it was live sports, um, uh, news production, all kinds of things where um, I think our industry and its participants are a lot just uh, like everyone else uh, with COVID. Um, so I think there was a, for a while, a kind of persistent optimism mixed with some cognitive dissonance, like because it was so disastrous to imagine, uh, you know, like sports being so broadly canceled for so long um, was uh, unfathomable to so many. I think it took some folks longer than others to really realize what we we're facing and what we we're up against. Um, and I think that's just not not unlike um, uh, all of us as individuals really um, kind of clinging to um, the familiar and waiting for the world to look like it used to a year ago or however long ago. Um, but uh, I, th I think that there has been um, a really, I think, thoughtful and hopeful and human reaction to things. I think the improved conversation about team and player safety is super important. Um, I think there's a necessary sort of recasting and a refocus for, um, I think, all of media on what we can do for fans. Um, I'd always pointed out that um, well before there was a coronavirus, um, the best experience might be to be in the stadium. Um, if fewer people are watching the full game stream on, you know, Turner Sports or other, otherwise on a Wednesday or Thursday night, um, what's the best experience? Uh, it's pretty much being in the stadium, but that's already not everyone's privilege. Um, so what can we do for like the most loyal fans, not the fans with, you know, the most wealth and access, but what we can, what can we do for the diehard fans who can't even be in the nosebleeds? Uh, and I think all that's happened with, um, COVID is it's put us uh, a very particular attention on our collective imagination for what we can do, uh, for, um, for fans. Um, who maybe for a long time still won't be uh, comfortable being, you know, crowded into a line or crowded into a concessions line at a stadium. Um, so it's just a, I don't know, it's a fine time for us to to hit reset and and find some new answers there. Yeah, and then, and and I'll, uh, Joan, I'll uh, let you have this last point. But you know, one thing that sports does, and one thing that we need now globally, nationally more than ever, is to bring people together from all walks of life. And Matthew, to your point, uh, Jordan, have you seen uh, an uptick in audiences um, that you never would have expected, or were there some surprises in who's been tuning in uh, to either ESPN, ESPN Plus, Fight Pass, or any UFC content um, that you never would have imagined? Yeah, I mean, we've absolutely seen an uptick in viewership, and I think that's just testament to a few factors, but 
Um, I mean, overall, it was a lot of right place, right time. I mean, it, at least for the UFC Fight Pass, we made a few different shifts to fill the void of content, especially for combat sports fans. Um, and we created a global focus. We created a way for people to consume content specific to athletes that resonate within their region, which helped us immensely. Uh, we launched a, a series of original programs. Uh, we truly made it an OTT service that wasn't focused on live sports since live sports weren't the focus at the morning at the moment. Um, and that allowed us a, a twofold approach that when the UFC live events came back and some of our other live event partners, uh, some of these other combat sports leagues that are around the world came back and started holding live events. Um, I think that really boosted the value of a subscription for UFC Fight Pass especially, but also elevated the brand presence and just um, overall feeling towards UFC in general. So I think we had a great opportunity to elevate the brand and we executed that greatly. And to Matthew's point also, so filling, filling the void of, of what people were missing when they're not able to attend in arena, our team, the content marketing department works largely with residential viewing. So if it, it couldn't have been a better perfect storm of events. I mean, it's a tragic event, what's going on with COVID-19, but in terms of us being able to craft the message and to bring fans in to recognize combat sports for the powerhouse that it is to people who would not have otherwise been exposed to the brand, we saw a massive boost in viewership. And not only that, a very positive reception to people who it was their first or second time watching events who have only familiarized themselves with some of the stars that have transcended sport and been in you know, the entertainment segments like movie shows, late night, uh, all of those things, but actually being able to see them compete and helping them understand what the sport is at its core, um, helping them see some of the respect that goes into it, understanding that you know these are the top athletes in the world and seeing how much they give to the sport and just kind of the overall feeling of the, the we have a show called The Thrill and Agony. So it's the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat and being able to resonate with that after seeing an event, I think truly brings it full circle. Um, I think that we've been able to generate some fans for a lifetime uh, in this short period of time. And again, I can't stress enough, but I, I still feel like, you know, we always say we're just getting started. We're 25 years in as UFC, uh, some less for UFC Fight Pass, but there, there's still so much more unlocked potential. I, I agree, and that, that's a perfect uh, segue, and I'll, I'll put a pin in away from sports, uh, even though I don't, I don't know if you can sense my excitement, but, um, but you, you, you hit it perfectly with, um, and both of you, with the timing um, of, of the releases of HBO Max, of the new show on, uh, on Fight Pass, um, but in a crowded space, in a space where everyone's at home, everyone has nothing but time. Uh, what do you see as, you know, people continue to cord cut and, you know, sign up for ESPN plus, sign up for Fight Pass, sign up for Max. Um, what do you think is key? Is it, is it that content? Is it the timing of it all? Um, is it talent, celebrities, influencers? What do you think drives people to sign up for a trial, to keep people there? Um, and, you know, what, what, is your, what is your means of standing out in a crowded place where, you know, we had the peacocks of the world, the quibbies of the world um, at the same time and, uh, you know, uh, to, to different levels of success uh, in terms of signing up and maintaining that. Um, and I, either of you, please take it away. That's a fantastic question. I mean, at the end of the day, content is still king. Don't ever get it twisted. That will never change. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about the type of content and the audience that you're going after with that content. And I think that that will hold true for many years to come. Um, in our case, we created a complimentary experience to go along with ESPN Plus. We were looking at um, kind of complimentary content that would go along with live events. We weren't so live events focused as a platform. And I think the evolution of what we've done with UFC Fight Pass in the past 12 months has really shown through not only in the data in, in terms of viewership and subscriber acquisition, but also just general sentiment with the platform. I mean, we've we've made a series of improvements from the user interface to creating new content and different types of content uh, focused beyond live events or something that's just so sports heavy and specific, being able to dig deep into the more linear storytelling type of pieces that really focus on the background of athletes, their home lives, um, the blood, sweat and tears that they've put into their career, some of their backgrounds. I mean, some of the stories of these athletes are, are incredible. Um, and I, I definitely encourage everybody to keep an eye on, you know, some up and coming stars who have faced adversity, who, you know, we truly believe in, we have a task force here that continuously looks into stories that we can continue to tell through the lens of UFC Fight Pass. Um, 
And within that, you know, certain mediums, uh, I, I really, in the past, we've been so performance driven for UFC Fight Pass. And this year and the opportunity of having captive viewers at home has given us the opportunity to do a bit more awareness marketing, to be able to do a bit more storytelling and brand structuring around presenting what UFC Fight Pass is as a whole in terms of it being a premier global combat sports focused OTT, but being able to go a layer deeper and saying, you're not just going to get live sports. You're also going to understand the human element of what fighting is. So Dana has a famous quote that fighting is in our DNA at its core. Everybody understands what a fight is. If a fight breaks out, you know, you turn your head and you watch and, and he's famously used that quote over and over again. Um, with us, it's more, taking advantage of that true statement that fighting is in our DNA, that that fighting is something that you want to see that's captivating, that has emotion, but also going deeper into the understanding of why are people pursuing this sport? What does it mean to them? How much can you accomplish, um, you know, globally? How does this resonate with different groups? And also bringing in sort of an Olympic style of fan resonation to it where it's, you know, this this is truly a global sport. And basically we have gyms around the world of people who want to be the next Conor McGregor, who want to be the next Ronda Rousey, who want to be the next Israel Adesanya. Uh, and the list continues to go deeper. So it's taking that conversation and continuing to expand it in as many ways as possible. Cool. And, and Matthew, same, uh, same on your side of things at, at Warner Media. Um, well, it's been, it's an interesting time, uh, the last year. And since, at least since I've joined Warner media, the HBO max launch, uh, I think came in kind of a, a timely moment. Certainly we have, um, this idea of a captive audience. Um, however, uh, I think it just as, just as, uh, the question around sports was interesting when we look at our entertainment business and our scripted television and film business, um, to imagine that we have people at home um desperate to stream content and desperate for quality content and this sort of captive audience that we describe um at the same time there's a certain kind of uh, loneliness about uh watching a great series all by yourself uh if you do it all at once uh for 10 hours or if it takes you a week or however you you know choose to to consume content um and then just maybe talk about it later with your friends or recount it have you seen this have you seen this um, isn't really the same um, as the, it doesn't really connect us um, to one another and connect us to the stories uh, the same way as um, what might be, what might feel a little anachronistic if you look at um, a Friday night premiere or like going on Sunday with your family and watching a movie or, you know, all these ways in which we uh, consume content um, that uh, kind of connect us to each other and to the sort of greater zeitgeist. Um, is still interesting to me. So just because one might be inclined to never change your pajamas and, you know, watch uh, TV for 12 hours, I think um, it behooves us to start to imagine ways of um, making that more open, more social, um, more intuitive, more fun, uh, where we could spend a little less time scrolling through menus, you know, cascading menus and navigations with just tiles of content and trying to find something new to watch. Um, I just feel like this is, um, uh, this time, although in general is a fine time to imagine, uh, how we might, um, revisit some of those paradigms, uh, and some of those patterns. Um, of course it would be our design to create the broadest audiences and the best audiences and dedicated fans for the kind of content that we create. Um, but it's, uh, it'd be fun if you think about, um, entertainment and media in the context of our greater lives if we're um together or apart um i just feel like there's a great opportunity to innovate there yeah and then and then thank you both uh incredibly insightful and, and and matthew to pick up uh on something that you mentioned in terms of of wellness and isolation and this um you know i'm i'm, I'm lucky to have a fiance that i you know i uh, live with work from home with we should have a shared space but uh, to your point it's completely isolating for people that don't uh and so you know i i, I saw in the news last week um i i, I was formerly at wme representing mahershala lee i uh, worked with idris elba and, and and matthew hbo max announced the calm partnership um so mental well mental health and and, and well-being um you know just w w want to talk about like it what is the what is that point to overconsumption? what's that point to how do we maintain we're 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 entertained we're you know we're working all day uh, and that hamster wheel 
and you know we had this this time for how, how do you delineate what is what is too much what is what is binging you know way too much when is it time to to you know to put it down and uh and maybe take content in some other way yeah the um i thought the column partnership uh, was an interesting idea just in the way that um looking at um sleep and looking at meditation and looking at um wellness through a broader lens when i was at nike i think nike's uh partnership was with headspace looking at um health and wellness beyond just sports and beyond fitness and beyond training um really thinking about um I, I suppose for everyone, the definition of uh, health and wellness is um, is changing, I think, and moving in, in positive directions. Um, I think uh, I'm specifically interested in slow TV, um, which is sort of that famously Norwegian phenomenon of uh, the entire country tuning in to watch the Yule log burn. Um, I spend a lot of time. Salmon swimming. I spend a lot of time. And, and... <laughs> my, my nerdiest consumption is watching durational trains um, on YouTube for hours and hours, going through mountains and <laughs> Montenegro and 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 uh, in uh, Scandinavia. Um, I think there's Love if it. we um, I think there's a place for content that we want to sit down and we want everyone to be quiet and pay attention. Um, it's how you might consume something like Watchmen or Chernobyl, where you really want to be in a more theatrical setting. You want focus. I don't want anyone talking. I don't want to get up and get snacks. I want to be there and be immersed. And there's another way in which I think um, media, whether it's just streaming content or increasingly immersive content and transmedia, um, to be more um, to fit different parts of ourselves and into different parts of our lifestyle. Um, so what is, uh, comp what is complementary if you have a big flat screen on your wall, what's complementary to other behaviors or what's complementary to watching things together, uh, or with a family. Um, I think, um, it's a fun, it's a fun exploration. Thank you, Matthew. Jordan. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, I mean, overall, I, I still agree with the sentiment. I mean, the one thing that I think that we've realized truly this year is using the fans as an untapped source of direction for whatever marketing campaign that you're going to have in market. Um, in the case of UFC Fight Pass, it is truly an OTT service created by fans for fans. So the team that we have working on this service day in and day out, not only are they incredibly good at they, what they do, I mean, we have a, a very passionate base of combat sports fans in this building with an incredible knowledge of past events, um, upcoming stars, and we have an, a, a, an uncanny ability to highlight that in the things that we're doing, whether it's creating a new piece of content service towards a specific audience, whether it's uh, bringing in a brand new fan who wouldn't necessarily know anything about combat sports, UFC, UFC Fight Pass, um, or anything in that nature, or just realizing that there is a certain vertical that we think uh, an audience group that we're going after in the case of potentially 18 to 24 would identify with, resonate towards, and then uh, become a long lasting recurring fan for us. So there are multiple angles that we take to approach going after new audiences and making sure that that not only translates into viewership, but also fandom, whether that starts with the pathway of consuming a free to air event through our broadcast partner ESPN, through um, consuming an event on UFC Fight Pass internationally or purchasing a pay-per-view event, um, especially one that's what we would call a hardcore fan event. You know, there, there are multiple layers to how we attract a fan or a viewer but once we get them within the ufc ecosystem we make entirely sure that we use as many of our owned assets as possible to message what the true benefits of being a ufc fight fan are um and things coming down the pipeline that we think would resonate with an audience at any particular time so that message that we have is ever evolving and we do that with a combination of linear presence organic presence via our social channels or our youtube and then also paid, uh, which the content marketing team handles primarily. Uh, uh, that, that was a uh, perfect transition. I was just going to actually bring that up. I wanted to just quickly touch upon how you both use um, your content through social, uh, influencers, celebrities on social. Um, how do you get the message out? What are your you know, platforms that you like to utilize? Um, 
uh, uh, obviously, TikTok uh, is not a controversial thing right now, but you know we'll see with what uh, what our government does on a day-to-day -day basis. But how are you leaning into these new platforms, um, and how are you uh, getting these new audiences, Jordan? Uh, obviously, you segmented them, but what what are your different strategies on the different platforms um, to get uh, to uh, viewers to tune in and subscribe? Sure. Yeah. As I mentioned before, we're very heavily focused on performance marketing, so baseline paid media tactics will almost always involves some degree of paid social programmatic display and video retargeting and also paid search. Um, within that, this year has given us an opportunity to do a lot more awareness marketing and approach things like television campaigns, whether linear or connected TV. Um, we've done some native advertising in way of editorial or advertorials. Um, we've done a bit of out of home um, and we look at a little bit more unique opportunities also. I mean, um, for the instance of UFC 252, we're going to be creating uh, sort of like a paid social game, if you will. So it's a gamification system that involves using our athletes to tell the story, uh, not only their background, but also using that to, in a repetitive way, make sure that there is some sort of awareness towards the upcoming event. And all that feeds back into the other channels that we're using within UFC. Um, sure. what, whatever we do, though, we try to take a unique outside of the box approach. Uh, especially when we're going after new audience types. I mean, it's at the end of the day, what we want to do is create new fans. We operate in a currency of eyeballs. So the more people that are exposed to what we're doing and that we can invoke a reaction out of, the better our process is. Um, it used to be in a relation of basically a return, one to one return on what is that ad dollar spend that's going to equate to a subscription or a conversion um, or anything of the sort. But We've expanded that in the past couple of years with the help of ESPN and ESPN Plus and also the growth of UFC Fight Pass to then become how do we generate interest within a fan and then keep them coming back so that we can do some sort of data collection and make sure that they're up to date on current events. Um, it's, it's, it's a multifaceted approach, but I think we've, uh, we're a team of three here, the content marketing team, but we work very, very closely with all other departments. Um, and I think everybody here has a, a keen understanding of the goal. And the goal is ultimately to create fans, to continue to expose the UFC brand globally, um, and to elevate the value proposition of what you get when consuming a UFC event, no matter where you are. Yeah, I tend to, um, I tend to blush uh, before uh, talking at too great a length about um, advertising and marketing broadly across all things AT&T and Warner Media because it's such a... Uh, it's enormous <laughs> and it's something of a juggernaut. Um, I would say um, that uh, it's been interesting thinking about uh, beyond just advertising and marketing, uh, fan engagement in um, a broader sense. Uh, for instance, around um, the fall of uh, 2019 and prior to coronavirus, I had the great pleasure of being in Los Angeles for Adult Swim Fest. We piled in 100,000 people and had a great party and it's a way of like, connecting to fans directly and more importantly, creating an environment where they can connect to each other and have a great time. Today is Adult Swim uh, Fest basically held virtually. Um, and I think it's almost virtual fan events uh, and these experiences where we can create community and let fans interact with talent, let fans interact with creators and build community amongst themselves is super important uh, and difficult to get right. Uh, difficult to create something that doesn't feel like a lonely Zoom call um, difficult to build something that feels uh, authentic. Um, what's interesting, even looking at uh, Adult Swim Fest today, I think starts tonight at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, um, is it's free. Um, and there's a like um, a virtual cosplay competition and there's all kinds of like, there's probably a lot better access to the creators of Rick and Morty and to the creators of all these great properties uh, for fans in this environment than we can provide in a stadium setting. Um, I think uh, we're really interested in uh, finding ways to uh, make the people who connect to all of these universes, imagine it's Harry Potter and it's Game of Thrones and it's Rick and Morty and Westworld and all these dynamic kind of multiverses that are within our bigger content umbrella and brand umbrella. Um, and there are people who want to feel like they're in that universe or they empathize with someone who really is in that universe. Um, it's a it's difficult to find ways to connect to fans and connect fans to each other in a way that's persistent and deeply engaging and authentic to those communities. 
um, but it's a lot of fun trying. Um, and so even the through some of these virtual premieres, DC uh, uh, Comics, DC Fandom is coming up uh, next month. Um, it's super exciting seeing the creators' involvement and the creatives, marketing teams, and collective strategic organizations sink into these kinds of efforts and come up with some stuff that's bold and new. There's a way in which um, you don't want to do the same thing twice. Um, you might try to out, outdo yourself. Um, so there's a, um, it's interesting watching a new medium kind of form um, out of uh, a mix of um, creative desire and necessity. Sure, and, and I think, uh, you know, uh, both of your guys' companies, parent companies, uh, you know, uh, hold that flag of doing something different and always on the cutting edge and always trying to do something new. Um, I know we're running a little bit out of time, but uh, uh, I, I was super curious um, as to, you know, we're still in lockdown out here in Los Angeles. Um, probably for the foreseeable future. Um, Matthew, I know you've returned to the office uh, in New York, Jordan uh, to the state of the art gym in Nevada. Um, what has what has been the transition from going into work from home, collaborating as such, getting that Zoom fatigue, trying to you know get uh, have some semblance of normalcy, um, still thinking creatively, still thinking collaboratively, and then the transition back into Okay, this is a slow walk back into uh, the office space. Um, we're learning how to work together and be around each other again. What, what's that been like? And I know that, um, you know, there, there may be uh, only a handful of people in each of your offices, but, um, you know, it, it excited to hear uh, that you guys can do that because um, I know that we can. So um, what's, what's mm -hmm. that been like for both of you? My circumstances are a little unusual. If you take um, Warner Media's headquarters in Hudson Yards, um, uh, that's many, many thousands of people uh, in um, a hundred story skyscraper in Hudson Yards. And it's uh, specifically impractical to bring back any great majority of our workforce uh, for now. Uh, and you'll find that uh, e exempting a narrow cast of uh, people who really need to be in physical space, like I think about the production teams, at CNN and other assets, we have a largely remote workforce and it's uh, we've had a, a really elegantly handled both with AT&T and Warner Media a group of people helping us figure out solutions and collaborate together and and it's been um, uh, a labor of love um, and uh, uh, I separately uh, we began building the Warner Media Innovation Lab uh, which is a new facility um, on the High Line in West Chelsea um, it's about a 22,000 square foot kind of innovation space uh, and at this point wow. we um, we're allowing a handful of folks access to the space. Uh, we've also, the, the space was designed as a virtual collaboration space. So there's a model of the lab that exists in physical space there on the High Line. And we've uh, basically built the lab over again in game engines and with virtual controls and virtual eventing capabilities, volumetric capture capabilities. So we have a space that's designed to be a sort of physical to digital or virtual collaboration space, which makes me uh, very lucky both uh, that we have um, space to solve problems uh, in small numbers and safely, um, and uh, that we've had such a long dedication to the like innovation and in how we work and in virtual collaboration has been sort of like a, a big part of what we've been investing in uh, before and, and since uh, coronavirus. Yeah, I'll say the community layout here in Vegas is just slightly different than what it is in New York. We're just a little bit more spread out. <laughs> Um, but in, in terms of returning back to the office, um, the schedule for UFC has been demanding. And I, and I say that in the most fulfilling and positive way possible. Um, like I said, we were there to fill the void of, of missing live sports. And a lot of the team has to travel to events. It's, it's a very serious operation to put on any sort of live event, UFC especially. And a lot of those that occupy the office here in Vegas are typically on the road, especially for extended periods of time when we're doing you know, multiple weeks of shows in a place like Florida or in the current case, Abu Dhabi. So a good amount of the team is, is currently over there, making sure the operations run smoothly. Um, obviously us being on the residential side, we, we typically reside here in, in Vegas. We don't really have to travel much, uh, but adjusting from working from home to coming back into office was a bit of a challenge in the way that it was a time where UFC Fight Pass was rapidly developing. So right at the onset of COVID actually, we had an enormous strategy planned around this massive launch event for these original series that I was discussing earlier. Um, and we had numerous touch points planned from March all the way through July. And so we had to pivot 
multiple times to make sure that there was no impact loss from what we were planning to do, but to still ensure that we were reaching goals that we had set in terms of exposure and response to these shows. Um, and again, I, I, I want, I'd love to speak volumes to the team, but everybody basically came together and there was a lot of strategic communication while we were in office, while we were working from home, and now that we're back, just to ensure that every team is on the same page as to what's happening in terms of communication, B2B, B2C, the assets that are available, all the different communication touch points on an organic and a paid side that we're going after, uh, just to make sure that we, one, maximize the conversation of what's happening, and two, reach the optimal amount of people and therefore bring in the optimal amount of subs and conversions. So uh, within that, I mean, Vegas is a bit of a hot spot for COVID again, so we're, we're feeling out how this is going to continue moving forward. But in terms of strategy and, and, and teams working together and being able to still keep everyone in the loop, UFC is a place where conversations develop very rapidly. Case in point, yesterday we had a main event change for an event in two weeks, which you know, that conversation spread like wildfire. It took about 10 minutes for everyone to know, but it's because we it's by virtue of us being here in office, everybody having a centralized location. Um, but we, we have a series of tools that we use just to make sure that we're able to constantly be updated with one another, whether that's through you know group text, text email chains, um, team calls, where we go through a series of updates by group. Um, and you know, overall, it's, it's over communication at the end of the day. I don't want to oversimplify it, but I think that the vested interest that every different team has in seeing events succeed or business verticals succeed um, really shows the amount of effort we want to put into making things thrive. And so that directly feeds into that over communication, ensuring that things happen in a timely fashion, understanding that some goals are beyond certain teams and everybody's ultimately willing to pitch in to make a positive difference within the company. So working from home wasn't too much of a stress. Um, I don't want to have to do it again. I know that everybody enjoys their time and action. That loneliness that you touched on a, a bit earlier was absolutely key. Uh, but at the same time, the silver lining is a lot of people got time to spend time with their families. Granted, work from home is a little bit of a different beast because your work life balance tends to mess. Doesn't up. exist. But you know, overall, um, there was a lot of positive sentiment I've had with my colleagues here and just being able to be around, seeing kids, spouses um anybody else from day to day so that's, that's uh, com man. completely agree and i'm excited sometime soon when uh we're all able to you know share a glass of wine break bread and not have to worry about who's ever wearing a mask around you or what you touched last um but again that'll hopefully come soon um so thank you guys for both uh both of those points um we were, we're down to the uh the the questions from the from the participants and i've got one um that just came up. Um, so many brands have drastically reduced media budgets over the past few months. How is your media plan adjusted? Um, if your budget's been reduced, have you gotten more creative and efficient with your strategies? Um, if not, what has been uh, a, a focus uh, instead? I was going to let Jordan take that one, but I'd say um, uh, <laughs> I, I'd say again that's that for me is. Um, uh, maybe not in, entirely out of my orbit, but I think it's interesting that if you're, um, if you look at, um, CNN where people are just glued to CNN right now and, um, and its numbers are outstanding at the same time, uh, people aren't buying cars, uh, people aren't going on vacations, uh, people aren't, uh, um, spending in the same way. I think there's a collective kind of, uh, economic, um, sort of, uh, and potentially dire sort of economic uh, uh, sort of miasma around all things COVID, um, which just changes, I think, the media marketplace uh, quite a lot. Um, and so uh, it's interesting being a media business and having um, such spectacular audiences and such uh, high engagement uh, in a world where until at least recently so much retail has been on pause and so many of the industries that uh, create so much of the spending at the top of the line are um, in the situation they're in. So it's just, um, it's uh, certainly dynamic. I think it would be impossible for me or really anyone else to kind of characterize um, what, um, what AT&T and Water Media have done broadly on this space. Uh, but it's an interesting exercise figuring out um, uh, where you want to uh, gain attention, where the most value, 
value is being created for ad markets. I'll bring it back to college real quick and go back to the four P's of marketing in terms of position and placement. Um, that's been our biggest shift and seeing opportunities as to where people are flocking to consume content and making sure that we are in the forefront, uh, making sure that we have a visible spot to ensure that we're capturing as broad an audience as possible and then having a strategic set in place to then retarget those folks and to further the message that we've gone out with initially. Um, the beauty of marketing is being able to personalize a message towards a specific audience that you're going after. And this has a lot of this, the opportunity to try a lot of different things um, and to be able to see what works and what doesn't. I mean, we, I'm sure Matthew, you know a lot about AB testing within your world. Um, we are basically going through the gamut of the alphabet at this point. We want to truly diversify our message, whether that's between languages, creative marketing messages, um, lengths and durations, just all types of different iterations to see exactly what's working. And it's an opportunity for us to widen the funnel drastically and then fine tune to see how we attract a mass amount of fans in a short amount of time to let them know one that UFC Fight Pass has arrived, but also we are giving an opportunity for the fans and new fans, especially to inform us on what they would like to see more of. And I think that that comes through and not only our marketing messages, but also just the infusion of value we've put into the service in the past six months, even before the pandemic. This was part of the plan. There were some adjustments made, but um, I think we were able to adapt pretty well. Well, I, I can say that uh, you adapt super well, and 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 as a recent subscriber to both, uh, it's it, it's mission accomplished. Um, so uh, so thank you for that. And you know, I, this 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 last question, I think we touched upon with regards to uh, influencers and celebrities earlier. Um, so uh, uh, Tiffany on the last panel brought it back uh, to on a personal level. Um, and obviously, we're so focused on on our work on a day to day, on survival on a day to day. But what's one thing that you guys are looking forward to this year on a personal level, um, whether it be a, a trip somewhere or, you know, a vacation away from work for a little bit? Um, please, I would, I would love to hear how, uh, you know, how you guys would are, are looking forward to, to the second half of this year um, in, a di in a dynamic on a, on a changing day to day basis. I'll, uh, I'll provide an anecdote. I'm, I live in Manhattan and uh, we took our uh, shelter in place pretty seriously. And um, uh, we've been uh, just kind of cooped up in here for many months. And uh, we went for a walk uh, the other night not to go. They have outdoor dining in New York and we went for a walk not to go and sit on a crowded terrace. But we basically just walked like dressed up and walked around to have the experience of going out and just kept to ourselves, brought our to go drinks. And it was nice just to see like a bit of the human energy that's in New York every summer out there and maybe in a different shape and maybe with less density and maybe it's a little different because it looked like New Orleans with everyone drinking in the streets. Um, but I'm just glad to see little parts of um, human life uh, coming back and people seeing each other and hearing people laughing and uh, seeing people smile and kind of um, return to life in whatever way it's uh, safest and most allowable is, um, is a great place to start. I'm just really excited to visit family, honestly. I have family all over the place. Um, the summer is the bulk of our travel. We'll go to New York, Virginia, Maryland, Bermuda specifically. Um, that and and selfishly, I, I love going to concerts. I was supposed to go see this guy called Brent Fies and The Weeknd next month. And like, I'm somewhat devastated that I can't uh. see a concert. They've been postponed to 2021, but I'm, I'm really excited to see the entertainment life get back to where it was. I know that I'm not the only one who enjoys being out, um, experiencing a live show, a concert, a movie, what have you, but um, there's just a sort of carefree freedom that went along with that that's disappeared in a bit. And I know that everyone misses that and it, it's difficult to be without that currently, uh, but it's also great to see everyone working together to ensure that we get back there as quickly as possible. So that'll be the first thing that I do more than likely. I, I, I listen to any genre, so whoever's coming through Vegas, I'm probably going to do back to back to back to back weekends of a show. We'll see. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you out there for sure. Yeah. Um, we got one last one last question from uh, from our viewers. Um, how has your personal uh, your personal media consumption changed uh, since the start of COVID? Um, are there anything? Is there anything that uh, you never saw yourself watching in a million years that you've been sitting down and got through the entire series? 
uh, anything that you've been meaning to catch up on, um, please. Um, I noted that uh, when I was commuting, including when I lived on the West Coast, I found myself listening to like countless hours of podcasts and on uh, one and a half speed oftentimes. And I became this like podcast super consumer. And now I'm around the house and I just don't feel like I have the audience for it at ear for it when I'm, when I'm in here and the, my family's around. And, and like, um, I think uh, I've had to, um, the availability of like a, my PS4 and, you know, all of my streaming options is prob and like being cooped up here has probably been the only time where I've had to think about setting more like better personal guidelines about the amount of time I spend in front of screens. So I've had to kind of improve my discipline of putting my devices down and closing MacBooks and turning phones upside down and turning screens off to have like, you know, it's normally not an issue because our lives aren't uh, lived in such um, uh, small spaces. But I think, um, I don't know, I'm uh, trying, to, trying to find a little balance, um, I suppose, has probably been the biggest change for me. Amen. That's a really important point you made, being able to put the devices down to disconnect for a bit and decompress and be present in the moment. Um, I think it's massively important that people just kind of take a moment to just be in the moment and figure out what's what um, without the presence of social media, without being worried about whatever's going on. But personally, so I, I love James Bond movies and I've watched about 20 of the 24 <laughs> throughout quarantine so far. I'm really excited about the next upcoming one and binge watching shows. So anything from Mad Men to Fresh Prince. So thanks to HBO Max for, for that one. Um, Entourage, just revisiting some of the old programs that I really love. I've, I've taken a lot of time to just kind of consume as much streaming content as possible. Not only to figure out the competitive landscape of what we're going up against in terms of other apps that have streaming content, but just to kind of enjoy stories from the past and to disconnect a bit, to, to be a bit more creative and to help develop unique stories and to see, you know, what's possible and put a little bit of creative imagination into things. I think that's a, that's been a massive benefit of quarantine. Well, I'm, I'm excited. We went a whole, uh, you know, 30, 40 minute panel without mentioning Tiger King. So mission accomplished yeah. and uh, <laughs> gentlemen, it was an absolute pleasure. Jordan, I'll see you in Vegas soon, Matthew in New York and uh, Chris, I'll let you take it away. Thank, Thank you so guys. much. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Matthew. You guys were awesome. Uh, I want to actually uh, recognize uh, Cody and congratulate him. Uh, he is newly engaged, so uh, give it up for for Cody. Um, actually, want to thank you for that. Question. Absolutely, want to flip the question to you. So, what are you looking forward to when you get out of here? Oh man, I mean, Jordan, I was looking forward to Coachella. Obviously, that's not happening. I had a, a wedding that was going to happen in November. Now that's not happening till next November. Um, I, 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 similarly, Jordan, I'm, I'm excited to see my family. Uh, I miss my friends and family from across the country. Uh, Matthew, I'm excited to, to sit in a crowded room and, and have people be too close to me when I'm trying to drink or spill on me and, you know, all those things that we took for granted and people stepping on your shoes and scuffing up your nights. Um, those are, those are times that I'm looking forward to, to again soon. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Absolutely. Simple pleasures. I feel the same way. Well, thanks again, guys. Uh, so we're going to do uh, another flip of all guys to all ladies. Uh, before we do that, I want to remind everybody that it's not too late to get people to tune in. Uh, if you're watching right now and you like the content you're seeing and you want to share it with some friends, uh, please pass along the link and have them join us live. Uh, we have at least, let's see, uh, three or four more panels to go today. So the fun is not stopping by any means. Uh, so the next session I'd like to talk about uh, is actually a uh, female marketing session uh, with all agency folks uh, led by our amazing chief operating officer, uh, Adrian Lehens. Um, and we will be featuring uh, Denisha Lomax, the VP and group director at Digitas USA, uh, Ali Wassum, the director of social strategy at Digitas USA, and Justine Reeder, the director of content at Kara. Uh, take it away, Adrian. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Awesome, yeah. great, 
Great. So my name is Adrian Lahens. I'm the COO at Influential. If you're just tuning in, Influential is a data and insights platform that powers influencer activations, optimized at delivering measurable return on ad spend, both online and offline. I'll kick it off by introducing our incredible panelists, who I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk to today. Uh, Justine Reeder is the Director of Content at CARA. She manages media-led content and entertainment initiatives that bring brands to the forefront of consumers' attention. Throughout her career, she's walked, worked with clients such as Microsoft, Pfizer, Intel, General Motors, Ford, and many more. So she has a great breadth of experience across a variety of different accounts and verticals. Uh, next up, we have Denisha Lomax, who is the VP Group Director of National Paid Social at Digitas, where she oversees a practice of paid social experts who create scalable, holistic strategy and end-to-end -end activations for the agency and its clients. Denisha has worked across a wide spectrum of accounts uh, throughout her career, including Gap, Wells Fargo, eBay, many more. She's currently focused on one of her key account stars. And Denisha, like all of us on this panel, are is very passionate about multicultural inclusion, uh, but specifically she holds leadership roles for these initiatives across Publicis. So I will definitely let her tell us more about that in just a minute. Um, and finally, we have Ali Wassam, who is the Vice President and Group Director at Digitas. She leads social strategy, uh, where she oversees direction for major Fortune 500 brands. Currently, she's very focused on the Bank of America account, and she has over 12 years of experience in social strategy and paid. She's built vibrant teams that manage uh, multi-million dollar influencer campaigns, paid social budgets, brand safety practices, and forward-thinking leadership in the space. So. On this panel, we will be covering a variety of topics, but primarily focused on social strategies and influencer marketing. So, Denisha, let me start with you. Multicultural inclusion has always been extremely important. Um, and of course, there's a much brighter light shining on social justice movements today. We are seeing uh, you know, so much greater levels of awareness around not only the importance of inclusion for the purpose of consumers and also and the benefits of, of the audiences, but really also the econo economic benefits of diversity and inclusion for brands and businesses as well. So can you tell us about the initiatives that you're leading across Publicis and the impact that they've had? Yes, uh, thank you, Adrian. Um, as you mentioned, um, multicultural has kind of been very important as of late, but it, it's always been important to have very unique perspectives, diverse um, people at the table, making sure that the work that we are doing for our clients look like the consumers and the people that we are trying to reach. So we are very um, focused on making sure that the people behind the scenes um, look like the consumer. So you mentioned kind of work on stars um, and it's it's been very um, impactful to see the level of expertise we've been able to bring from a black um, kind of Latinx, queer, et cetera, perspective that we are bringing to the marketing that we're doing. So again, we're, we're always encouraging our clients to kind of have those upfront and open conversations and bring in the level of expertise if it is missing. That's great. And Justine, in your role in media-led content, how are you thinking about integrating inclusion, not only in front of, but also behind the camera as well, Denisha? I love that you brought that up because of course, you know, oftentimes we think about, you know, who is in front of the camera and if you can see it, you could be it and the importance of that from an audience perspective, but the decision makers, right, who are behind the camera as well, who are making, you know, a lot of those calls. Um, Justine, how are, how are you doing that within the agency? Yeah, we have um, a lot of clients and even from an agency perspective, diversity and inclusion is of the utmost importance and it's something that has been important and will continue to be during this time um, and moving forward. But we do require um, diversity in front of and behind the camera with all of our partners. And that is just um, a mandate that we manage up front. And it's something that we take a look at throughout the process and it's in our agreements and we get um, final say on who those producers are and what the team looks like. Um, and, you know, it, it's just something that we 
find to be very important and we want to continue to prioritize on behalf of our clients. And I think as we look in entertainment, even the talent in front of the camera is being way more vocal about what they've seen with working with different brands and even on um, different shoots and with different entertainment properties. So it's just something that's going to continue to have to be a conversation and we can't shy away from it. That's awesome. Ali, um, Bank of America, the Bank of America business, of course, um, you know, Bank of America is a company that is really always focused on multicultural initiatives. But can you tell us about how Bank has um, thought about multicultural inclusion in their marketing efforts? Oh, Ali, I think you might be on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Sorry, guys. Uh, awesome. They really have been at the forefront of in inclusion for such a long time. And I think what we have, particularly with our influencer efforts, but also in marketing, too, is focused not just on the ethnicities of the people but, that we're working with, but their voices and the different perspectives. And that's really, like, the biggest thing that we, we have been working with them on for, for many years because it, it's not just having people there because you need to have them there because that's who you're talking to, but it's having them there because they make the creative better and they make the story better and they make everything much more real. Um, and I think that's sort of what Bank of America um, has kind of lived in breathe, and breathed, and we're so happy that they, they love that too. But Digitalk as a whole, and I'm sure Denisha can, can say this too, it's, it's, it's something that we, it's inherent in what we're trying to work with all of our brands to talk about. And I think, you know, as we look into advertising in general, like advertising has some work to do, right? Like we, we all across the board, we have some work to do in terms of making sure that we're representative of not just the people, but the voices. Yeah, that, yeah. that makes sense. And so if I could quickly just add in, um, I, I thank you again for Adrian for introducing us, but um, with, with the privilege that I actually held, I just wanted to say my pronouns are she, her, hers. So again, as we are having these conversations amongst ourselves and, and in, in rooms and more broadly, um, outwardly um, spoken, we also have to make sure we're, we're holding the, the right space as well. So I just wanted to come back and add that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I include my pronouns in my in my signature. And, um, you know, someone brought up to me, like, I, I think it's obvious that you're a woman. And I said, it's not really about me, though, right? It's, it's about me. Um, it's about all of us for for anyone who maybe it isn't obvious or um, maybe there's there's they there's a different perception, right? It's about including everyone else. So thank you so much for bringing that up. I think that there's still a lot more awareness to be done, um, especially for the trans community as well. Awesome. Um, Great. So, I, you know, one of the many things we have many things in common, all four of us, but perhaps one of the most obvious thing is that we all strongly believe in the power of influencers. So one of the reasons I personally am so passionate about influencers and our industry more broadly is really this point that we're talking about around multiculturalism uh, and inclusiveness and social media has completely democratized media and content. There's so many more voices uh, that are able to be elevated and the nuances of everyone's day to day is able to be shared. So. Um, can you can you guys all kind of tell me a little bit about what your perspective is in terms of what is the biggest misconception of influencers today? Um, how do you work to educate the brands that you are, you know, consulting, advising, and how have things changed this year, if anything? Yeah, I'm sure we're all like, how do we dive in? Um, I, I, for me, the biggest tenant that I say over and over again is you don't use influencers, you work with them. Um, they're, it's not about reach, it's about connection and emotion. And the more and more that brands can think about them as partners and as extensions of a brand versus an, a means to an end, a means to an impression, the better. I think that sometimes um, it's easy to just slap influencer marketing in as a way to get a message in front of someone, and really that's not the way to use influencers. It's really working with them um, and honing it, bringing something to their audiences, helping them bring something to their audiences that they couldn't have done by themselves, that the brand is like a really inherent piece of it. 
I think um, authenticity is extremely important when we talk about influencers and some challenge is giving up that creative control of the brand and really handing it over to the influencer to uh, make sure that it's authentic to their voice, their platform, their audience in the same way you would partner with a media partner. Um, it, you know, you don't want it to feel like you're interrupting something. You really want to be part of the experience and build that brand advocacy. Um, one thing that I've found very um, interesting during this COVID environment is celebrities and sports um, athletes becoming more of influencers and you know, in their downtime, really looking for ways to connect with their fans through social media in ways that they haven't before and really humanizing themselves as more than just an athlete. And I think that allows for um, a lot of brands to take advantage of that at this time. And then I would just add, I, I love what y'all have said already, um, but again, um, authenticity is, is super important. But again, looking at it from a relationship perspective, um, because again, everything we do is, is people first. We are people, we are humans. So we wanna make sure that um, we, again, are bringing uh, voices to the front that may not have had that um, opportunity for representation, but really thinking about what are the connection points that an influencer can bring that a brand cannot. Um, so making sure we're thinking about it from that perspective as well. Um, and then putting the pay ahead on really quickly, um, just knowing that that goes just so much further when it comes to moving brand metrics, um, whether it be sales, whether it be favorability, um, that trust factor is just so important when we do think about it from that people first, top, that relationship first type of perspective. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think a lot of folks really think about influencers as a native strategy, right? But there's 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 so much more that you can do with influencers when you also in, include paid media. So how do you think about um, incorporating paid media and how do you think about sort of targeting effectively when it comes to um, influencer content specifically? I just talked I'll about let you that one. Go ahead. You okay, okay. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's spread the love. Um, you know, really going back to who am I trying to reach? Um, and have I already been talking to them? Um, and if I have, what are the gaps in that relationship that I may need to to increase, right? Um, so thinking about it from a, a kind of prospecting new audience perspective, but also thinking about it, okay, how do I keep the, the current audience that I do have engaged? Because this is a new way of speaking and thinking about things. So I think there's a two-pronged approach you can take um, from an audience perspective as well. Yeah, it's your paid dollars are just gonna go so much further when you put them behind influencer efforts because those are the ones that are getting the most engagement anyway, right? And so you know that there's an active engaged space that you're gonna get without that paid, but you can extend it and you can show how cool um, this, this relationship is between the brand and the, um, and the influencer with paid, it's almost like putting fuel on a fire. Um, you're getting so much more out of your out of your money when you're doing it with an authentic voice with someone who people already trust. I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just add like we also think about influencers sort of as a proxy, like their their audience as a proxy to the the target audience. So we'll we'll identify, um, you know influencers based on on the audience demographics the psychographic the contextual piece um, and then we'll build audiences that have sort of like you know from a paid perspective that look like you know the the influencers audience so it's just a matter of it doesn't really matter if they're following them already they, they we know that that influencer creates content that is going to resonate with that target audience um, so we find that that, um, you know, the, the performance is really, really strong uh, when you are able to amplify um, with those similar sort of lookalikes. Yeah, you, you, people forget that these influencers run in groups, like they're all connected. And it's funny because, you know, we've seen TikTok houses over this past group, uh, over this past summer kind of grow, but I love them. I have someone on my team who's like mapping all the relationships in between them all. But they're like, if you look at the graphs of them, right? Like, and you use, if you're working with just one influencer, 
you can actually get so much more out of their extended network by doing just what you're talking about. Because these people are all friends and maybe you don't follow them all yet, but you can and you will one day. Um, so it's one thing to think about. Let's talk about TikTok. So how have you guys, been, have you guys been enjoying, I've been enjoying TikTok personally. I, it's like a dark hole for me where I get sucked into it and I'm just like watching millions and millions and millions of minutes of content. Um, how are you guys, are you guys enjoying it personally? Are you, how are you thinking about incorporating TikTok into, into the larger strategy? How are you kind of uh, advising your your clients on that end as well? Of course, it's a platform that's new and it's you know it's typically thought of as very Gen Z, which it is, but it's also aging up. Um, a lot of Gen Z's parents are on there now. So, how are you guys thinking about it? I love TikTok for my personal use. I mean, in in COVID, that is probably how my consumption has changed the most. Like when I need a brain break at the end of the day and just want to like feel happiness, I go to TikTok and I just get like totally sucked in. Um, I think from a brand perspective, just based on the clients that I work on, it's still kind of considered the wild, wild west. Um, and we're still working through like, when does it make sense? You definitely don't want to do it just to be there. Um, you want to make it as meaningful as possible and you want to make make sure it makes sense to the audience and who you're trying to reach. So we haven't implemented anything yet, um, but I still think like the conversations ongoing and we're trying to figure out when and where it makes the most sense. Wow. Ali, did you? Uh, did you I, I know you love, I know you love TikTok. So I'm like, <laughs> jump in there, girl. <laughs> you guys, I, TikTok gives me so much hope for the world and it, it's different. Like my personal love for it and then the brand safety realities of it are two mm -hmm. different things. Um, I, I love how consumption of it has gone up. I love how you're seeing Gen Z be both fun, but also activists on this platform. It is so powerful how it has been used in ways that I don't think even TikTok imagined when it first started. Um, and then from an advertiser perspective, obviously there is there's a lot looming with um, the the, in, the ban from India, and I know Trump has been very vocal about um, the data um, privacy with its ties with ByteDance in China. But I think what we have seen is that TikTok is doing a lot on their end to make sure that it is safe for brands. And as we think about its role in the marketing mix. It's one of those channels that really does get people engaged. It's a UGC first channel. And so if what you're trying to do is get people involved in something or to participate in something, like TikTok is the place really to go because it's the easiest barrier to entry to creating something. Whereas sharing is maybe a little bit not as, as big as it is on Twitter or Facebook or some of the other platforms. So it's you really use it for what it's worth, which is getting people to do something and participate alongside of you and obviously have fun. And and the only thing that I would add um, from, from the paid perspective is, as again, still kind of getting their feet wet, um, you know, self-serve just kind of rolled out recently more broadly. Um, but I think we generally are seeing um, that engagement and that efficiency. Love that everything is, is kind of video first. Um, in that you know the interest targeting is, is more like group related versus like the the super in-depth leads of, of where we have gone with some of the other platforms but but i am interested to, to see where they net out what happens um but it's it's great to see that you can be an engager a creator a consumer of of all of their things so that that is nice to see Right, Ali, can you, did you, I have to bring this up. Did you create a, a viral uh, TikTok? Okay, what? I, I, wouldn't call, I wouldn't call it viral, but I do have almost 100,000 views of a video, but it's really of my parents because they saved these little owls. And I used that one song on TikTok um, that's so sentimental and just makes you start crying before you even see what's happening. Um, and it did really well, which was awesome. <laughs> But um, that's my only claim to fame so far. It's, it's in the name <laughs> of market research, right? Exactly. <laughs> so has anyone else created any viral TikToks yet? I'm a lurker. Yeah, 
same. I'm just really making sure what my daughter is, enga is engaging with on the platform. <laughs> So that's yes. my mama hat on right now. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. What what is your daughter like on TikTok? I mean, she loves to dance. So all, all of the the dancing videos, the songs, um, all of it. I mean, she's into it. So maybe you'll make a little cameo in one of her videos. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> That's great. So um, as it relates to influencers, how are you guys um, thinking about new marketing tactics? Is there anything that you've tried this year um, that, um, you know, maybe even as a result of, of COVID um, that has pr proven successful? Um, you know, any any tactics on that and that you can share with the with the audience? I just want to do a quick plug for for a show that we actually just kind of launched on on behalf of our our client. So, um, P Valley, please check it out. Um, it definitely is is run by um, created by a black um, playwright and showrunner. Um, and so we've just seen time and time again the importance of kind of black Twitter influencers, um, whether it be through direct media partnerships like Innocence, and then kind of having those social extensions or using whitelisting, kind of branded content, et cetera, to make sure the media is actually representative of the influencers that are um, kind of producing the work. And um, it trended organically uh, the first episode, when the first episode dropped, when it premiered, and continuing to see high buzz. So just making sure that, again, you're tapping into the right audience and letting them use their voice and their expertise and, and their connection with um, their fans and followers to, to grow that experience. Yeah, we're we're talking a lot this year about like the days of the of these polished, glossy influencer campaigns are are kind of few and far between. Now it's more like what people are expecting is is nitty gritty, is real, and um, so we're advising a lot more on on the self awareness of an influencer, him or herself, what they're talking about, and knowing like what's going on in the world versus. Um, Sometimes, you know, those travel pictures you you imagine of like the original influencer like on a waterfall or something like that is not is not where I think we're gonna be for the end of 2020 and beginning of 2021. Um, we're also working with a lot of clients to um, instead of creating these big influencer campaigns with one or two huge celebrities, really looking at those handheld influencers, micro influencers, whatever you wanna call them. Um, and using them more regularly. And so you're working honestly with like a group or a pool of influencers consistently over time um, versus bringing people in and out. And that way you're always tapping into their very perspective. You're actually working with them to form the ideas, to um, form whatever campaign you're, you're developing and have them be kind of a thread throughout your brand versus um, just kind of something you slapped on at the end. From an entertainment perspective, um, just a little bit more broadly, you know, we've had to shift a lot in the way that we approach partnerships, given that typically, you know, fall is huge for the premieres. Well, those probably won't come out until Q1. And so if sports doesn't come back, what does the later half of this year look like for surrounding content that your fan, your audience is already consuming and bringing that brand to the forefront? So um, we've taken kind of a different approach in identifying spaces and IP that we want to be a part of. And if that is in linear, how does that translate into social and digital? And how can we still maybe leverage the IP and the storylines that may not be on air, but we know has a rabid fan base that wants more? And how can we serve that to them in a way that um, maybe isn't as high quality as we're used to producing, but at this point, I don't think consumers are really looking for that. They just want to be entertained and they want to have more content. Um, and then taking, you know, relevant talent or influencers and really being able to extend that into the right audiences to make sure that we're reaching who we want to reach. Yeah, and on the on the highly produced side too, I think like one of the reasons why influencers is so effective is because it's it's a mode of content and it's very um, empathetic, right? So like the fact that it's more like underproduced potentially is like 
it, it helps to connect with the audience better because it feels like you're there. It feels like your friend. Um, so have you thought about also like doing any sort of casting from a linear perspective from, uh, you know, social influencers? Have you kind of thought through that at all? Not for any of my clients at this point, um, and only because uh, we would typically, you know, maybe from a sports perspective, bringing in sports influencers that can partner or provide valuable content in real with a celebrity, um, but nothing at that point to this point. But that's a really interesting idea. And and even further, I think something that I've found interesting with influencers during COVID is they've really taken the initiative to humanize themselves a bit more and be more vulnerable with their audiences, um, which I think is a whole different way for them to even connect. Um, they're not afraid to talk about, you know, what's going on and the hardships, and it's much less about painting this beautiful picture of what their life is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're entrepreneurs too, right? So it's important to remember that. It's like we've reached a whole nother level of realness, right? And and reality. Um, this has just been kind of brought on by the pandemic and what we're facing um, with the societal crisis. Is we have to be real and raw, and people will sniff you out and, and call you out if you're not. Um, so I think there's that element too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's definitely been a number of influencers who, you know, kind of dating back to like the original influencers, right? Like that very aspirational um, versus it, like there's a difference right between aspirational and inspirational. And in the beginning, influencers was all about aspirational and really separating themselves kind of from their audience. And now it's like the, the inspirational, like everyday influencer has always been around, but it hasn't really been thought about as like, you know, a cro like it hasn't been like the common way people think about influencers. And I don't know if you guys saw, but there was like an article that came out, a really big, you know, um, kind of salacious article in Vanity Fair, all about how like the death of, in you know, the death of influencer marketing um, earlier, you know, at the start of the pandemic in large part because, you know, it, you know, they were, they were covering like the, uh, you know, the, the, socialist uh, you know type influencers that are uh you know had a, a few issues when they were you know showcasing their lives in the hamptons and uh how they were able to get covid tests in like you know the the blink of an eye and um you know it, it's not the death of influencer marketing at all it's in fact you know just a re kind of reswitching of kind of the the lens right of how do we elevate, uh, you know, voices that, you know, people are connecting with and they're going about like many influencers are influencers in large part because they've gone through hardship and they've overcome those hardships and they've built their followings because other people are going through similar issues and, and can relate to them and are, are learning from them. A yeah, lot of I really, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Nope. You're good. I was just saying, you really have to credit the media world right now and all the culture beats that have popped up um, with New York Times has Kayla Lorenz, like Wall Street Journal Atlantic. They all have reporters who are doing such a great job of bringing not only like the influencers who are doing a great job, but like the influence her influencer that influenced the influencer, right? Like the Rena, the original um, woman who did the Renegade um, dance, like 14 years old, like you know, they're going in and they're finding like the actual people who have started these things and, and holding the whole influencer um, community accountable for being real and showing and understanding the responsibility that they have in, in their voices. And I think um, it's been so great to see like with the Black Lives Movement too, how so many of those influencers have stood up and, and been such an inspiration. And I do think like it's them plus um, some of this, the media industry that's making that that happen. That's making influencers understand their responsibility, um, honestly, to the world and to the people who are following them. And to that point, I mean, I think there's a, a big shift in how brands work with influencers and, ha and how influencers are working with brands um, in, the, in the way that now influencers ha have are empowered more to say, I don't want to represent that brand. I'm not comfortable representing that brand. And instead of a brand just going to an influencer and saying, we're going to pay you this much to do X, Y, and Z, 
they're even learning their voice from a business perspective and standing up and really holding brands accountable for what they're willing to partner on. Um, and to the point about the death of the influencer, I think, you know, I've seen the exact opposite because a ton of my clients when when COVID hit, who's the most nimble, like who can create content on their own, who has the ability to produce their own content, shoot their own content, like they're creators at heart. And, um, you know, I think just respecting them and understanding that they have the ability to turn around the kind of content that the brand's in need of when digital and linear partners maybe can't be as flexible as quickly. We have definitely experienced that at Influential. We've had a number of clients coming to us saying, can we have influencers create our commercials for broadcast at this point? And we've had a number of influencers turn around really incredible. You know, you can absolutely find the influencer, like a lot of it, you know, content that's catered to social, of course, is, you know, uh, less polished, but that's, you know, uh, in many ways by design, but you can find the influencer who has like the entire setup and the green screens and everything, you know, all the camera, the red cameras and all the, you know, fancy things to be able to do things, you know, at that sort of polished level. So we've definitely found on our end a lot of success uh, leveraging influencers during this time for, you know, not only across social, but across uh, broadcast and, and other uh, distribution uh, channels as well. And to that sourcing part, right, that's so important because I feel like the, the categories have just kind of increased in terms of how the influencers are categorizing themselves, what their specialties are. And so where um, Ali mentioned, like the, the, the micro influencer, there are so many pockets of creators, influencers now that we can tap into that we haven't hadn't thought about before. So just again, creating and opening up that business model a little bit more to have them stand up and say, no, I know so and so is getting X amount, you know, you need to pay me X. Yeah, absolutely. Ali, in terms of, you know, Bank Bank of America, for example, or any other brand really that maybe caters a bit to, a, you know, maybe to an older uh, demographic, how have you sort of thought about integrating influencers on that end? Has that been um, a challenge as it relates to reaching, um, you know, potentially older demographics? Yeah, it's funny you say that because I think there's always this misconception that only young people follow influencers. And the reality is if you're on social media, you're following an influencer, you know, you're, you're probably like following millions of influencers without even knowing it. Um, and I think what's, what's awesome about um, platforms like Influential is that you're able to go in and really find, um, you can look at the follower demographics, you can find people who with AI and all that like in user interest, so there's such a myriad of ways to find the right influencer who has the right the right demographic makeup of followers. But I think that's one of the things is that we sort of had to impress upon all of our brands is that no matter what product it is you're talking about, there's a way to, to tap into influencers. And sometimes you're gonna need those more household names. You, you might need someone who has a show, a, a show on linear television um, that can lend uh, a little bit more of like a well-known um, I to your campaign, but and sometimes you don't, and and that's because you're working with people who the um, Charlies of the world, like people recognize them, the Josh Pe Josh Peck, the Zach Kings of the world, that people just like recognize them already. Um, versus you're working with, I don't know, an Ina Garden or someone who who might have that your parents are definitely following or your that audience is following, uh, but doesn't even know it. You know, so we're just like having to press upon that. Like, if you're on social media, get following an influencer. <laughs> you know what I mean? And everyone's on social media, by the way. Um, and you know, with COVID, increases of Twitch, increases of Reddit, increases of YouTube, increases of TikTok, and the 30%. Um, so it's we're not talking about a world where only some people use social media anymore. Some people have influencers. It's everyone. And who doesn't love Ina? I know we keep killing it during quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, how have you guys thought about consumer research during this time? Has that been really, um, you know, uh, top of mind for your agencies? I know at Influential, that's been something that um, has been extremely helpful in, in getting us through, you know, all of the sort of changes with the social landscape, really making sure that we're providing recommendations to brands that we feel really confident about because they're backed by super deep data and insights that is informed by all this uh, consumer research that, that we have access to. Have you guys really been thinking about that too from an agency perspective and how have you been leaning on some of those insights? Um, for for us, those insights have been absolutely critical, um, really understanding how consumers are shifting their media consumption, but also their expectations of brands during this time. So whether that's, again, being more open to lower quality content, just because it, it's feeding the appetite that's out there, um, and even understanding from a creative perspective, like, do people want to see COVID content? Like, you know, and once we're past COVID, do we still make a nod to it because it happened? Like, it's just really understanding even like the small creative nuances. Um, so I think, you know, the research has been critical in at least planning and understanding strategically how we'll go to market in the later half of the year and even early next. Yeah, and, and Allie mentioned, you know, social's up 30 plus percent, right? So we're always looking at those consumer insights and what's happening kind of across the platforms. Are people ready to go in store and, and shop if things are opening up or do we still kind of cater to this um, D2C, mobile friendly, et cetera, kind of commerce space. So uh, across the board, um, it's, it's really important to be taking the nod from the people um, because you do want to make sure that the message is right and it's, it's not overly saturated one way or the other. Um, it's super important for us. Yeah, that's a really great point because especially if you're just leaning on on what's reported in the media, right? It's a very skewed uh, understanding of, and there's a lot of uh, polarizing sort of ideas about that. So like we've been doing probably a Qualtrics study like every week or every two weeks to really make sure we have our finger on the pulse of, do consumers wanna see people with masks? Are they comfortable seeing, you know, people at the barbecue, um, you know, in small groups and larger groups. So it's been critical for us from a, a creative perspective um, as well. I almost think and you can- social listening. Oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say, I almost think you can also take a nod from influencers there, right? Because yes. they are so open about saying, you know, we, did, we social distanced before we got together or when you see you know, groups of people together. They're just very um, transparent about it. So I think we've been able to also take a nod from them as well and how to handle. Yep. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up because like, for example, Black Lives Matter and, and all of the content that was around that and how brands, you know, some brands were, you know, should we work with, like, what are the types of influencers we should work with if they're mentioning my brand alongside you know black lives matter content like how are consumers reacting to that are they you know turned off by brand messages at this time during that and what we have, are finding is absolutely no we are having influencers who are very vocal about you know human rights and social justice at the same time as you know working and promoting brands that they truly are passionate about and you know in an authentic way and we are seeing nothing but uh positive sentiment positive positive sentiment for um native content is anywhere from you know 98 to 100 percent on everything that we're seeing even alongside um a lot of the you know uh, landscape of social as it exists today. So are, how are you guys um, experiencing that as well? Is that kind of similar on your end from a positive sentiment perspective? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, was just saying, I, I think it's, it's, it's hard to, some of the brands who work with are, are risk averse, obviously, right? And they want to work with influencers who sometimes are um, in the middle and toe the line. And the reality is right now, like that's the worst thing you could do as a brand. And so I, I think what I love about reports, um, like you're talking about Adrian, that Influential has put out. And then I know 
um, we use a lot of social listening to help us kind of show like, actually, hey, look, when these influencers have a perspective, look at the comments they're getting, look at the retweets, like look at how people are interacting with them. That's what's important because guess what? That's what you're trying to tap into. Like you, that's the whole point of working with this influencer is that they can galvanize people to talk and, and um, have conversations. And just, just from research, we know that, like you mentioned, Adrian, people are expecting that. Like that is the expectation at this point in time. And if you are not doing that, you know, the guidance is your brand will suffer either now or, or into the future because um, just specifically for Black Lives Matter, you know, the world is getting, becoming more if, it, you know, it already is super multicultural, right? So how are you right-sizing that? Um, and, and these are the, the conversations that we are bringing to bear and coming to our clients with because it's super important. Awesome. I unfortunately am running out of time or have ran out of time and I didn't even get to ask you guys any any of the fun questions that I had um, on, the, on the personal front about how you guys are enjoying uh, work, you know, work from home and all of that. But we are going to end it here. Um, Chris, I will hand it back over to you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all for um, taking the time to talk with us today and really enjoyed your perspective and um, insights across the board. Thanks, Thanks Thank you all so yeah. much, ladies. That was a wonderful session. Anisha, Ali, Justine, obviously Adrian, uh, fantastic session. We really enjoyed that. Uh, just a quick reminder that if you're posting about today's live cast, please use uh, the hashtag BI live cast hashtag. Um, now we have a very special guest uh, that I'd like to introduce. Uh, this is the CMO of the platform we are all using right now, WebEx. Welcome to the stage, Aruna. Aruna is the Chief Marketing Officer uh, of Cisco WebEx. Uh, the, ses the session is actually moderated by my brother, Ryan Dietert, the CEO of Influential. Uh, welcome to the stage, Aruna and Ryan. I believe you're both yeah, on mute. Okay, hey. the button, this there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right? We actually have a feature when we see people's lips moving, it'll automatically <laughs> automatically. Hi, very nice to meet you guys. Very excited to be here and join Thanks your for, session uh, today. Thanks for having us. Uh, I, I, I think it's a very meta moment. Uh, we are on your platform with your partner at the Brand Innovators and we're your influencer partner. So we're living in a WebEx world. So. Very excited for today. Thank you for joining us. No, it's all our pleasure. Please continue to live in the WebEx world. We love that. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll jump right out. We have so much to cover. You guys are at the center of all of this uh, in terms of the work from home, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem. But I would love for the people on you know, the, all the brands and brand marketers to hear about your perspective because you are, you know, you're, you have a very unique background. You, you came from engineering, you're now a CMO of an, of a, an amazing company. Um, how did you make that leap and what kind of advantages does that uh, give you? So maybe there's engineers that are happen to be hearing about this, I'm gonna jump into to marketing. How, how did that work out for you? I think it doesn't matter whether you come from an engineering background or any kind of a business background. My philosophy is that the most important thing is to have a passion for the customer. You know, the way I basically describe myself is that I'm a storyteller and a customer obsessed CMO. And so anything which the team and I actually do will always advocate the voice of the customer. And so we focus on all elements of the customer's journey, even though marketing plays a predominant role in some of them. Uh, the way I like to describe it is, you know, marketing has a huge amount of role to play, especially given SaaS based marketing, which is where we are right now. Uh, on the five E's. So it's easy to find, meaning that you have to make sure that you're optimized for search, easy to try because, you know, that's number one when you think about a SaaS based product, easy to buy because once you have a hook and somebody is basically signed up for a, a freemium or a free trial, you want to get them to convert. And then that's not it. How do you basically retain the customer so that you reduce the churn, which is all about easy to manage and easy to support. And so for me, anything which the team and I actually do is completely focused on that. And coming from an engineering background, 
the value I actually get is that it's very easy for me to pick up any technology. I used mm -hmm. to be in the DevOps in a very, very core IT management world before I came into Cisco. And then the transition to come into Cisco and, uh, and lead the WebEx platform was very, very uh, smooth because I understand the technology really, really well. Well, you are a renaissance woman. You come from all angles. That's, uh, that's great to hear. And even with all of that, uh, you know, that background and obviously your ability to, to lead this team, I mean, everybody, um, uh, for the last three to six months, it's been the craziest roller coaster in history. Um, I guess the, this is, again, kind of a meta thing. Even though everyone thinks of you guys as, like, the hub for where they do their work from home business, you guys had to figure out how to, to navigate that as well. So was there an adjustment period? Were you guys light years ahead because of your technology? How did you guys deal with COVID as a company when it happened, you know, in, in March-ish? Uh, you know, so like, like you rightfully called out, you know, we are the providers for uh, collaboration technology, you know, so WebEx has 95% of Fortune 500 are our customers and we have a huge market share. And, mm -hmm. and I like to call ourselves in terms of a tagline, when the world wants to work, the world works on WebEx, right? Because we are all about making sure work happens anywhere, anytime. Having said that, even though we have the entire collaboration technology and our entire employee base of 77,000 people are very used to using our collaboration technology, it's the, the part where people had to adapt to was being able to be completely remote all the time. At most of the time, people actually played in a hybrid world. I used to travel a lot, and so I'm very used to, mm -hmm. you know, working remotely as well as working in the office. I always go to the office, but it's the mind shift where you constantly have to work from home. And that's when you actually realize that the, the power of technology makes the whole thing very, very seamless and very, very transparent. And uh, the part which I'm really proud about, especially what the teams did at this particular time, while we were sheltering in places, we launched a very big global campaign across multiple different geos and, geo uh, and countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this campaign was the very first uh, media activation campaign, which included all of the various different channels, including broadcast, on-demand broadcast, media, print, so on and so forth. And the part which makes me really, really, um, you know, I'm, I, I would say I'm honored to be a part of uh, my current team is because the, all of the creatives were actually created while we were actually sheltering in place. So if you mm -hmm. if you go to cisco.com and say slash WebEx, you'll be able to see the Anthem campaign video and the entire video was actually built at home. And so, uh, and the results have been awesome since we have launched the campaign. You know, we created close to 228 pieces of content localized into multiple different countries and geos. Uh, mm -hmm. And the results have been fabulous and terrific. That's great. I have to ask you personally, do you miss any of the, 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 the travel or is it actually, is actually, I think it's more refreshing? Um, you know, I would say it's mixed uh, because, you know, right now, the only way you can actually communicate with customers is through WebEx. It was awesome hmm. because we live in a world where we provide collaboration technology, but we also provide the underlying beautiful room devices. And I always had the opportunity to go and see our customers uh, work sure. and so I missed the part in terms of not being able to have that customer interaction, but I won't say that I'm actually missing the travel otherwise. Yeah, <laughs> I was I, like you, I, I, was, I'm, I was actually every week last year, which was just rough. Um, so I think, I, I think my body is, is used to it, but I, I, I do appreciate using WebEx all day and not having to uh, get the, uh, the jet lag. Um, so, but speaking of, so, this is essential. You guys are essential. You guys are the centerpiece to work from home business. How has this affected uh, your product and your team? Um, I have to imagine that the demand has gone through the roof. You, now it must be, uh, you know, you guys are just trying to deal with all the supply needs because people have been jumping on and maybe hadn't thought about being on uh, any sort of platform for previously this. Yeah, so I would say, you know, like, for example, WebEx has been there in the business. We are the guys who actually created and coined the video conferencing technology. When we had Francisco acquired WebEx, was it 13 years ago? And, and we have been the glue who has basically kept the businesses actually moving forward. Uh, uh, I previously shared with you 95% of Fortune 500 are our customers, and most of our customers are not used to remote work. And so, 
uh, our teams worked day in and day out in order to make sure that our customers could keep their lights on, could keep continuing to make work happen anywhere, anytime. And this time it's in their homes. And so for the, in the first three months during the pandemic, we actually saw a 3x increase in video usage. Uh, we supported 500 million meeting participants, generating close to 25 billion meeting minutes. It was like wow. unbelievable. Yeah, it was. And so we actually ran at close to two to three X usage, you know, when compared to the pre pandemic era. And so uh, the teams have been hard at work uh, and we also came up with a lot of best practices because technology can help you. But, you know, let's say, you know, when we all had to ship from home, people did not think about the Wi Fi bandwidth. And so yeah, let's say there is a family of four and everybody actually is now logged in. And so you might not have the bandwidth at that particular time. And so we came up with a lot of best practices in order to help uh, a lot, the entire community so that, you know, we can continue to make the work happen anywhere, anytime. And this time it was all about remote work. I mean, can, can we get, I think, I think that we're all excited. Well, is there any tips, anything you think of that like, would be a best practice that, um, Something as simple as, you know, where they where they set up uh, during the day or some sort of use case about your tech or just work from home and, and then you see just from uh, your your discussions with uh, your team. Uh, you know, it's, I would say it's like, um, I, I'll give you examples and best uh, tips, which, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have, which we have seen emerge. Uh, one is um, our technology actually provides that, right? So it's not just about joining a video conferencing meeting. I run a large globally distributed marketing team and we are constantly huddling together in order to basically choreograph maybe an Anthem video or choreograph uh, any one of the assets which you want to use for your you know, customer digital journeys. How would you do that if you're not there uh, face to face? And so given our technology, we, are, you know, we have the WebEx Teams app, gives you the ability to do whiteboard. I had never used the WebEx Teams whiteboard app until we basically transitioned and had to work from home. And the part I realized out of that is it was so freaking cool because you could bring all the post-its uh, and all of your content automatically got saved because if you're in a, in a physical environment and you're using a physical whiteboard, you can't actually save the content. What would you do? You would mm -hmm. basically take a photograph of it and then translate sure. it into a deck, right? Here, I actually used our own technology with WebEx Teams. We could continue to innovate, and that was one of the best tricks I actually learned, which our pro pro uh, product actually provides. Uh, the other feedback I've heard from a lot of our customers are that with our la latest version of WebEx release, we could actually blur backgrounds. You could actually uh, change virtual backgrounds, and I think those were mm -hmm. some of the feature functionality a lot of the customers actually really appreciated mainly because when you're working from home and people are probably working from their bedrooms, they could be working from their dining table, you want to actually, uh, if you're talking to a customer, uh, you know, you can choose the background you actually want to act, uh, appear in. And so though they were some of the uh, key feature functionality which we actually accelerated in order to help our end users as well as our community. And we're still in that mode because right now, the way we see the world is, People are, uh, organizations are still continuing to allow their employees to work from home, but mm -hmm. they're also uh, putting uh, steps in place in order to transition people back into the office. But if you have to bring people back into the office, the underlying technology plays a big role in terms of in, uh, enforcing any kind of social distancing uh, rules. And so, for example, with our uh, WebEx room devices, if there are more, let's say a conference room can have only three people, I can set that in the WebEx device. And if let's say the fourth person walks into the room, it'll pop up a, a, a warning saying that, you know, more than three people are not allowed in the conferencing room. Uh, oh, wow. All of Very our cool. devices now become digital signages. So you can actually use that in order to, you know, articulate any one of your uh, disciplines. And so there are so many different use cases we have actually brought to market in order to help the community. Well I, well, I just learned something. So the whiteboarding app, we're, we're going to use it on our, we, we use you guys every week as you do kind of our all hands. And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put in some uh, good uh, memes and, uh, and, and quotes each week. Now, now I'll use the whiteboard, uh, whiteboarding app. So that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to switch gears for one second into the security realm. Now, a lot of your competitors have, you know, infamously been uh, uh, in the press around, maybe they're kind of learning how to be, make sure that their, 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 their collection or their connection is secure. I'd love to hear how you, you guys obviously been around the longest and you guys basically invented this space. 
you, you talk about security and obviously the importance and what you guys do to make sure that everybody is 100% secure on your platform? Yep, absolutely. So when you think about remote work and being able to enable people to work from home anytime, anywhere, video conferencing as well as collaboration technologies emerged as the winner. What do you think is the second winner? It's security. Because while you want to make sure that people have the ability to connect and collaborate anywhere, anytime, you want to be able to do that without compromising the underlying security as well as the privacy. So for us at Cisco, we take security very, very seriously. It's a core part of our DNA. Security for us is actually built in. It's not bolted on, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and for us, when you when we want to basically enable that seamless collaboration, it's all about being able to do collaboration without compromise. That's our tagline. We never sell or rent our uh, customers' data. Uh, privacy is a very, very important element for us. You know, everybody's talking about end-to-end -end encryption. For us, that was there 10 years ago, right? Like it's like table stakes because security becomes a huge part of where we are and who we are mm -hmm. as a company at Cisco. And, um, you know, it's not an afterthought, it's a forethought. It's fundamentally built into our products every time we bring a new product to market or whether it's a new feature into the market. Got it. And do you think that uh, those that are just jumping into the, uh, the market now simply just thought that was their afterthought. That was them trying to figure out how to, you know, basically solve a lot of the vanity pieces. You guys have, you guys have the best of both worlds. It's something I'm pitching you guys. So it's really the best of both worlds. You guys have all the cool features that end the security. Um, it sounds like you guys really were a security company first that also has extended all of your collaboration tools. That's, and that's, I, I see a tremendous amount of uh, value of you guys versus everybody else because of that one reason. Yes, it's absolutely right, right? So you, you can bring the bells and whistles and bring a lot of the features quickly to market, but in order to basically bring security within the product set, you know, I was an engineer for 10 years and I can tell mm -hmm. you, it's not very easy to bolt on security. It'll always be bolted on security and it's very, very different when you fundamentally have to architecturally build it into our product. And like I said, uh, while now we have the ability to bring a lot of the bells and whistles, which are, uh, which our customers have actually requested us, but we don't have to worry about the security part. You know, our customers can go to bed, mm -hmm. not having to worry that their data is ever going to be compromised. Uh, our universities uh, who have actually adopted our product, they never have to worry about the fact that, you know, there is going to be some kind of a bombing and some kind of an intruder who would actually, you know, uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they would have to get exposed to. So, so getting the word out on your security, on your feature sets, on your collaboration tools, what has been your guys' influencer strategy, overall media strategy? You know, where, where do you guys kind of think of uh, this, whether it's celebrities, influencers, social platforms, what's, you guys, what's been your POV? For us, influencers have always played a big role. Um, and so let me break the influencers uh, strategy into multiple different components. So one is, it's all about product placements. I don't know whether many people know is, uh, for example, the Showtime show, uh, Billions, all of the technology over there, the phones, the whiteboard, all of them are from Cisco. They are all our WebEx room devices. And so for us, product placement with various different, uh, uh, you know, movie productions, uh, with television shows, with Netflix, it's always been there. And so if you see uh, in most of the, um, you know, television shows or in the movies, most of the time it's actually Cisco's products. And so product placements is, is a core part of our DNA in terms of what we do. The area where we have really now uh, transformed and we're continuing to basically innovate is around being able to build celebrity as well as influential uh, partnership. Uh, a recent example of that is with CNN. You know, if you now watch CNN, you'll see on the right hand side via Cisco WebEx Live. That was a marketing media partnership which we actually created with CNN. Uh, and so um, who ever thought that, you know, we would actually have COVID and then the whole world would actually get to see it. It was awesome. Uh, and so again, being able to have the product placement and our products are very uh, visible externally is a huge part of our influencer strategy. In addition to that, we have, uh, we have had uh, several different celebrity partnerships, uh, Ellen Show. All of the technology is provided by Cisco. The recent Mother's Day um, Ellen show was actually hosted on WebEx, where she was able to talk to 25 different mothers. 
uh, Jimmy Kimmel Live is also hosted on WebEx. And the recent partnership we brought to market actually just last week, and I wrote a blog about that, is the Hello Sunshine series with Reese Witherspoon. And we are really, mm. really excited in order to partner with Reese uh, as a result of that. Um, other kind of influencer partnerships are, you know, uh, I have a very strong partnership with several different futurists in the market, like Mike Walsh. He's a futurist. He's written the book, The Algorithmic Leader, and he talks about how the world is actually going to be, you know, uh, the next five years from now. And so he come, frequently comes and talks uh, in our Future of Work webinar series. There is Jacob Morgan. He's another futurist. And so we have a huge amount of these kind of technology uh, influencers who basically come and talk about, um, you know, how the world is actually rapidly going to change when you think about multiple different industries. Last but not the least, we're also going to double down on the core influencer strategy. We, uh, and we have just started to plan out that. Uh, and this is about more focusing on the millennials as well as the Gen Z population. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, there are multiple different channels and multiple different influencers uh, who work across multiple different disciplines. And this is going to become a very, very important element of how we are actually going to go to market as we move into our next fiscal year, which actually starts uh, August 1st. That's great. I, I, I'm a huge fan of Billions. I've seen it. You got a great, great uh, integration there. Um, you, you, you mentioned uh, some of these futurists, like Mike and, and Jacob. Um, what is, what's, what's your POV? What's also what's been their POV around the future of work? Our future of work is something that you're very passionate about. Um, you know, what, what, what have you guys seen in that, in that, in that vein? It, it's, it, it's, it's really interesting, right? Like, so future of work, it has been a topic. We at Cisco have been talking about it for the last more than a year, even before the pre-pandemic time. And it, right now, it's one of the hottest topic. If you actually do look at Google Trends, it'll tell you that it's uh, probably the eighth uh, keyword in terms of Google Trends. Uh, but this has been something which we actually have focused and talked about um, multitude of times. So when you think about future of work, uh, pre-pandemic, it was all about being able to facilitate, uh, being able to facilitate working anywhere, anytime, whether you're, work, you're a mobile worker or whether you're a frontline worker or whether you're an office worker, you know, there are multiple different worker styles. And so being able to facilitate that was a core part of the discipline. It was also about space transformation. You know, as you have seen over the last couple of years, more and more companies have gone away from those big conference rooms and big offices into more open spaces. And again, you know, working with uh, facilities, it, uh, when you think about future of work, it's not just about the technology. There are three different elements which are tied to it. One is the cultural transformation. It's about the people. And currently at this particular time, we are actually dealing with a quad generation workforce. For the very first time in two decades, you have four generations of people who are actually in the workforce. You have the baby boomers who actually haven't retired. They should have, but they haven't <laughs> retired. Then there is yeah. the Gen X, the Gen Y, and the Gen Z population. And the future of work was all about how can you basically blend across the multiple different quad generational work styles, and how can you basically go through a workplace transformation in terms of space, and what can the technology do in order to actually enable the future of work. But if you ask me now, what is the future of work? It's all about the remote work. And it's all about being able to enable organizations to basically bring employees back into the office. And so it's all about the hybrid workplace. And if you think about future of work, you know, I would say this world has permanently changed. And we have seen a lot of interesting mm -hmm. new use cases, which has, uh, um, you know, come out as a result, as a result of the pandemic, um, more and more telehealth use cases. And a lot of the um, you know healthcare vendors who are all uh, Cisco customers, they are telling us that you know that is there to stay. Previously, you know any kind of therapy sessions were always done face to face. Now everybody mm -hmm. had to shift to virtual therapy sessions, and they realized they had the ability to span across multiple different geos in some locations where people had to drive for several different hours in order to go through the therapy session. Sure. Now they can do it through teleconferencing. And so more and more of those healthcare providers are going to ensure that the telehealth use cases are going to be there forever. I think uh, same thing, the future of education is also going to be disrupted. While you know the classroom, in-classroom education will never go away, I'm pretty sure universities are going to come up with new business models. 
where they'll actually offer uh, additional different coursework across multiple different geographies, which will create multitude of additional revenue streams for them. And so given that, I predominantly believe that the future of work is going to be very, very different given the pandemic. There are some elements which will go back to, you know, same old, same old, but there are a lot of different elements which will not go back. And this whole concept of uh, remote virtual learning, the whole concept of telehealth with respect to healthcare, and another important area is virtual events are going to stay because virtual events brings a new important element and a dynamic as a result of it, which is all about the digital side, right? So you could you can never do that on the in the face to face event. I won't say never because when you think about a face to face event, uh, you can get that face to face interaction. But I think uh, digital events are going to go through a disruption and an innovation and a lot of the key things uh, you should have been able to do with the face to face event. I think you should be able to do it with a digital event and the technologies will basically evolve in order to en uh, enable that. So there's so many things that I could uh, double click into. I, I guess one thing that caught my attention, because I didn't think about it. You're right. Um, the university, the, the teleeducation. A lot of, uh, I mean, it depends on what you, you you study, but a lot of what happens in, in college is being away from home for the first time and kind of learning how to take care of yourself. Um, if, in fact, people, especially for the, you know, the immediate future, are going to be operating based off of this. Yeah, I, I, I can see, I guess, um, I, I, don't, I don't want you to result, uh, reveal any, any plans you have. Do you guys have integrations with big uh, universities? Is, is that something you guys are also going after right now where a Harvard business class should all be done on WebEx? Is that kind of things that you guys are talking to? There are several different universities where they already had WebEx. All they did was during the pandemic, they expanded their licenses because they mm -hmm. had to support the uh, all of the students. But now we are seeing a lot of additional universities who are coming down to us because security becomes an important element when you think about education. And it's not just education, right? Any vertical mm -hmm. security is paramount. You have you cannot compromise on the security. And so we have sure. seen tons of different uh, customers across universities, across uh, healthcare. You know, all come back to us because that's why I said this. Uh, the, it has actually opened up a lot of additional um, use cases, which are going to be there to stay forever. And I think it's it, the world is going to look a little bit different even post pandemic. Whenever that post pandemic actually happens, I should say. Um, <laughs> well, what you're describing obviously is just interconnectivity. Um, do you is there is there a certain POV around whether or not you think the future of your platform and platforms like yours is going to be more personal based than like obviously I, we know you as the preeminent business platform. Obviously, you now also have these personal elements. Is that a, is that a big focus uh, on the personal side of people so that communication happens on your platform no matter what? Hundred percent, right? So yeah. when you think about technology and when you think about collaboration, it's about that personal connection, and especially mm -hmm. when you have to work from home. And you and if this is going to become the way of life as you think about the future, the personalization aspect becomes even more critical. That's why I said, you know, we very, very quickly brought to market and launched uh, a virtual background, blur background, you know, share file, you know, the number of features we brought to market in the last three months is just unbelievable. And the reason we did that is because you need to enable that personalization. And if you think about Cisco, our re, uh, the, we recently launched our mission statement, you know, what Cisco actually believes in, and our tagline is and being able to provide an inclusive future for all, right? So that's our tagline. That's what the company actually fundamentally believes in. And how do you basically translate that uh, tagline? Uh, the best way to do it is with technology. How do you basically enable an inclusive future? The technology becomes one of the key areas of innovation where you can actually bring in those personalization so that you can get that um, uh, element in order to include whether you're a remote worker, whether you're a mobile worker, whether you're a frontline worker, or whether you're an office worker should not matter. The technology mm -hmm. should blur all the lines so that way the underlying element should become a personal collaboration and a personal connection. I love it. And, and pursuant to that, and I'm, this is kind of, uh, this is maybe looking out net multiple years in the future. So your product has, to, has continued to evolve in the last few months. And do you see, is there any sort of thing that's happening in the next calendar year? I'm even thinking futurist like VR integrations. Is there, is there things that you expect in the next three to five years where there'll be, oh, 
well, that would be unrecognizable. So obviously, you have to, still have to have that communication. Do you think the the mediums where with which the you, know, you guys the, the people who are using you will be expanding into other you know headsets or you know, other things that are beyond just what is today? Everything you said is already there in our product. So, for example, we just launched our headset 700 series. And if you basically, uh, you know, turn on the headset and we actually uh, launched this particular feature you were talking to me about where uh, as soon as you basically turn on the headset, it will recognize and automatically connect to your uh, room device and you'll be able to join mm -hmm. a meeting directly then and there without a, a single button click. Here is another innovation we have already had. And this has now become very, very important given social distancing. It's all about touchless, contactless um, enablement, which you can actually do. Mm -hmm. And so all of our room devices are voice enabled. I can actually go into my office or into a room. I don't know whether I still have an office if I ever go back, but it doesn't matter. Like, you know, when you have our room dev devices, it'll automatically recognize that I have a meeting if I go into that meeting room because I have something called a pairing. And it will automatically connect to that room device. And then all I have to say is, hey, Webex, join the meeting and boom, I'm in the meeting. How do you think this is actually going to move into the future? You know, you will have you will have the ability to have a conversation with Webex. That's where we are moving into, right? So let's say you've had a, a meeting, um, you know, uh, two weeks ago, a recurring meeting with your members within your team, and you have shared a presentation. You, in fact, will have the ability to say, download the presentation from this SharePoint and then load it into the presentation, uh, load it into mm -hmm. the meeting. That is the level at which, you know, the innovation and automation is going to happen as you think about the future. And uh, a, a, a lot of the building blocks are already there within our product set. All we need to do is to take it to the next level. AR, VR, we already have an integration with uh, mm -hmm. uh, multiple different realware companies because that is one of the important use cases a lot of the frontline workers actually use. But again, that will further go through a massive innovation as well. The future is now. Very, very cool. Uh, yes. with, with, the, <laughs> with the remaining, uh, we have about 10 minutes or nine minutes or so left. I'd love to go to the, uh, the Q&A section. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, how has your leadership style changed over the past few months? Have you been able to develop more personal relationships with your colleagues, uh, even though you're obviously remote? Yes, that is absolutely true. So one of the, I think you asked me this question too, right? Like what were the things that have changed? One is the technology. The technology becomes the enabler. But when you are, you know, you have moved into a complete remote work, I think being able to connect with your team, you have to work really hard to make sure that if you're mm -hmm. having those hallway face-to-face uh, -face, uh, water cooler conversation, now that needs to become a virtual water cooler conversation uh, where you can leverage the technology and still continue to have that same kind of a, a personal connection with your team members. So one of the best practices which has actually emerged uh, in our teams are that every two weeks, we host something called virtual trivia games. So we have one person on the team who comes up with three different topics. Uh, we have our WebEx teams where we create multiple different spaces, and then we have a moderator. And using our devices, we can actually basically put the background music and we run it like a talk show. And the teams love that. And people have an opportunity cool. to come down, propose topics, and we get really competitive in terms of being able to win in those games. And those are the use cases which I never thought would you know come to market given the pandemic and so in terms of leadership style i think you know remote work you have to be much more empathetic to the team you know people have mm -hmm. gone through a lot and uh, and people have different kind of issues there are people who are single and they don't have an opportunity to hang with their friends and there are people when uh, you know when the riots were actually happening i actually had the opportunity to touch base with all members within my team and i learned a lot and, and, and it gave me a perspective in a way I cannot even explain. You know, the whole pandemic has actually changed my perception in terms of how you need to actually have that constant communication in terms of being able to lead your team. And within Cisco, our leadership has been phenomenal. We have weekly check-ins right up to our CEO. Uh, we bring in external speakers uh, and, you know, everybody gets heard. And okay. given that we are a 77,000 people company, I'm just like, amazed at the way you know the whole company and the leadership team has actually come together especially at this time well speaking of, of empathy and of the connection um you know we are in a very unique time in our country's history 
Um, I would love to know how you are communicating to your team and what your guys' stance is on all things, you know, race, equality, inclusiveness, you know, what's been your message internally and externally as a company? You know, uh, for us, like, you know, if you think about Cisco, our new purpose statement is to power an inclusive future for all, for all, right? So I am very, very passionate about being able to live to that particular purpose and mission statement. It's about being able to create equal opportunities for everyone. Um, and, you know, the last couple of months have been really, really tough. Uh, we all had to get adjusted to the global pandemic. We all had to learn how to basically work from home instantaneously. We all had to adapt to accommodate distance learning, uh, uh, sorry, social distance learning. And, uh, you know, we had to survive um, and we basically thrived. And we are all going to come out, out of this pandemic much more stronger together. And, and in, in during this progress, uh, during this process, we all had to witness a little bit of untold pain and outrage over, mm -hmm. you know, the concept of persistent racial divide uh, and in inequality. And in my mind, rather than lose heart, we must find ways to have those tough conversations. We must focus on, um, you know, what part we can actually play in terms of being able to make that particular change. Uh, I was especially inspired uh, by an article from uh, Barack Obama, and I'll leave you with this quote, right? The quote say, goes like this, if going forward, we can channel our justifiable anger into peaceful, sustained, and effective action, then this moment can be a real turning point in our nation's long journey to live up to our highest ideals. That quote was just an amazing quote for me, and I had to read that quote out. And so, again, uh, uh, we as leaders, I, would, I wouldn't say leaders, everyone has to basically have, you know, take a, um, a stance, and sh you should have the opportunity to have that transparent, tough conversation. Uh, very inspiring quote and very inspiring uh, POV. Um, I know at Influential, uh, one of the things we've been doing is uh, an activation called Amplify Black Voices. The context essentially is not just about equality, it's also about inequities. And mm -hmm. while some have taken certain boycott measures and, and figure out how to pause their, some of their media, really the, the con there's, there's over 100,000 uh, uh, Black-owned small businesses that are content creator shops. They essentially have ecosystems of producers, of uh, you know, choreographers, of just content creation across all YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, you name it. Um, and we've seen a number of clients uh, be able to say, well, I'm gonna lean in and give some amazing creators an opportunity to create content that can live really anywhere across any social platform or even in digital or, or even we've done, we've done TV commercials even for linear in this crazy time of COVID. Um, so yeah, so I, 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 I applaud you and that you guys are looking for any uh, both internal in inclusiveness, also external in your marketing pieces, and the brands that step up and provide both not just equality, but the uh, uh, equity is something that's very important uh, that we're seeing yes. uh, for our clients. And, and all of us, you know, it's awesome. You guys are actually doing that too, right? Like that's why I said, like every bit of uh, a voice actually matters and everybody comes together. And that is when the, uh, you know, the voice actually gets ex uh, ex uh, elevated and you have an opportunity to basically really make a change in the market. And this is nothing to do with Cisco. I'll actually share my own personal um, you know, area in terms mm -hmm. of how I think about it. Uh, my youngest daughter actually created a website which is called filterblack.com, filter-black.com, where she, her goal was to basically prop, find a way to basically bring all of the small, medium businesses in the black communities together mm -hmm. and provide ways for people to, you know, actually come to this particular website uh, and find anything to do with uh, small, medium businesses, right? And so Great. she built a website in one week, had it activated, built a video on TikTok, which went really viral. And, um, you know, I was really proud because I definitely believe in the same thing too. Well, she's a, f a future CMO or CEO or something in the future. It's very, very cool. Congrats on raising an amazing daughter. But we have about two minutes left. I, I, I guess I want to kind of maybe kind of encapsulate all this. Is there anything, uh, I guess you can probably take, take one step to the side also, in your either biz life, in your, biz, in your business life, or in your personal life, what do you, what's the next year look like? Obviously, things have been fast and furious and things are nuts. As maybe hopefully life starts to normalize again and we start figuring out the future, what's your next year look like? What's, what's exciting for you? What's, what's uh, keeping you excited and looking forward? 
Uh, I think for me, from a work perspective, you know, continue to innovate with my teams, despite being remote uh, and continuing to have fun, right? So, because while you're remote, the fun factor, you cannot afford to lose that. You cannot afford to lose the customer obsession. Everything you do has to basically communicate that. So continue on that so that you can make amazing things happen uh, without losing the fun element. So that, you know, is a very important element for us. As our, um, you know, our product line is going through a big uh, metamorphosis. So for us, you know, it's, it's not just about WebEx meetings. We are moving into a unified communication strategy that there is going to be a single app for call, message and meet. And so we are going to go through a big uh, storytelling and you'll see a lot about that, uh, um, you know, in, in, in this, not this calendar year, in our fiscal year, which starts April 1st through July 31st next year. On the personal side, for me, this is a year to spend with my family. Both my parents live here very close to me and I never have had the time to basically spend the time with them. And so spending more time with my family. Uh, parents uh, spending more time with my two daughters. I actually feel that, you know, it's I've been given a, a second blessing in life. Both the girls are in college and now they have no choice but to basically be on a house arrest with me. And so I'm definitely <laughs> going to on that and get to spend a little bit of more additional time with both my girls. Well, amazing. Aruna, thank you so much for your time. Um, I think everyone learned uh, uh, some new features and how new new uh, philosophies for work from home. Um, and uh, if you guys are not on WebEx, use WebEx. We use it. It's amazing. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate your, uh, your time today. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Bye. Thank you so much, guys. All right. So moving on. Uh, that was a fantastic session. Aruna Ravachandran, CMO of Cisco WebEx, and my brother, Ryan Dietert. Um, so we are getting down to our last two panels of the day, the last two sessions of the day. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, if you don't follow Influential on social, uh, we would love for you to follow our LinkedIn page, our Instagram page, and our Facebook page. Uh, we promise not to be boring and redundant. We like to mix it up. We are a social media-based company, so uh, please follow us to follow all the latest and greatest. Um, our Instagram page is, is well curated and very pretty, and uh, the other pages provide a lot of information about our company and all of our latest happenings. Uh, so also, it is not too late uh, to invite friends. Um, we are coming down to the last two sessions of the day, but uh, they are great ones. Um, starting with the first one, um, Joe Piascovi, our amazing VP of Brand Strategy and Partnerships at Influential, uh, is interviewing uh, Andrew Rebhun, who is uh, the Vice President of Digital Officer uh, at uh, El Pollo Loco. Uh, Andrew, Joe, how are you guys doing? Doing well, Chris. Thank you. Doing well, man. Thanks. Fantastic. I'll let you guys take it away from here. Awesome. Um, well, thank hey, you. Joe. What's up, Andy? How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Full disclosure for those folks out there, uh, Andy and I worked together at McDonald's a couple years ago. Um, really have had immense respect for everything he's done uh, in his tenure there and since. So it's really cool that our paths get to cross again like this and we get to have a conversation and I get to uh, facilitate you dropping some knowledge on all the, uh, the brand innovator community. For sure, man. So thanks for joining. Um, on that note, maybe you could just talk to us a little bit about your background and kind of what brought you to El Pollo Loco, and then we'll start getting into some sort of broader conversations about uh, marketing, advertising, and digital. Absolutely. So uh, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, and uh, grew up big Dodger fan. Very excited about opening day. I got my hat on. Yeah. Going to watch a game with my family tonight. Um, but went to University of Wisconsin. Uh, started my career out with Ford Motor Company. Um, had an opportunity there to work in a variety of marketing roles for about five years. And then I uh, had an opportunity to transition from Mustangs to McNuggets. And so, uh, ended up uh, joining McDonald's, uh, started in Boston, worked with the franchisees in the uh, Boston region. Had an opportunity where our paths crossed and I joined the U.S. digital team, uh, where I was the marketing manager for pretty much all of the East Coast McDonald's from Maine to Miami as far west as Birmingham. And then most recently served as the uh, marketing officer for the Southeast. So I had about 1,700 restaurants, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and uh, did all the TV, radio, digital out of home for those markets. And, you know, quite honestly, I was at a point in my career where 
uh, you know, I, I had a lot of introspection and I had an opportunity to kind of reassess where I was at with my life and really felt like I wanted to be closer to home. I had moved uh, six times in 10 years, uh, pretty chaotic life. I mean, Detroit, Kansas City, Detroit, Boston, Chicago, Atlanta. Um, and, uh, you know, I had uh, I just uh, about graduated from Northwestern Kellogg School of Management and shout out to my friends from Kellogg who are on the webcast right now. But, uh, yeah. you know, they, they as well as some of my professors uh, just kind of gave me a lot of guidance about what's important to me, what's important in my personal and professional life. And it really encouraged me to make the transition. So um, I had an opportunity to interview with my uh, CEO, Bernardo Coca, who's just an incredible, incredible human being. And um, personalities connected and we clicked and um you know thrilled to be working for him and, and the company yeah absolutely I, I love that you know story and i think it's an important one to tell because it really is easy to sort of lose perspective at times and you know just get comfortable in what you're doing you know you obviously had a great job at mcdonald's and we're moving up the ladder there um so i think it's great to just show that you can sort of hit pause on, on sort of a career path and kind of reassess where you want to be. And obviously you made that change and then transitioned to this incredible role with El Pollo Loco right now as well. Thanks, man. I yeah. love it too. I mean, I'm, I'm a block from the beach, which is great. So I don't have to worry too much about climate. And uh, I have an opportunity to either go for a walk every morning or every evening after work. And it's very nice. And I stay safe. I stay away from people, which is good. Absolutely. I mean, on that note, I know you started in January, right? Or December? Uh, yeah, October, November time frame. Okay, October, November, right on. So somewhat new as, as COVID hit. I mean, what has the transition for your company been like in terms of the work from home? Have you seen specific challenges or, you know, have you noticed some actual efficiencies through it all? Maybe you could talk through what you know, it's been it's, like. It's so funny because I think as a company, our entire culture evolved. And for those who are listening, if if you have a CEO or you have people who are not as willing to kind of take that chance of having everybody out of the office and communicating, I would encourage them to try it. I know some of us were forced to try it for quite some time, but I will tell you, my CEO was not a believer in the work from home thing. He was very concerned about the efficiencies, the ability to communicate, but I think we're a better and a stronger company because of it. You know, quite honestly, the communication has never been better. You know, we're constantly texting. We do, uh, our marketing team does a uh, a Zoom or a WebEx every single morning. And uh, it's incredible. I mean, we have 30 minutes where we touch base every single day. Everybody kind of shares where their head is at, what they're working on, et cetera. And it's just good to have that fluid communication, right? Because I think it's very easy to kind of get a little bit caught off guard in, in the environment we're working in because people are remote. Some people, their home is their office, their office is their home. Many of us have families. So it becomes a little bit challenging, but I would just say communication is key. And uh, obviously, it's, it's very advantageous when you have a team that you, you love and enjoy and you have that yeah. style of communication and dialogue. Yeah, it seems, you know, one of the sort of benefits of what's truly an obviously terrible thing with COVID is sort of reassessing this kind of ways we work. You know, I've, I always felt like it was time to evolve beyond that sort of nine to five, Monday through Friday mentality of everybody having to be in the office. And obviously, some companies were starting to do that. But it just seemed like we still weren't pushing the envelope there enough and sort of evolving with the way people's lifestyles were changing. So it's like, I love how quickly we've even been able to change from like work from home to the idea of work from anywhere now, um, right. you know, which is really exciting. And it feels like that's really being embraced by even some surprising companies across the board where they're like, you know, they're really understanding that as long as you have the tools to get your job done, I mean, you're going to be able to get it done. For sure. And I, I think it's pretty neat too. You have some people who are obviously traveling safely, but I have a few friends who have really taken the opportunity to utilize Airbnb yeah. and uh, drive to some remote destinations, set up shop in a house for one week and then go somewhere one week later. So provided yeah. that they're able to be uh, tuned in and, and focus on their company's goals and deliverables, they're able to you know live the best of both worlds, which is pretty yeah. neat. Absolutely. Um, so transition a little bit into your, your, your role now and, and sort of marketing in general. Like, what are some of the things coming from McDonald's to El Pollo Loco that have sort of surprised you or sort of reignited your excitement about the space? Um, if you want to just touch on that a little bit. Yeah, McDonald's was just an incredible learning opportunity. I mean, they have some of the brightest people who work there. Um, they really challenge you. They obviously help you elevate your game to a, a whole different level. And uh, I would say their digital journey in general was really far down the path. And with El Pollo Loco, um, they're a little bit more of a challenger group where you know, the foundation was in place, but I would say that the foundation required a little bit of rebuilding. So being able to utilize a lot of those 
sets that I learned in terms of the franchisee orchestration, building the business cases, you know, really trying to think outside of the box and what would be most impactful to our customer base. I mean, that truly helped in the transition. And I think it's been very exciting to build our digital journey. I mean, I think as most people have articulated on these live casts, uh, COVID kind of accelerated digital across many different companies. Um, you know, companies that were a little bit slower to get their start in a, on a digital landscape, they essentially fast forwarded probably six months, a year, two years, where a lot of the numbers were two times, three times what you typically would expect from a, a digital engagement and a digital ordering right. standpoint. So it, it's, it's, it's very interesting to just see how it's changed the digital dynamic. Absolutely. So just sort of beyond the acceleration of the strategy, has there been other shifts or that, that where you were going one way pre-COVID and now you've had to sort of quickly pivot your digital strategy or some of your platform strategy for that matter to sort of better suit sort of our, our, the times we're in right now? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, deliveries one piece. Um, obviously, given that our, our restaurants were closed, uh, specifically because the majority of our restaurants are located in L LA County, we had to really dramatically figure out how are we going to uh, increase that throughput in our operations. So um, we had an opportunity, we partnered with Postmates, we had a campaign free delivery for however long is necessary. Uh, it's a campaign that's done incredibly well for us. We've um, multiplied our orders times five on that platform. Uh, and it's been a really great campaign. It's resonated really well with home. Initially, we were obviously trying to drive uh, customers into our own channels. But uh, the great partnership with Postmates really uh, helped us cast a wider net, which is a huge part of our strategy. You know, at the end of the day, uh, these third party aggregators are hugely beneficial to companies, especially when someone like Joe might be logging on to DoorDash or to Postmates and say, not really sure what I want for dinner tonight. And so you have your plethora of choices and, you know, sure enough, we're there, we're in prime position. And it certainly helped accelerate our, our off premise uh, numbers. And I'd say the other big piece, too, is just the overall brand engagement. Uh, the social listening has been extremely important, uh, making sure that you have a sense of how the customers are feeling, what they're experiencing in your restaurants. It's paramount because essentially you have, you know, 100, 200, 300 people going into your restaurants every day, whether that be via drive through via mobile order. They could give you that direct feedback. And I know lots of times on social, you know, you'll see there's people who are wearing a mask, not wearing a mask. People are washing their hands, not washing their hands. So. You, you obviously have the ability to have that that level of detail from your customer base, especially during these times. It's super critical. Yeah, and on that note, do you, with social listening and sort of other consumer um, research resources that you guys have at your disposal, like how does that information become operationalized in your marketing strategy? I mean, I assume you use some of it as a customer service outreach, but I also saw you guys have released some really cool products like your vegan taco and keto tacos. So. Um, does some of that come in into play there as well? Absolutely, man. Um, one of the fascinating things about the chickenless pollo was the fact that when we came out with the product, we had a lot of feedback from that community that it wasn't vegan. And so we got a lot of social comments on Instagram and on Facebook from customers saying, hey, you know, would love this product, but unfortunately it's not vegan certified. So we worked about two to three months to reformulate the ingredients of that product. and. Uh, we're able to get the American Vegetarian Association to certify it as vegan, and we launched it on uh, July 1st. And so, uh, pretty cool, um, pretty cool opportunity. We had a really good uh, social engagement with that, uh, with that crowd. We had some influencers. We sent some boxes to, which actually, hold on one sec. Oh yes, please. I'm not supposed to do this. <laughs> no, of we, have a, we have a we have a pretty neat uh, T-shirt that we have. So, um, yes, rule this roost. So a uh, really, really fun social engagement opportunity uh, to capitalize on that. So and you guys are giving those away via social? We did. Yeah, we uh, a lot of people who are vegan fans and a lot of people who follow the brand. We uh, we extended um, the uh, the vegan influencer box, too. So it was really neat. It was really fun. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, it's it's really your brand is is fascinating to me. I know we've sort of talked about it before. I, I really love your guys' creative and sort of your um, your sort of bravery and I, I think like coming out with products like that. You know, which are sort of niche products, but I think there's also obviously like a groundswell of sort of clamoring from consumers to have more of that from the QSR space. Um, like I said, your branding is really cool. I love how integrated you guys are, sort of in the LA community. And sort of like considering all of those different sort of signals right there, how how does all of that then sort of come into where you decide to activate on social and, and sort of how you activate on social? Yeah, I mean, the, the way we typically approach things at, at the company, 
there's four things that I, I typically establish before any type of campaign that I, I kind of go with. Number one is insight. So get an insight. What are your customers telling you? What are you hearing? What's the data illustrating relative to the way your brand should be positioned in the market? Number two would be objective. Set the objective for the campaign, set the objective for the marketing time period. The third piece would be the action. So what are you gonna do in order to accomplish that objective? What are the tactics? Is it executable? Is it profitable? Are your customers gonna notice it? Last piece of the puzzle would be the results. Making sure obviously that you hold yourself accountable. Is it driving brand awareness? Is it driving brand engagement? Is it delivering market share? Are our restaurants operating profitably? Those are all kind of the things that go into those types of campaigns. We've done some great things in the past uh, where we've, we've been very happy with the way certain campaigns have performed. Other times, you know, you, you know, we fail quickly and we learn and then we apply it to the next campaign, obviously ultimately trying to do better. But, you know, it, it's, it's really fun. I think the CEO uh, we have right now is very laser focused on making sure that everything we do is, is strategic. We're always looking to cast a wider net and making sure that we're staying true to our core brand values. Absolutely. So it, what, considering all that, like what platforms and sort of channels have you guys identified as the most important to help execute your strategy? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've obviously focused a bit more on Instagram. I think you, you probably can tell if you go visit our Instagram yeah. page, there's a lot more focus on Instagram. Before we were doing a lot of price pointing, uh, there's a lot more engagement with the social community. We're asking people their feedback on different products. We're asking them to tell us what they think nominate a person if they're uh, in, in the medical community or if they're a teacher. Um, we're really trying to get a lot more brand engagement in that avenue. Um, also, we've just done a much better job of digital advertising as a whole. Uh, I yeah. can tell you when I arrived, uh, you know, approximately nine months ago, we were doing about 5% of our digital ad spend. Uh, that was 5% of our, our overall media. Oh my goodness. Um, we've since increased that to 30%. Um, we just actually last week announced that we're doing a, a media transition. So. Um, we are uh, onboarding initiative, uh, part of IPG as we speak, and so super excited to start working with them. It's only going to enhance our ability to, to deliver digitally. Absolutely. Are there specific platforms and, and sort of trends that you're looking at right now that you guys are keeping an eye on as a, as a team or just you personally that you think are going to be essential in the next six to eight months? Yeah. I think the, uh, the biggest trend is just how the consumer is going to continue to adapt and in kind of this this gray space that we're in right obviously as a result of covid we've seen some changes to our overall menu mix to our average check obviously seeing the family meal skew a lot higher than they typically would and i think you've seen a lot of restaurant companies kind of go into this avenue or this this street of how can i best uh get my customer in the new way that they're operating and living so you're seeing a lot of brands come out with these multi-packs these family packs how can I get um, a, a lot of food for a relatively affordable price point where I can feed my entire family? That's been a huge part of, of our strategy previously, and I think it's only been amplified as a result of COVID. I think you see a lot of brands going down that path. I think the other big piece of, of, of the puzzle is how do you do a, a much better job of identifying food trends moving forward? So obviously we're a SoCal brand. Uh, LA Mex based and uh, food is a huge part of the culture here, obviously. And mm -hmm. the fact that we're so close to the beach, lots of people are healthy eaters. You know, we talked about keto, we talked about vegan. It's a huge focus because I think us as a brand, we're always focused on the whole healthy halo aspect of our brand. So making sure that we continue to innovate in that channel and make sure we deliver the products that our consumers and our aspirational customers want. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Are you guys starting to test TikTok or any other kind of emerging platforms right now? I mean, what's your sort of POV on that? Very funny that you asked. So ironically, uh, my social media manager and I, we had a presentation a couple of days ago with our CEO and just kind of took him through the, uh, I guess, the, the bare basics of TikTok and what it means. And so there are plans for us to be a part of TikTok. Uh, it's only going to be a matter of time. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting emerging platform. I think one of the things that's beautiful about it is right now it's not overwhelmed by brand advertising. It's very right. organic. It's very unique. Um, at a certain point, I believe that TikTok will probably go down that route where it's going to be a little bit more kind of Instagram-y where you have Instagram sponsored posts, you have, you know, Facebook paid right. social. There's a lot of opportunities for those types of companies to make money in that avenue. So I like the fact that it's still organic and it's very, uh, you know, creator based. Absolutely. 
you know, to kind of bring all of this together, what's really interesting to me as well is you obviously had bring the experience from Florida McDonald's and seeing like large digital strategies to your point that it's sort of been a little bit more mature than where you entered El Pollo Loco. So like considering all of that knowledge and experience that you brought to El Pollo Loco, like what are the things that you identified that were most essential in sort of building a strong digital strategy for your brand? Right. I think, you know, obviously getting back to what I said, the inside objective action result, that's really been been key for me. I think yeah. when you arrive at a company and you have an opportunity to assess, you have to take 90 days to learn. You got to get a, a lay of the land. You got to understand the landscape, see how everybody interacts with one another, how are decisions made, how are budgets spent. I mean, that was key, obviously learning the way things were done. And then you know, really trying to understand what the organization's goals are relative to whether that be digital or marketing or market share. And then you craft the digital strategy to kind of lift up to the ultimate goals for the brand. Uh, for me, obviously, I, I was very fortunate to, I think, have 11 or 12 bosses over the course of my 11 years in corporate America. All of them brought unique, uh, unique um, perspectives to the way I work, unique perspectives to the way I manage. And I'm so grateful to have had so many incredible bosses who have really helped me refine what I'm looking for from a, from a digital strategy. I mean, it's not necessarily learning digital strategy and just digital. It's, it's the marketing, it's the product marketing, it's the tech marketing. You, you learn a lot in a, a lot of different avenues and a lot of different veins, which is super cool. Um, you know, McDonald's and Ford, biggest, biggest difference is just the amount of resources. Um, yeah. Obviously, they have enormous brand marketing budgets. Uh, we have a little bit of a smaller budget, but you figure out a way to be a little bit more scrappy and every every single dollar counts. And, uh, you know, we we hold our agencies and I hold myself accountable to that. To to that point about resources, has sort of the, the last few months changed the way you and the team approach content creation? Obviously, it's been harder to have bigger shoots. I, and, you know, I, I, have you guys even continued to get more scrappy there and elevate UGC content? I mean, what has been sort of your, your how have you approached content kind of at scale over the last few months? Yeah, U UGC con content, definitely. There's been a, a lot more utilization of that and reposting and um, I'd say we've been very big into animation. So uh, our agency Vitro has really done a, a great job contracting with a few different animation houses, because obviously in the COVID environment, you can't do those live shoots. You don't have the ability to get on set. So we've, we've done a phenomenal job of, of, of using uh, animation, uh, user generated content, uh, work closely to just utilize stock footage. I mean, if you uh, rewind some of the commercials over the course of the last two or three months, tons of stock photography. Tons yeah. of music tracks. I mean, it's been very, uh, you know, very hitting home hard where you don't have those live actors. So, I mean, if there are brands that are pretty much rolling out new creative at this point, most likely uh, they, they had those plans in place prior to COVID. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. Um, you know, I actually watched one of your talks here on Brand Innovators probably, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago or so. And you were talking a little bit about social and, and the, you know, the platforms that you thought were doing some really interesting work. And one of them was Snapchat that you highlighted as well. So I guess just broadly speaking, even outside of what you're doing at El Polio, El Polio Loco, are there trends that you're seeing or platforms that you're identifying that you are really excited about as a, as a consumer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had the opportunity to be a part of their Snapchat partner summit like three or four weeks ago. And you know, one of the things that I've, I've seen brands adapt and deliver is just the way that they're delivering content during this, uh, this COVID situation. And what I love about Snap, I love about YouTube and Google and Facebook is I feel like they've done a really good job to make sure that brand ad advertisers and the consumers kind of know what's kind of coming. Uh, it's obviously these, these companies make a lot of money. Uh, they have the ability to kind of showcase what their future product life cycle looks like. But being able to deliver that in front of the, the consumer or me as, as the brand is incredible. And I think their ability to harness and keep people within the platform is phenomenal. And that's one of the things I identify with Snapchat is they're doing a much better job of making sure that the user stays for a longer period of time, making yeah. sure that they have a ton of different tools that really get the user a lot more engaged, wanting to naturally spend time, make sure it's not as forced. And uh, I love that. And they're just continuing to do a phenomenal job. I know a lot of that is with our former friend or still friend, but former colleague, Kenny Mitchell too, who's their CMO, yeah. um, but incredible guy. And uh, he's brought some great thinking into Snapchat. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, they, they also were just so well positioned 
um, in terms of being able to withstand the data backlash that is obviously happening across social right now. I think, you know, they and Pinterest especially really um, sort of built themselves to, to last in a really interesting way where you sort of go on there. Obviously, they're, they're much different platforms, but you sort of come away with the same kind of feel good feel when you're on both of those, right? It's more playful and um, still very valuable. I'm excited to see sort of, I'm very bullish on both. So I'm very excited to see kind of how they evolve with brands and creators moving forward. You know, we've been talking with Pinterest and TikTok actually as sort of alpha uh, partners for some of their measurement capabilities and some of their creator tools. And, and, you know, both are really doing some really cool stuff and they sort of have the benefit of learning from some of the past mistakes of some of the bigger, you know, platforms and they're, they're evolving and iterating really quickly. So, you know, I think the future is bright for a lot of these platforms still. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, TikTok too has obviously accelerated at, at such an incredible pace, you know, obviously having uh, Nick Tran go over there. A lot of yeah. people who are very well respected in the content creation community. Uh, it just really forces you to up your game because if you fall behind, I mean, TikTok's going to capitalize on the opportunity and just go full steam ahead. Absolutely. So we've got a couple minutes um, before Q and A. The questions are starting to come in. I wanted to touch on it. Just a couple like personal questions as well. Um, like, has your personal media consumption changed? I mean, obviously it has. How has it changed in the last kind of three months? So I'm a sports fanatic. So yeah. I've uh, unfortunately depressed yeah. relegate to uh, cornhole on ESPN. Right. I did enjoy uh, the Jordan documentary, but so I would good. say that I've, I've kind of shifted just my content strategy in general relative to what I'm consuming media wise. Um, mm -hmm. I really enjoy Masterclass. Um, that's been like a really big, um, you know, a, a, an area I've spent a lot of time, quite honestly. Um, really enjoy Robin Roberts, Bob Iger, Chris Voss, incredible type of series that you have the ability to learn and get tidbits of, of nuggets of knowledge that you can really apply to your day to day personal life or to your professional life. It's uh, it's a great, great application. Uh, definitely recommend it. Yeah. Any you binge in any TV shows or anything right now? Oh, boy. Uh, last TV show I binge was probably Hannah on Amazon Prime. I really yeah. enjoyed that. I thought that was phenomenal. Really, yeah, enjoyed it. obviously, I did, did the Ozark thing, too, uh, just yeah. like about everybody else. But yeah, I really enjoyed Hannah. Yeah, Hannah's good. I'd also recommend what we do in the shadows on Hulu. Okay. Uh, vampire satire. It's very good based nice. on a movie that they made years ago as well. Um, you know, sort of in terms of kind of what like what's keeping you inspired to, you know, like what's getting you up at, up in the morning and sort of excited about your day professionally and, and sort of also personally right now? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's it's really um, kind of seeing the impact of the change of of the way that things are working in my company. It's just every single day is different, right? You know, sometimes you'll get a notification that you had to close a restaurant. Um, because there was an employee who or a customer who had COVID who was exposed there. So you have to quickly learn how to adapt and you have to be able to be more nimble and be flexible and realize that a lot of people are, are dealing with things differently in this environment. And I think it keeps you on your toes, but I also think the most important thing, um, and it's been a motto of mine throughout my career, is you bring the weather at the end of the day. And yeah. so I, I honestly, like I said, I, I try to walk on the beach every single morning or go for a run 5.30, 6 a.m., and uh, if I have that ability to start my day like that, like I'm amped, I'm excited. If it's 7 a.m. and I'm in a meeting with Joe, like I'm ready to go. So it's like my natural boost to caffeine. Uh, the other big thing that I've honestly tried to do is just stay connected to a lot of people around the world. I had shared that I had the opportunity uh, and was incredibly humbled to graduate from Kellogg School of Management, have an incredible yeah. network of people from around the world who I continue to stay in touch with. Um, I recently uh, joined uh, Adweek is in a uh, Adweek mentee group that I, I'm part of uh, with quite a number of individuals, and that's really helped grow me uh, working with the mentees. And I have an incredible mentor as part of that program too, Musa Tariq, and yeah. he's really helped challenge me and keep me on my toes and super inspiring to uh, collaborate and work with. So yeah, it's it like you got lucky with him for sure. That looks like a pretty incredible program. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. Uh, the people who I've met are just incredible, and as well as him, he's uh, he's a really really fun guy. Yeah, he's one of my favorite marketers out there right now for sure. So we've got a bunch of really good questions actually. So I'm gonna just go into these. The easiest one is when is El Pollo Loco coming east? That's a great question. Um, so 
I think publicly we've announced that there are plans to expand. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can go as far as to tell you that I know that we're, we're most likely going to be hitting Albuquerque uh, within the uh, there are okay. future plans to expand east. I think the way that you've seen uh, ghost kitchens emerge, uh, yeah. there's definitely an opportunity and possibility to do things a little bit more affordably rather than, you know, buy the real estate, set up a restaurant. You know, you can theoretically launch a ghost kitchen, create the same products, either under a new name or your same name, but in that shared type of environment. So yeah. I would say sooner rather than later. And if That's not, you can, you, can, you can contact me. And I promise you when you come out to the West, El Pollo Loco's on me, I promise. <laughs> Perfect, good deal. The ghost kitchen trend is is fascinating. I, I I think it was like restaurant industry or something like that. It, it, it said it could be potentially like a $2.4 trillion industry in the next 10 years. I mean, just bananas. Um, that's a lot of money. It is. Um, yes, so from one challenger brand to another, do you track what your competitors are doing in digital media, either creative assets or distribution by platform? Do you do and go where they go um, after, or do you go after a share of wallet or down a different path? Wow, phenomenal question. Lots of, lots of parts to unpack to that one. Uh, relative to competitors, I think you, you use them as sort of a guide for inspiration. Um, you know, obviously you have Nielsen and other things you can use to track total ad spend. I would say the brand that I'm, I'm most jealous of that inspires me the most and know, know a few of the people over there quite well is Chipotle. Um, mm. I think their, uh, their digital media strategy has been phenomenal. Um, Tressie Lieberman, who's their VP of digital, uh, yeah. has assembled quite an awesome team and uh, they just continue to execute. And I think for me, what's inspiring is you kind of see patterns in, in the way that they advertise on, on Facebook, on Instagram, on other social platforms. Um, also, uh, Zip Allen, who's also a former McDonald's colleague at, who's the VP of digital at Taco Bell. Um, I think Taco Bell has consistently done a, a really nice job with their digital strategy. Um, you see them, they're going to be relaunching their loyalty program here at the end of the month. And so uh, that's been something I, I just kind of look to a couple of competitors in the same category, kind of see what they're doing. But ultimately, uh, you know, we look to our agencies for the recommendation in terms of what percentage of spend we should allocate to different mediums. And then ultimately, you know, use the competitors as inspiration. If I if I rewind like three months ago, if you go to my office, I literally have a wall where essentially I have every single like probably ten or eleven brands, and I literally have their entire Instagram feed printed out on my wall. So that's kind of like I walk in every morning, I see that inspiration, I try to see the stories that our competitors bring to market, and then mm -hmm. use that as my own source of of inspiration. So it's kind of fun. It is. I love that. Along with my um, Happy Meal toys. <laughs> I still have way too much McDonald's swag in my apartment. I it's figure. The same amount. <laughs> um, how has your uh, leadership style changed over the past few months? Have you been able to develop more personal relationships with your colleagues? Oh, so great question. Um, absolutely. I would say that sometimes when you're running the gamut of pace, uh, you're just going from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. And uh, I've really had an opportunity to learn a lot more of the about the colleagues just with our regular touch points. I mean, the 30 minute meeting in the morning, believe it or not, you know, at first I was like, oh, I have to get on camera every single day at nine o'clock to meet with the marketing team who I feel like I'm in meetings with the rest of the day. Just taking that 30 minutes to just time out and allow everybody to kind of just share what's on their mind is like so therapeutic. And quite honestly, you really get to know people a lot better. Like, I can yeah. tell you stories about my coworkers' kids. I can tell you like trips they've kind of mini staycations they've taken over the uh, the quarantine period. Um, it, it's just so healthy. And anybody who's in an organization that's meeting remotely, I highly recommend the the regular touch points. I, it, it might seem like annoying or you don't have time for it, but let me remind you: there's 168 hours in a week. So if you don't have time, you, you got something wrong. You're not doing it right. So just try to create that time. Yeah, you know, we recently um, for the East Coast team, which you know, I'm included in here, is uh, we recently had a daily stand up put on our schedule, which I think when it was initially put on our calendars, we were just kind of like, oh, man, why do we have to do this every day? But, you know, three weeks in, it has been incredibly valuable. And sometimes it does just turn out to be a moment for us just to kind of shoot the shit and talk about how we're feeling and, you know, what's going on. 
Um, so I also highly recommend them and was pleasantly surprised by just, um, you know, how quickly they kind of evolved and became just a standard part of the day and week. Yeah, it's super cool. Yeah. Um, ask that. Oh, here's an influencer specific question. How has your interactions with influencers changed since COVID and has your strategy evolved? I would say our strategies evolved um, slightly. Uh, I would say that we, we try to garner and cast a wider net. Uh, I think we were very focused and targeted with the individuals that we were trying to kind of uh, get to become influencers for us. But I think a lot of what we realize is people love and post about our brand relatively naturally. So we've been really trying to go to people who aren't necessarily sending us the email solicitations to say, hey, we wanna be paid influencers for your brand. I have 100,000, 200,000 followers. Like we're a very natural brand that's, that's super organic and people really connect with us. And so for me, you know, there's always an opportunity to say, hey, we can do a partnership with you. You can create content. But to me, um, the biggest win during all of this is just seeing how many more people were sharing those special moments with their families, taking pictures of our food around the dinner table, at the park, social distancing, of course. Uh, but it, it was it was just an amazing thing to see um, just how many people like truly use the food to be kind of the centerpiece of the family. And uh, that was probably my biggest aha influencer slash social moment during uh, COVID. It's, it's, it's really a special thing. Yeah, that's great. Have you guys discussed at all how you're going to evolve that and sort of start to scale it out at all in the coming months? I think so. Um, we, we've started planting the seed. I think, you know, as everything's adapting and shifting and changing on a on a day to day basis, I think, you know, there's a there's a bigger strategy ultimately. Yeah. But I think the, the tactics, um, you know, change every so often because, you know, one day you kind of yeah. hear the news, the, the COVID's doing better. And then the next day it's like we're we're back to square one. So yeah. I think that that impacts a lot of kind of the, the tactics that we do ultimately layering up to the strategy. So, you know, we're, we're obviously very focused. We want to make sure that everybody stays safe and healthy, but we can continue to uh, advocate on behalf of our brand. Makes sense. Um, we touched on some of this, but I, I, you know, this one's a bit more focused on investments specifically. So, um, you know, many brands have drastically reduced media budgets over the past few months. How is your media plan adjusted? If your budget has been reduced, have you gotten more creative and efficient with your strategies? Yeah, we, uh, as most kind of QSR or restaurant brands in general, typically how budgets work is it's a percentage of your sales that go into an ad fund. And ultimately that ad fund is a result of your overall media budget. So obviously, uh, you know, we took a little bit of a hit in the you know March to June time period. Um, sales were obviously lower than forecast uh, given just the dynamic shift in consumer behavior patterns. And so as a result, you know, the, the biggest thing was we took a little bit of a shift from out of home a little bit of a shift from TV, given that, you know, it was more streamed content that was being watched versus the live content. And, you know, brands like uh, American Idol and The Voice had to adapt. They did live shows uh, from with people at their houses. Obviously, viewership was quite a bit lower. Um, so obviously, we, we knew that people were spending a lot more time on their devices, a lot more time uh, just with digital in general. So I would say we further amplified our digital media spending efforts. It really helped accelerate just kind of uh, broadcasting that voice in that channel. Um, but, you know, we had to refine like everybody else. I know probably maybe only grocery stores and or CPG brands, um, you know, obviously flourished during COVID. So those brands that uh, that had significant spend reduction had to cut the ad budget somehow. Absolutely. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you launched a loyalty program during COVID, right? Or was it already? So our, our loyalty program was off the ground, but what we did during COVID was we, we really did a much better job of segmentation and personalization. Um, yeah. Essentially, when I got to the company, um, the majority of the offers that we were sending out to our user base were just general wide scale. So, you know, Joe, who might be a single user customer, uh, we were sending him a family meal when he typically only, you know, purchases for one. So, right. you know, obviously it doesn't interest Joe. So, you have a lot of people clicking unsubscribe. You have a lot of people saying, hey, that's not me as a customer. So we really did a lot of job, a really good job of digging into the data, really understanding um, a much better job, who our consumer was, what they wanted from us, et cetera. I would say we yeah. retooled rather than relaunched our loyalty program, but you might see a relaunch soon. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. Well, that is a perfect uh, little teaser to end on right there.
Um, Andy, thanks so much. It was really great to catch up and you know, I really appreciate you sharing the knowledge um, and I hope we get to do, it, do this again soon. Absolutely. Can't wait to grab a beer in Chicago next time I'm back. I love it. Or LA, man. I might beat you out there. I need some of that beach life you've been talking about. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Take it easy. All right. Bye. Th thanks, Bye. Andy. Thanks, Joe. Really appreciate it, guys. It, All right. So we're going to go ahead and move it on to we've reached that point. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the last session of the day. Uh, and it's a great one. I'm really excited. Uh, we have a great friend uh, that's going to be joining us. Uh, his name is Sam Christie, and he is uh, the West lead of global business solutions for TikTok. Um, Influential has a great partnership with TikTok, and we are very, very excited uh, to delve into a number of those things, as well as just some best practices uh, with all these brand marketers who are here listening. Um, I'm sure uh, other than talking to your kids, you probably could use some uh, advice on how to do uh, TikTok most effectively for your brand. So uh, we brought in one of the best and brightest at TikTok to tell you all about that. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my brother, Ryan Dieter, our CEO, and Sam Christie. Hey, Sam. What's going good to, good to see you, man. How are things? Things are good. Things are good. As good as can be in LA. Uh, I know we're not too far from each other. It's, just, it's, uh, it's a little weird doing it at home, but hey, here we are. We, we are actually in the office. We, we need some steady Wi-Fi to handle uh, the bandwidth. Right. But, you know, we're, we're in Beverly Hills right now, and it's super weird. There's, there's a ghost town in this place. Of course. Hey, if, uh, if my home internet falters, bear with me. But, uh, but I hear you loud and clear here, so uh, have me. No, thanks for, for joining, Sam. I wanted to, for, so for those that are watching uh, at home, or I guess at work, depending on where you are, uh, I've known Sam for years now. Sam's been a, a great partner of ours, both from a, a TikTok perspective, but also in the brand marketing. He actually has helped our sales team understand and uh, really kind of uh, delve deeper into this. Uh, it, it has, it, I, 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 I hesitate to say new platform, because honestly, it's been around for a while now, uh, but in terms of the, the interest from uh, brands as well as the interest from consumers, it skyrocketed. So congratulations, first and foremost, for being on a rocket ship and helping, uh, you know, steer it towards the biggest brands in the world. Uh, I know that you've uh, you've been a consummate uh, person in the agency and, and brand world. So uh, you're, in, you're in the right place at the right time. Well, we're hoping so. Yeah, no, I uh, really appreciate that, Ryan. I think, um, yeah, it's been uh, two years that, that that just kind of flown, that just really flown right by. So, no, I appreciate the kind words. I think first and foremost, it's just, uh, it's really excited to get into kind of what we feel like is a next phase. You know, obviously, I think when we initially just started talking with one another, it was, um, we were still brand new. And I think even some of the, some of the user stats and some of the, some of the overall kind of uh, consumption numbers like people would look at that and you know, they were kind of in disbelief and now we're kind of proving proving the model so to speak so very excited for this kind of almost like next phase of uh of TikTok as we look through this year 2021 and you know even further beyond that well i don't want to put you on the spot here um so the answer is it's uh not available yet but is there any update like if you had to talk about like as of may june are there publicly facing stats for number of u.s users or are we What's the, for those that are tuning in, and they keep asking, all these calls out with brands is, yeah. you know, is it old enough for my brand? So is there any, any stats you guys feel comfortable talking about? You know, I, it, it, it's a fair question. And frankly, um, we're in that unique position where we keep surging. So it's kind of tough. I could give you a number, but that number is outdated. You know, I think the, the, the best number I can quote is the fact that in April, you know, we cleared that 2 billion mark in global downloads. So obviously, Amazing. Um, you know, that's a big number. But I think, you know, U.S. wise, <laughs> what I really... What I really like to point to is a little bit more of the kind of surge into not only thinking about ourselves as Gen Z and kind of young millennial. Obviously, that's a big selling point. I think um, any manager, any any media, anyone on the line is probably looking for meaningful ways to tap into a, a, a different consumer. But I think one of the cool things is um, we've been seeing in this moment, like we take TikTok into the, into the home while we're all kind of sheltering in place. And now we're actually seeing this kind of co-consumption or co-creation habit uh, forming where we're now actually seeing more parents, we're seeing adults, we're seeing more of that kind of older demographic come in. And I think every platform goes through this, you know, younger generations are the first to adapt kind of the new kind of cool thing. And here, um, you know, you could talk to anyone in our marketing team, 
uh, this has really accelerated a lot of that growth. And, you know, being able to see us not just only be focused on Gen Z and, 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 and millennials, but to go further um, has been really exciting. And definitely, you know, for anyone who's joining on the line today, a lot of us are looking for Gen Z, but we're also looking for more 18 plus. We're looking for more 35 plus and looking for more people to kind of round out our full demographic here. It's pretty exciting to be able to say, hey, we are now uh, cultivating more of not just a presence, but I mean, it's been really fun to see parents, you know, 35 to 44, you know, realize, oh, it isn't just dancing or it isn't just kind of like dog videos. There's stuff here for me, too. And there's more there's more do it yourself. You know, there's more. Uh, I just saw something the other day that was like, you know, how to marinate a perfect medium rare steak all done on TikTok. And it's um, it was awesome to see because that's not something I searched for. It just kind of popped up. And um, when you're someone who's like at home, I'm trying to learn how to cook a little bit more to see that kind of fed to me dynamically was that uh, was pretty cool. You know, I, I get sucked into the, the TikTok vortex at least uh, half an hour a day, sometimes an hour plus. And you guys have uh, massive stats around uh, people really kind of you know, living and breathing this platform. I, I guess I, I want to kind of pivot to the, the obviously we're living in the COVID times and it's obviously yeah. very, very surreal and dystopian. Um, what, what have you seen since, since it happened? Obviously, you guys were on a rocket ship even before this. This happened, the platform obviously got even bigger, but what are you seeing from brands? Are brands changing their own and operated messaging? Are they changing, are they, are they coming to you with different ideas and questions around how they do both paid units and influencer ads? Like what's, what's been the, what's been the scoop? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good question because I think, um, you know, we've, we've liked to change our approach in terms of how we are messaging to brands and how to make sure that when someone's coming to the platform, they're doing so in support of the community. Um, and I think, you know, we saw it, there, there was a shift in terms of not people not wanting to be on TikTok. I think people recognize TikTok was a really valuable place to be, definitely when we have so much attention and eyeballs and kind of, you know, taking that time, you know, that obviously that time spent um, was a really valuable metric. But, you know, rather than it being, you know, defaulting to hashtag challenges or defaulting to uh, what we call a top view, it's kind of like the first thing you see. It's kind of like um, closest thing is probably like a, like a masthead. Uh, first thing you see when you visit the platform, rather than like kind of having that message first and foremost, it was a little bit more, how can we demonstrate subtlety? Like, how can we make sure that our message is felt? How can we make sure that we're still here um, and we're still thinking of our community without it feeling too much like we're advertising in a moment where people didn't really want to be advertised to? You know, I think brands really um, recognized early on that we're a platform and a community where th there's that real trust. You know, there's real there's a real support system within the TikTok community during tough times. So when brands were coming to us, it wasn't necessarily about, you know, specific sales or specific promotions, but more about bringing awareness to critical initiatives like social distancing or, you know, using TikTok as a channel to stay connected with the community and feel supported versus just kind of being talked at or talked to. And I think, you know, we got mm -hmm. some, you know, we've been doing some great work with Procter & Gamble, um, you know, dating all the way back to, to March, we did something called the, the hashtag distance dance which was essentially we partnered with uh, Charlie D'Amelio. So if anyone hasn't heard Charlie's name, you're probably gonna hear it pretty soon. She is uh, our, our, our most followed talent on TikTok. She helped demonstrate the distance dance, you know, showing how to stay apart that six feet, which was crucial. Um, partnered with Jansport. Jansport did something really cool as well recently uh, called the, the, the Lighten Your load, load Campaign, where, you know, Jansport, obviously, first thing you think of when you think of backpacks is school. So we weren't talking school. We were talking more driving awareness and recognition of, you know, the fact that mental health is, is, is something that during this time we have to really be thinking of and we really have to be kind of supporting each other in this community. Jansport immediately recognizes people don't just come to TikTok for joy and creativity. They come for support. You know, they come to kind of seek out solace and seek out, again, community. And so Jansport comes in with this message of kind of alleviating, lifting that mental load. Um, it resonates really well. It resonates really well at a time where, you know, I may not be buying a backpack because I don't know if school is going to open it back up, but mm -hmm. I definitely want to be thinking about, um, or I want to look to a brand to help uh, support my message, feel supported by the brand versus just being talked at. Um, and I think we have a really good platform that allows. Us. Well, it, it, similar to the, the, what you're doing with these great brands, um, as TikTok the platform, are there any interesting partnerships or collaborations with organizations you formed or Obviously, both in response to COVID, social injustice. Obviously, it's been a wild uh, yeah. three to six months, and uh, yeah, I would love, love to hear kind of what you guys have been up to. Yeah, it's 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 been great because I think it's it's something that I think internally we're all really proud of, and some of the responses that we've had to to COVID specifically, and you know, not just COVID, but also thinking about small businesses, you know, uh, small small to medium businesses right now that are really struggling. 
um, as well as, you know, as we kind of look at the impact over the last several months, we actually several months ago announced, you know, we pledged 250 million to support frontline, a uh, million dollars, excuse me, to support frontline medical workers, um, mm -hmm. uh, educators, you know, local communities deeply impacted by, by this global crisis. And I think, you know, we've made further commitments beyond that. I think we have, um, we have been issuing a $25 million values in, in, in ads to help trust organizations around, or excuse me, um, organizations deliver kind of that crucial public health uh, messaging out to this uh, TikTok community. And we'll also be um, offering $100 million in ad credits to businesses looking to rebuild. You know, obviously we're on the other side of this, um, whenever that might be for the various states or kind of regions we're all in, um, we want to get those SMBs back, uh, back, back to business and back to work, and we're going to support that. So, um, our back to business program um, is something we're, we're we're really excited for. And I think you know uh, to kind of show our uh, what we're thinking about in terms of helping get companies back on their feet, we want to be a part of that rebuild. We want to help you. And I think again, as our community grows, uh, we'll become more and more valuable in doing so. So I'll, I'll, I'll get a take a step back. So uh, so amazing what you guys are doing at the platform level. Um, you are the lead on the West Coast for you know, business solutions. I know you from uh, being a, a road warrior, having to travel from building to building, city to city, to go get uh, business done. Obviously, it's remote work time. What, what was when this all happened? Did you is your team all tuning into uh, hopefully a WebEx or some sort of yeah. uh, place to go do it? Like, what, what what are you doing to keep your team aligned and, and operating from W uh, work from home? Yeah, I, it's a great question because it's something like I probably think about that more than anything else right now. I think um, one, it's been great for all of us. I, you know, my dog is thrilled that I don't have to leave every other day for the Monday to Friday and be on planes all the time. But I think, you know, we really focused a lot on in the first few weeks, it was very odd. You know, it was very, very odd kind of only communicating over Zoom. And I think in many ways we we took advantage of it. We took advantage of the fact that you know, we can't, I can go to my boss's boss just as easily on Zoom and kind of get 20 minutes with them. Um, something I couldn't do prior, you know, just in terms of we're in different cities, uh, different availabilities, meetings all over the place, but now we have more access to each other. We were able to do the fun stuff. We were able to do like happy hours. Uh, we're doing trivia days. We're doing like, I think we did like an escape room where we kind of did a, a digital escape room, which were, uh, which, which was pretty cool. As well. <laughs> we're trying to find more of those uh, activities together. But I think ultimately too, um, you quickly realize when you're working from home, all of a sudden, it almost feels like there's more work to be done. You know, your, 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 your mm -hmm. day gets filled with Zooms. It gets filled with Zooms, WebExes, Microsoft Teams, uh, Google, Google Hangouts. I think we've hit them all and you hit them all daily. And uh, what it's actually done is it, it's really, um, it's allowed myself and, you know, kind of my team, we really look at each meeting. We kind of, uh, we're able to kind of point to something and question, do I really need that meeting? Like, do I really need do I really need to be getting on a Zoom with, you know, a team of 40? Is there a way that maybe we can only do that for six? You know, is there, is, is there a way where we can siphon these off and make sure that we're utilizing people's time in the best way possible? And I think there's, there's you know, that's, yeah. there's, there, there's not a simple solution to that, right? I think there's different ways different teams can approach it. But um, what I've really focused on is how do we take back time and make sure that we're doing something that is a real value to everyone? You know, that's, that's ultimately what it comes down to. How are we making the best use of this time? And I've been finding like, my my one on one time. I mean, right now, Ryan, this feels like a one on one. I know there are people watching this, but it feels like a one on one between you and me. Um, I'm getting more value out of those conversations and the and the conversations of five or six than you know if if it's just me talking to my team. Of, you know, I think it's just really sure. it's really been cool to see how um, kind of in micro moments we can kind of keep our culture alive and keep people optimistic and excited about what they do day in day out. Uh, it, it remind me of the the meme like this could have been an email. Uh, all these yeah. different meetings people <laughs> have, like, um, and yeah, we have that too. We have. I mean, I think there's definitely. Uh, I, I feel like initially, right when COVID started, this is, this is my own feeling. Um, when it first started, people were not weren't ready. They were still going on the phone. They weren't used to the the zooms and the, and the webexes and all the different platforms. Then they got super used to it, and it became standard. Then they got uh, a bit of. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> their their eyes started to cross over from being in Zooms all day and and, and web access every place. Um, yeah. And then now I feel like uh, the, a lot of a lot of like the personalized like the poker nights and things that I have with my friends. I feel like I feel like now it's really back to almost. I'm still having phone calls with friends still, and I'm doing web access like for you know business stuff. So I don't know. I don't know if you are are any, having any sort of uh, um, uh, <laughs> webex overexposure or not, or if you are. <laughs> what, what's what's the status for you and your fans? You know, I think um, I've actually really, 
there's a lot of elements I love about it where, you know, uh, I see I see real value in being able to very easily. It's my grandmother's 85th birthday tomorrow, right? And I get a chance to hop on Zoom with her and have a really quick, you know, 15, 30 minute conversation to wish her happy birthday. I wouldn't be able to do that otherwise, right? It would probably be a phone call. It would probably be shorter than that. So I think personally, you know, it's it's been great to kind of, I love seeing how connectivity has evolved. You know, for me, it all comes back to making sure that we're just making the best use of our time we can, you know, making sure that we um, were uh, we're economical with our time, but also knowing that, um, you know, I think people felt some pressure early on. We're all at home. So that means I have to be on the whole time and um, really having to reassure a team. Hey, no, look, it's still August. Like I still want, even if it's not, you know, going on that vacation you wanted to go on, please take your time, you know, make sure that you can take that mental break, make sure that you can get um, you know, kind of away from the computer, get your hands off keyboards. And I think um, now more than ever, I recognize how valuable it is to recharge, you know, how valuable it is to to be hands off over the weekend and to really make sure you're taking back the time because your work is going to speak for itself when you come back away from that break. So, you know, I um, sure. ultimately it's 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 a journey to get there, though. Right. You know, I think we really want our you know teams to be thinking more about how do we just be a little bit more? How do we approach our day just being, uh, uh, you know, I like to call, I used to work over at Shia Day, where there's the big, you know, be more human. If you can't be more human, be more dog. Um, dogs are living their best <laughs> life right now. But I think the be more human is the thing I'm really trying to instill for myself, for my team. Like, we're all in similar boats. You know, TikTok's really, uh, uh, we're really fortunate to see TikTok kind of having this moment right now. But, you know, uh, we know that there's kind of very experiences going on in the industry. Let's be more human. Let's be empathetic with one another. You know, let's make sure and, you know, we understand uh, these aren't just transactions, right? These are kind of human moments. And if we infuse a little bit more humanity in our day to day, if it's with you, uh, with you folks at Influential, if it's folks at other agencies, brands, wherever, um, we're all we're all in the same boat. You know, we're all we're all doing this together. And I think it's allowed us to when we kind of take down a little bit of that uh, that guard, so to speak, that you might sometimes have up when it's, you know, client to platform or, you know, what have you, um, we've been able to uh, collaborate and come together a little bit more seamlessly, I guess you could say, at least it's been my experience. No, I love it. Um, one of one of our uh, partners of uh, the NBA, uh, uh, Kate, who's a CMO, says a, has a great phrase, let's get quick and nerdy. So I want to jump in deep <laughs> into TikTok from a ad perspective. So I think the people here, obviously, um, you know, they're mystified and curious about TikTok from, you know, a consumer perspective, they are somewhat baffled and wanting to try and test out from a commercial perspective. I mean, I, I, it might be good to talk about real quick, like all the different, I think it's a five plus different ad units, but really the one I think that's going to be the king crowned, you know, one for this I see very much to me, it's like the uh, Twitter trend is the branded hashtag, which I think I probably most expensive, I'm not sure, but it is also your most kind of takeover you know, own the UGC universe for that day. Yeah, there's just giving people kind of a, almost as a one-on-one, but a one-on-one in the ads portion and then jump into the branded hashtag challenge. I think that to me, it seems like the most exciting stuff you guys do. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, if you go to the platform today, you're going to see Elf Cosmetics can be the first thing that you see. And you may have seen, uh, we used to talk a lot about uh, Elf has been um, a true pioneer. I, uh, I'll say with TikTok, they've been amazing partners with us in kind of launching their first campaign was Islam Space. And now they're doing something new today where they're utilizing something called a, a top view. Top view is first thing that you see when you visit the platform. So we're going to draw the promote a trend uh, comparison. Maybe here, uh, the best comparison there is like a YouTube masthead or maybe a Twitter first view. First thing you see. Uh, right now, in, in in this quarter, we're guaranteeing you 100% share of voice within ever with you know whatever market you're buying in within within the U.S. We'll take that as an example. And if you visit the platform today, you see that Elf spot. It's going to be sound on. You know uh, this particular spot, I believe, is about 15 seconds. It can go all the way up to 60. It could be as short as five. And it is essentially a kind of a seamless way in to the platform. So after three seconds, you're going to see your normal TikTok user interface kind of dissolve onto screen. It's a very native feeling unit that you're guaranteed to hire a 13 plus audience here in the US. Um, and it's, it's it's super effective in that, that yes, you're gonna reach everybody. You know, obviously if it's, if it's a high impact, high reach play, uh, you're checking the boxes on that, but also gives you a chance to go a little deeper. You know, it's a very immersive unit in that I can like it, I can share it, I can comment, I can do the same thing with this ad as I can do on any other unit or any other video I'm seeing on TikTok. So what that in turn drives is uh, um, massive traffic. You know, we see anywhere between 14 and 18% click-through rate on that. 
Uh, when you consider our scale right now and the fact that we estimate, you know, 90 plus million impressions coming from this one unit in 24 hours, it's a lot of traffic. So it's kind of equal parts, big reach play, uh, and then um, equal part kind of traffic driver. Did you say to, 90 right? million impressions? That is, uh, yeah, that's a real number. That's a real number. And that's on that's the weekend. If you, if you do it on the wow. weekend, when we see some uptick, you're going to see, uh, we estimate about 100 million impressions. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, hey, it speaks to Powerful. that 2 billion number, right? You know, there are a lot of people here right now. So, um, so far, it's been really effective. I think, you know, a lot of partners right now partaking in it just because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a way to capture attention at the best possible moment when you come to the platform. Amazing. And then on the brand hashtag challenge, so um, oh, can I double click on that for people? Describe yeah. a little bit what it is there, then I'm aware of it. And then the the UGC I see there is, in, I, I see hundreds of thousands of people jumping into these brand hashtag challenges, and they truly seem like, not only, all I love about it is not only does it seem like they truly are having fun and obviously integrating with the brand, but they, in their mind, it also becomes they need to do it to basically stay relevant themselves. If they, if they miss out this trend, they're not going to be yeah. able to be cool on that given day. So you guys have built a really interesting like funnel where people are doing this to build their own audiences and be a part of a community. It's, it's, yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah, we, uh, I think our platform mentioned early on that people just interact with hashtags differently on TikTok. You know, hashtags become more of a, a prompt or kind of a, to kind of put it in our, in our marketing terms, more of a creative brief for the community. And when brands came aboard and recognized that, a brand can write a brief and a brand can write that prompt. Now what a brand is doing is inviting people in. You know, it's kind of like, it's, it's almost like a big, big bear hug. Like, come on in and you can actually respond to a branded hashtag challenge. Any content that comes out of, and I'll give Elf another shout out here because they are running a hashtag challenge right now. Um, any response is going to have the brand rooted within the message. So now all of a sudden, to your point, it's great UGC and it's really entertaining. And oh, by the way, your brand's message is, is, is stitched in within all of this different content. Now, all of a sudden, you know, brands are not, uh, you know, brands have uh, started the catalyst of being able to create a lot of content that supports your message and supports your brand. And now, you know, we've seen campaigns in the hundreds of millions of video views, all of UGC kind of using that specific hashtag, even some cases going above into the into the billions number. And, you know, that's and, and you know, that's a real number. You know, it's it's, it's pretty crazy to see um, when you have this scale matched with this creativity on platform, matched with it with an audience that really wants to immerse themselves, they want to participate. Um, you see just a completely different look at what kind of hashtags can really do and helping moments kind of explode on platform. So, you know, it's one of our most popular units. It's definitely, uh, it's the one that does a really good job of driving, you know, brands uh, will come to our platform looking for brand, you know, heat. They want brand love, they want awareness, they want resonance. So we see a lot of folks today, they'll do hashtag challenges, then take that hashtag challenge and then turn it into kind of a longer tail experience. You know, from there, we'll get you with in-feed video and then, you know, ex extend the story, extend the story out of just a challenge, you know, cultivate your audiences to then, if you're a retail brand, get you, you know, through the funnel and actually get you uh, driving to purchase, driving to lead, driving to site, you know, whatever, uh, whatever that KPI looks like for you. Do you have, is there a best practice here? So let's say someone ponies up the, the money to do a branded hashtag challenge is a big takeover. Do you guys suggest one influencer, three influencers, 20 influencers? Like is, there, is there some, or yeah. how do you guys kind of figure out how to, to, to give them what they should do? No, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't think there's one size fits all. I think, you know, a lot of it is dependent on the brand, the message, you know, what you're promoting and kind of what, what, what um, the ingredients are of your actual challenge here. You know, I think I've seen it be really successful at three. I've been, I've seen it really successful at 12 or above. I think right now kind of a sweet spot's five, you know, five influencers who, you know, and again, the cool thing about TikTok, you know, the power of the influencers, the power of their content, you know, it's the power of not just the, the, the follower count. Follower count's really important, right? Obviously, you know, that's a metric we point to to say, you know, Charlie D'Amelio has amazing resonance on her platform because she has X number of millions upon millions of followers. But where Charlie's influence really kind of extends itself is because she has great content, right? She has content that really engages the audience, engages its users here. So when we say number of influencers, we really root that number of influencers and in influencers that do really great talent. And frankly, I think today, obviously, you know, influential is, is, is core to, or the name itself is core to kind of what we're drawing from a lot of creators and talent here. But um, our, our creators or our talent, however, you know, they're, they're, they're here to create first and foremost. So when you take that mentality and they're, you know, they kind of take your brief and they're kind of hearing from you or, or hearing from a brand in terms of what they want to turn out and what they want to create on their own. 
um, you know, that that five number becomes much more around, um, you know, how many great pieces of content or how many uh, how many folks, how many kind of um, examples can we show of a really good challenge uh, response? You know, that's that's really kind of what it all comes back to. So um, mm -hmm. long way of saying five, but I think it really depends on uh, your message and really sure. um, kind of what it is you're looking to promote. And I, I think people understand this, but I think it's I, I've had to, to walk through literally brands that have older demos to younger that part and parcel to all of this is you don't have to necessarily do a dance, a choreography dance, but it's obviously helpful if it makes sense for your platform. Music is so central. Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if it's because of the, the old music, musically roots from the early kind of part of the app or whatever, wherever the reason is. But for music portions, I mean, a lot of this stuff, like for example, a lot of these uh, um, hashtag challenges and, and ads are custom made music. So like the Elf one was like the lift space, um, I forget the rest of it, but it, it, was, it was, they had these entirely made jingles no, you guys almost brought jingles back. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think um, what we started to find, you know, for a while, uh, challenges were always looking to find kind of the kind of the hot new song or the hot new artist. And uh, the cool part about TikTok is we're helping launch a lot of artists, right? We're, we're we're kind of finding artists who have an interesting voice, who have an interesting take, or have an interesting hook. That's what's really kind of catapulting talent into the you know into the you know. Uh, kind of more music or entertainment ecosystem. I think the cool thing that we realized as we developed more challenges was wasn't so much about, you know, getting the track or getting, you know, like a tier one artist necessarily, but getting uh, getting a piece of content or a piece of music that just wor worked really well with the visual. It was all about, you know, matching the right sound with the right visual. And in many cases, if, you know, let's say I am a streaming platform that's trying to promote something comedic, sometimes that might be a voiceover versus it actually being a music track. And you know, if I am a if I'm elf writing my own track and having something that was custom to, you know, ELF, no one knows what that acronym means. They wrote a song that tells you eyes lips face. And so by being able to kind of bring back their own kind of spin and their own means of like making their own music, it wasn't so much about, you know, uh, making it a kind of a hit track, but more of making sure they're creating something or creating uh, uh, creating a piece of music that could easily be synced with a visual. So you're right. I mean, the jingle came back, and jingles were all about that syncing of sound to sight and sound. And you know, that's the unique thing about our platform here. You know, we are sound on. So to have the ability to take a song that you may never have heard before, but to see how people dance to it, or how they perform to it, or the you know the jokes that they play to it. Now all of a sudden you've created something that can almost be memefied. You know, you can see something that can really kind of like take off and kind of have different interpretations or different legs of its own beyond just like the original creation. Yeah, I love it. I, I, I watch these. Uh, I get stuck in like the so you think you can dance kind of like a, a meme memefied videos and um, yeah. things I've never heard of songs wise. Like I'll see on the radio. Oh, like that. That I think of it as the TikTok songs. You guys are launching entire careers and kind of the almost like the brainchild before it gets like uh, naturally famous. Speaking of kind of entertainment, uh, uh, we're in the kind of Q&A section right now. Um, I believe uh, you guys, was it that Netflix recently uh, out, said that you guys are quasi competitive because of uh, attention? So all these different attention metrics that are happening around, you know, you got, we're all fighting for whether it's Quibi, Netflix, we're all, sure. but they're also advertising with you guys. So how do, what do you think about your guys' position as someone that gets hours of people's time each day? Yeah, you know, I think the cool part about entertainment is that there is a lot of synergy between where people are kind of spending their time. And um, obviously, we've, we've, we've done kind of fast work in showing that we can take a significant, like a significant amount of time and media consumption and people, you know, uh, being here for multiple minutes or hours a day. You know, I think um, we're a friend to everyone in the in, in the entertainment industry. You know, I think if you take a uh, a Quibi or a Netflix or an HBO or a, or a Peacock, I just mentioned a bunch of streaming services. Of course, um, you're seeing that there is uh, this fusion behind how people want to see media and how they want to have it. You know, TikTok. You never have to go searching for something. It's always going to be right there. It's immediate entertainment for you. Um, it's really in, in, in your for you feed. So to us, you know, we are, we're vastly different from every other entertainment uh, space in that we're giving you content that's all short form, it's all snackable, it all can be utilized at, at you know, at any point in time of the day. But um, at the same time, um, we are very different 
in that we might go to Netflix or we might go to HBO or we might go to Hulu for something very different. And I think at, you know, at the end of the day, um, when it's all creativity coming together, we can partner in that, in that perspective. We can partner as someone who can very easily be that driving force to get you to Hulu or be that driving force to get you to Netflix while giving you different experiences. And uh, hey, we, we, we want all this time spent here. We want people spending more time here. Um, but we also recognize in the larger kind of entertainment ecosystem, um, there are a lot of different ways to find that entertainment satisfaction. And uh, we're, we're here to amplify it. You know, we're here to you know, kind of enrich in the experience uh, even, even further when it comes to how we entertain people day in and day out. Do you guys see uh, the future kind of products are coming out? I know you guys launched live recently. Is that something you guys are going to be focused more on? Is that going to be something that brands are going to, are going to start doing themselves? Do you going to be like integrations? Is there going to be a live brand and hashtag challenge? Is there going to be, yeah. because everything right now is, you know, Instagram live is kind of a QVC for shopping now. Is, is that kind of the extension you're, you're seeing um, a, a, more, a, a live world? Yeah, live's been fun to discover for us because I think uh, live has always been here. And I, once we all kind of sheltered at home, we realized that this was a, uh, a really cool mechanism to use or another way that people could use TikTok. So we did have what we call the hashtag happy at home initiative where people could understand and see a little bit more of what were creators doing at home? What, what are people doing to keep themselves occupied, keep themselves entertained? And, you know, in turn, we did see a surge into the live space and we did see more and more people using it, kind of normalize the adoption of live. You know, we didn't really, you know, as a personal user, when I was coming to TikTok, I was there for my For You feed. And now I'm seeing this environment where more and more creators are utilizing live as a means to connect with their audience. Uh, it's definitely fast, you know, kind of up and coming. So we're having a lot of conversations in terms of how so what a true product look like remains to be seen. But we definitely recognize mm -hmm. you know, in the age where people are probably spending more time on gaming, you know, people may be spending more time on those at home activities. Um, how can TikTok what can we do to kind of take further advantage of that kind of user behavior, you know, and how can we, how can we align ourselves to what we know people are doing at home? Live's been a great spot for that and uh, definitely a spot that we want to dive into a little bit further. So uh, live and some of the challenges you're talking about are definitely top of funnel, um, but they also can be utilized to go more mid funnel and lower funnel. I think right now everyone sees it as, sees it as the, the hot platform, the consumption is there, the attention metrics are there. You guys believe either now or in the future, you guys are going to be more about middle and lower funnel? Or is that, is that, is that the, the next year plus is showcasing that all ages can be converted to e-com or offline kind of activities? That's exactly where we're heading. Yeah, we just, um, uh, we just launched a self-service platform. So being able to, uh, in the same way that people might be looking towards other social media or other sort of biddable platforms, our new auction platform allows, you know, that more hands-on keyboards, uh, more self-serve experience where you can go optimize for exactly what it is you're looking for. And I think still strides that, you know, there's still, obviously this is a new product and the folks that have been here so far have been able to um, really tap in early, be early adopters to a space where, you know, it's, it's an early environment. Our CPMs are favorable. You know, it's a great place for people to be, to go find uh, additional reach in a place where before it was more focused on the reservation space. It was more focused on those top views, the hashtag challenge. You could reserve in feed as well, but now by introducing self-service, it's going to allow people to drive towards that install or drive towards that traffic or drive towards even that conversion and be able to start also segmenting and start building out your audiences in so far as you can actually sequence your messaging and really allow that kind of full funnel experience rather than it just be focused kind of upper funnel here. So with all that, you know, the ability to optimize, the ability to really kind of point you towards what it is you want from your experience here on TikTok, we're also building out more of a measurement team. Um, one of our fastest growing teams and one of our biggest focuses this first half of the year, second half, and, and certainly, in the many years to come, ensuring that we can tell you that story. We can really show you what TikTok is doing to impact your business in a positive way and really drive that bottom line. So um, all things we're really excited about through this, you know, second half of the year and then into 2021. Um, you know, I, I like to say if you're a pixel and you have a, a really thorough understanding of other platforms, um, you're going to jump right into our biddable model or, or our biddable platform. And it's going to be like riding a bike. You know, it's just going to be like buying another space. It's just mm -hmm. a slightly different UI experience. Yeah, um, uh, if, if, you're, if you're comfortable talking about it, um, I, think, I think you mentioned very previously that Bumble has been a great partner and that you guys are seeing some really great conversions with like that. So I, 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 
my first thought would not be app installs. I think of TikTok, but apparently you guys have found a way to do some very inexpensive and highly li high lifetime value type uh, moves. And how, how did you do it with a uh, with a Bumble or people like them? Yeah, that's right. You know, Bumble's a really great example. They, they've been an excellent partner, and I think um, you know they're a really good example of a brand recognizing. Uh, again, Bumble is is it skews older than the Gen Z, right? They're they're a little bit more kind of third Gen Z, young millennial folks coming on the platform, and I think um, their message is all around connection. So I think our messages feud the kind of fused really well together across kind of coming to the community to kind of seek out um, creativity, joy, and also connection with a kind of a larger ecosystem. And they're a great example of utilizing uh, influencer talent. So utilizing talent to kind of showcase their message, as well as being able to drive more of that kind of mid to lower funnel experience, you know, being able to drive uh, highly efficient metrics in terms of what cost per installs look like. And obviously driving um, an enormous lift. Um, I think what was last quoted to me was something like a, like a 5X increase when you look at TikTok relative, uh, uh, you know, kind of relatively speaking um, in terms of their app installs. And you know an over sixty percent decrease um, in 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 their efficiency excuse me in their efficiency metrics. So when you wrap all that in, it's a, it's a great story to tell to any sort of like you know uh, if it's gaming, if it's streaming, any sort of app to kind of come on board and say, hey, look, you know, let's uh, let's point to all the kind of lower lower costs and all the efficiencies that show just how far your dollar can go. Great, uh, and I, I so Bumble uh, yeah, might be surprising to people that that that, that makes sense. Um, you, I have a whole bunch of, uh, I, I've been actually, honestly, I've been tracking everything from, I think it's all last week, it's like a subway, uh, uh, hashtag challenge. I mean, really yeah. great content. Um, uh, I'd love to hear about the American Eagle one. You, know, you mentioned that was kind of a, um, an, a, a, a unique, uh, offer. Yeah, I, just, I guess, more, I, think, sure. I think, I think the team, but the, my, my, my biggest challenge or the, my biggest kind of, uh, task is to not just talk about how great the camp platform is. But bring it to life for the examples, show them things. So I think there's anything you can tell them about how this came to be and how uh, how it and how they actually manifested would help uh, these brand marketers. Yeah, it's a good question. So we did um, we did a campaign with Airy, um, and Airy was was uh, hashtag Airy Real was the was the hashtag here, and it was all about uh, body positivity, and it was all about um, uh, again Charlie was someone else. Who's, who, who's deeply involved in this. I know I've mentioned her a couple of times here, but just it goes to show the power of, 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 of a true uh, talent and influencer on, on TikTok, really prompting users to create a video kind of sharing three things that they were grateful for in, in, in quarantine. Um, and it, it was a really kind of powerful campaign in that it wasn't, again, this was more of a message out to the community, not sharing, not selling a brand, but more talking about body positivity at a moment where really, you know, we're all at home, we're all glued to our screens. Um, it was really, moment for, for for our platform and for the brand itself you know uh mid-august launch time part of this challenge you, you know i think again the the billion number is is common when you see really successful campaigns that that that, that b number can pop up this drove over two billion impressions and i think um, not only did it drive impressions but it also um saw an increase i think of you know well over 800 percent increase of traffic to aries site and it was all rooted in a message that was really meant to benefit. It wasn't necessarily all about product and selling something specifically, but more about a message that meant to uplift the community and to be able to launch that in kind of a challenge capacity at a time where you know people want that supportive message. Uh, it, it was truly inspiring and truly special. So uh, no, I'm glad you brought that one up because I think that was a that was a very uh, that was a high point for kind of our spring or kind of our second quarter season to be able to you know amidst all of the you know not so great news happening during that time. Uh, we could point to something that was really was really positive for our TikTok uh, for our TikTok community. Great. Well, I think we have time for one more question, and try to leave uh, most discussions uh, with this: is um, you know, what's one thing you're looking forward to in both your work life and your personal life? So, you know, what, what, what's, what, why do you get up in the morning? What's what's the next year looking like? And, and what, do you, what, do you, what do you what do you want to tell the world? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, work life, I am excited. I'm excited to meet my team. Um, and that I mean, uh, I probably now we have more people uh, in in TikTok LA who have never stepped foot in the office uh, than than people who have been here. Um, and that's and that's crazy to think. Uh, you know, I've forged so many relationships that I really cherish um, and really have a really close personal bond to. That I only know from Zoom, 
Uh, and that's, um, so, my, you know, some of the teams that I work with are in Los Angeles or in San Francisco and they're in Seattle. And a lot of them have only been So I'm excited to meet them. I'm excited to have a coffee or, you know, go get a beer or, you know, anything of that nature. And then personally, I think I'm just, um, you know, we don't, we don't know when the light is at the end of the tunnel. So obviously we're excited to get through that point, but you know, 2020 has been funny because you think of it in like, it's almost now, uh, obviously, uh, in a pandemic, there's been a lot of negativity, but hopefully I'm excited to see what positivity comes out of this in terms of like, you know, getting a chance to connect differently. If that's over zoom or if that's over, you know, um, kind of different ways that we never thought of before. So, you know, looking, mm -hmm. I, I'm just looking to see what could be positive on the other side of this that we haven't seen yet. So just trying to, trying to stay optimistic. We'll see, uh, we'll see what's on the other end. Uh, aligned 100%. Hopefully we get to get a drink or a beer at some time in the future. Yes, sir. Um, and I appreciate you making time for us, man. They, uh, we'll, we'll, I'm sure I'll speak to you soon on the business front. Hopefully I'll see you in, on the personal front. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. Really appreciate the time. And Chris, thank you so much, too. I know uh, it's, it's been a good day overall, so thanks for taking the time. It's been fantastic, and you only made it better. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you, Ryan. So that's it. We, we've made it through the day. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I uh, have a quick little thing that I need to read to you uh, per, per BI. Uh, a special thank you to our speakers for the education and insights today. Please join Brand Innovators this Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern for our webinar, TikTok, the future of creator and brand collaborations. How fitting, we actually just got TikTok on, so glad uh, that we're all in the same wavelength. We'll be joined by marketing leaders from Wallar, uh, TikTok as well as creators and influencers who use the platform. Thank you for joining everyone and we hope